Chapter 1 of Mr. Prohack. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Simon Evers. Mr. Prohack by Arnold Bennett. Chapter 1 The New Poor. 1. Arthur Charles Prohack came downstairs at 8.30, as usual, and found breakfast ready in the empty dining room. This pleased him, because there was nothing in life he hated more than to be hurried. For him, hell was a place of which the inhabitants always had an eye on the clock, and the clock was always further advanced than they had hoped. The dining-room, simply furnished with reproductions of chaste Chippendale, and chilled to the uncomfortable low temperature that hardy Britons pretend to enjoy, formed part of an unassailably correct house of mid-Victorian style and antiquity and the house formed part of an unassailably correct square just behind Hyde Park Gardens. Taxi-drivers, when told the name of the square, had to reflect for a fifth of a second before they could recall its exact situation. Mr. Prack was a fairly tall man, with a big head, big features, and a beard. His characteristic expression denoted benevolence, based on an ironic realisation of the humanity of human nature. He was forty-six years of age, and looked it. He had been for more than twenty years at the Treasury, in which organism he had now attained a certain importance. He was a companion of the bath. He exulted in the fact that the order of the bath took precedence of those bumptious orders, Star of India, St. Michael and St. George, Indian Empire, Royal Victorian, and the British Empire. But he laughed at his wife for so exulting. If the matter happened to be mentioned, he would point out that at the table of precedence, companions of the bath ranked immediately below masters in lunacy. He was proud of the Treasury's war record. Other departments of state had swollen to amazing dimensions during the war. The Treasury, while its work had been multiplied a hundredfold, had increased its personnel by only a negligible percentage. It was the cheapest of all the departments, the most efficient, and the most powerful. The War Office, the Admiralty, and perhaps one other department presided over by a personality whom the Prime Minister feared, did certainly defy and even ignore the Treasury. But the remaining departments, and especially the Mushroom Ministries, might scheme as much as they liked. They could do nothing until the Treasury had approved their enterprises. Modest Mr. Prohack was among the chief arbiters of destiny for them. He had daily sat in a chair by himself, and approved or disapproved according to his conscience and the rules of the Exchequer. And his fiats, in practice, had gone forth as the fiats of the Treasury. Moreover, he could not be bullied, for he was full of the sense that the whole constitution and moral force of the British Empire stood waiting to back him. Scarcely known beyond the Treasury, within the Treasury he had acquired a reputation as the terror of the departments. Several times irritated ministers, or their high subordinates, had protested that the Treasury's, Mr. Prohack's, passion for rules, its demands for scientific evidence, and its sceptical disposition were losing the war. Mr. Prohack had in effect retorted, Departmentally considered, losing the war is a detail. He had retorted, Wild cats will not win the war. And he had retorted, I know nothing but my duty. In the end, the war was not lost, and Mr. Prohack reckoned that he personally, by the exercise of courage in the face of grave danger, had saved to the country five hundred and forty-six millions of the country's money. At any rate, he had exercised a real influence over the conduct of the war. On one occasion, a chief being absent, he had had to answer a summons to the inner cabinet. On this occasion, he had remarked to his excited wife, They were far more nervous than I was. Despite all this, the great public had never heard of him. His portrait had never appeared in the illustrated papers. His wife's portrait as war worker and wife of a great official had never appeared in the illustrated papers. No character sketch of him had ever been printed. His opinions on any subject had never been telephonically or otherwise demanded by the editors of up-to-date dailies. His news value, indeed, was absolutely nil. In who's who? he had only four lines of space. 
Mr. Brohack's breakfast consisted of bacon, dry toast, coffee, marmalade, the Times, and the Daily Picture. The latter was full of brides and bridegrooms, football, enigmatic murder trials, young women in their fluffy underclothes, medicines, pugilists, cinema stars, the biggest pumpkin of the season, uplift and inspire prophecy concerning horses and company shares, together with a few brief, unillustrated notes about civil war in Ireland, famine in Central Europe, and the collapse of realms. 2. "'Ah, so I've caught you,' said his wife, coming brightly into the room. She was a buxom woman of forty-three. Her black hair was elaborately done for the day, but she wore a roomy peignoir instead of a frock. It was Chinese in the imperial yellow, inconceivably embroidered with flora, fauna, and grotesques. She always thus visited her husband at breakfast, picking bits off his plate like a bird, and proving to him that her chief preoccupation was ever his well-being, and the satisfaction of his capricious tastes. "'Many years ago,' said Mr. Prohack, "'you make a fuss about buying the daily picture for me. You say it humiliates you to see it in the house, and I don't know what.' but I catch you reading it yourself, and before you've opened the Times. Dear, dear, that bacon's a cinder, and I don't say anything to her. Lady, replied Mr. Prokow, we all have something base in our natures. Sin springs from opportunity. I cannot resist the damned paper. And he stuck his fork into the fair frock coat of a fatuous bridegroom coming out of church. My fault again, the wife remarked brightly. The husband changed the subject. I suppose that your son and daughter are still asleep? Well, dearest, you know that they were both at that dance last night. They ought not to have been. The popular idea that life is a shimmy is a dangerous illusion. Mr. Prohack felt the epigram to be third-rate, but he carried it off lightly. Sissy only went because Charlie wanted to go, and all I can say is that it's a nice thing if Charlie isn't to be allowed to enjoy himself now the war's over, after all he's been through. You're mixing up two quite different things. I bet that if Charlie committed murder you'd go into the witness box and tell the judge he'd been wounded twice and won the military cross. This is one of your pernickety mornings. Seeing that your debauched children woke me at 3.15. They woke me up too. That's different. You can go to sleep again. I can't. You rather like being wakened up because you take a positively sensual pleasure in turning over and going to sleep again. You hate me for that. I do. I make you very unhappy sometimes, don't I? Eve, you are a confounded liar, and you know it. You have never caused me a moment's unhappiness. You may annoy me. You may exasperate me. You are frequently unspeakable. But you have never made me unhappy. And why? Because I am one of the few exponents of romantic passion left in this city. My passion for you transcends my reason. I am a fool, but I am a magnificent fool and the greatest miracle of modern times is that, after twenty-four years of marriage, you should be able to give me pleasure by perching your stout body on the arm of my chair as you are doing. Arthur, I'm not stout. Yes, you are. You're enormous. But hang it, I'm such a morbid fool. I like you enormous. Mrs. Brehack, smiling mysteriously, remarked in a casual tone as she looked at the daily picture, Why do people let their photographs get into the papers? It's awfully vulgar. It is, but we're all vulgar today. Look at that! He pointed to the page. The granddaughter of a duke who refused the hand of a princess sells her name and her face to a firm of shipowners who keep newspapers like their grandfathers kept pigeons. But perhaps I'm only making a noise like a man of fifty. You aren't fifty. I'm five hundred, and this coffee is remarkably thin. Let me taste it. Yes, you rob me of my coffee now said Mr. Prohack, surrendering his cup. Is it thin, or isn't it? I pride myself on living the higher life. My stomach is not my inexorable deity, but even on the mountain top which I inhabit there must be a limit to the thinness of the coffee. Eve, as he called her, after the mother and prototype of all women, her earthly name was Marion, sipped the coffee. She wrinkled her forehead and then glanced at him in trouble. Yes, it's thin, she said but I've had to ration the cook. Oh, Arthur, I am going to make you unhappy after all. It's impossible for me to manage any longer on the housekeeping allowance. I have told you before, said she. If you hadn't happened to mention the coffee, I mightn't have said anything for another fortnight. 
You started to give me more money in June, and you said that was the utmost limit you could go to, and I believed it was. But it isn't enough. I hate to bother you, and I feel ashamed. That's ridiculous. Why should you feel ashamed? Well, I'm like that. You're revelling in your own virtuousness, my girl. Now, in last week's Economist, it said that the index number of commodity prices had slightly fallen these last few weeks. I don't know anything about indexes and the Economist, Eve retorted, but I know what coffee is a pound, and I know what the tradesmen's books are. At this point she cried without warning. No, murmured Mr. Prohack soothingly, caressingly, you mustn't baptise me. I couldn't bear it. And he kissed her eyes. 3. I know we can't afford any more for housekeeping, she whispered, sniffing damply, and I'm ashamed I can't manage, and I knew I should make you unhappy. What with idle and greedy working men and all these profiteers? It's a shame. Yes, said Mr. Prohack, it's what our Charlie fought for and got wounded twice for and won the M.C. for. That's what it is. But, you see, we are the famous salaried middle class that you read so much about in the papers, and we're going through the famous process of being crushed between the famous upper and nether millstones. Those millstones have been approaching each other, and us, for some time. Now they've begun to nip. That funny feeling in your inside that's causing you still to baptise me, in spite of my protest, that's the first real nip. She caught her breath. Arthur, she said, if you go on like that, I shall scream. Do, Mr. Prohack encouraged her, but, of course, not too loud. At the same time, don't forget that I'm a humorist. Humorists make jokes when they're happy, and when they're unhappy, they make jokes. But it's horribly serious. Horribly. Mrs. Prohack slipped off the arm of the chair. Her body seemed to vibrate within the Chinese gown, and she effervesced into an ascending and descending series of sustained laughs. That's hysteria said Mr. Prohack, and if you don't stop, I shall be reluctantly compelled to throw the coffee over you. Water would be better, but there is none. Then Eve ceased suddenly. To think, she remarked with calmness, that you're called the terror of the department, and you're a great authority on finance, and you've been in the government service for nearly twenty-five years, and always done your duty. Child, Mr. Prohack interrupted her, don't tell me what I know. Try not to be surprised at any earthly phenomena. There are people who are always being astonished by the most familiar things. They live on earth as if they'd just dropped from Mars onto a poor foreign planet. It's not a sign of common sense. You've lived on earth now for, shall we say, some twenty-nine or thirty years, and if you don't know the place, you ought to. I assure you that there's nothing at all unusual in our case. We are perfectly innocent. We are even praiseworthy. And yet we shall have to suffer. It's quite a common case. You've read of thousands and millions of such cases. You've heard of lots personally. And you've actually met a few. Well, now, you yourself are a case. That's all. Mrs. Prohack said impatiently, I consider the government's treated you shamefully. Why, well, we're much worse off than we were before the war. The government has treated me shamefully but then he's treated hundreds of thousands of men shamefully. All governments do. But we have a position to keep up. True. That's where the honest poor have the advantage of us. You see, we are the dishonest poor. We've been to the same schools and universities, and we talk the same idiom, and we have the same manners, and like the same things, as people who spend more in a month or a week than we spend in a year. And we pretend, and they pretend, that they and we are exactly the same. We aren't, you know for one vast pretense. Has it occurred to you, lady, that we've never possessed a motor-car, and most certainly never shall possess one? Yet look at the hundreds of thousands of cars in London alone, and not a single one of them ours. This detail may have escaped you. I wish you wouldn't be silly, Arthur. I am not silly. On the contrary, my real opinion is that I am the wisest man you ever met in your life, not excepting your son. It remains that we're a pretense. A pretense resembles a bladder. It may burst, and we probably shall burst. Still, we have one great advantage over the honest poor, who sometimes have no income at all, and also over the rich, who never can tell how big their incomes are going to be. We know exactly where we are. We know to the nearest sixpence. 
I don't see that that helps us. I consider the government has treated you shamefully. I wonder you important men in the Treasury haven't formed a trade union before now. Oh, Eve, after all you've said about trade unions this year, you shock me. We shall never be properly treated until we do form a trade union. But we shall never form a trade union, because we're too proud. And we'd sooner see our children starve than yield in our pride. That's a fact. There's one thing. We can't move to a cheaper house. No, Mr. Prohack concurred, because there isn't one. Years earlier, Mr. Prohack had bought the long lease of this house from the old man, who, according to the logical London system, had built the house upon somebody else's land on the condition that he paid rent for the land, and in addition gave the house to the somebody else at the end of a certain period as a free gift. By a payment of twelve pounds per annum, Mr. Prohack was safe for forty years yet, and he calculated that in forty years the ownership of the house would be a matter of some indifference, both to him and to his wife. "'Well, as you're so desperately wise, perhaps you'll kindly tell me what we are to do.' "'I might borrow money on my insurance policy and speculate,' said Mr. Prohack gravely. "'Oh, Arthur, do you really think you—' Marian showed a wild gleam of hope. "'Or I might throw the money into the serpentine,' Mr. Prohack added. "'Oh, Arthur, I could kill you. I never know how to take you.' "'No, you never do. That's the worst of a woman like you, marrying a man like me.' They discussed devices. One servant fewer. No holiday. Cinemas instead of theatres. No books. No cigarettes. No taxis. No clothes. No meat. No telephone. No friends. They reached no conclusion. Eve referred to Adam's great treasury of mind. Adam said that his great treasury of mind should function on the problem during the day, and further that the problem must be solved that very night. "'I'll tell you one thing I shall do,' said Mrs. Prohack, in a decided tone, as Mr. Prohack left the table. "'I shall countermand Sissy's new frock.' "'If you do, I shall divorce you,' was the reply. "'But why?' Mr. Prohack answered. In 1917 I saw that girl in dirty overalls driving a thundering great van down Whitehall. Yesterday I met her in the foolish high heels and her shocking open-work stockings and her negligible dress and her exposed throat and her fur stole, and she was so delicious and so absurd and so futile and so sure of her power that, well, you aren't going to countermand any new frock. That chit has the right to ruin me not because of anything she's done, but because she is. I'm ready to commit peccadilloes, but not crimes. Good morning, my dove. And at the door, discreetly hiding her Chinese raiment behind the door, Eve said, as if he had only just thought of it, though she had been thinking of it for quite a quarter of an hour, Darling, there's your clubs. What about my clubs? Don't they cost you a lot of money? No. Besides, I lunch at my clubs better and cheaper than at any restaurant, and I shouldn't have time to come home for lunch. But do you need two clubs? I've always belonged to two clubs. Everyone does. But why two? A fellow must have a club up his sleeve. Couldn't you give up one? Lady, it's unthinkable. You don't know what you're suggesting. Abandon one of my clubs that my father put me up for when I was a boy. I'd as soon join a trade union. No, my innocent but gluttonous children shall starve first. I shall give up my club. Ah, but that's different. How is it different? You scarcely ever speak to a soul in your club. The food's bad in your club. They drink liqueurs before dinner at your club. I've seen them. Your club's full every night of the most formidable spinsters, each eating at a table alone. Give up your club by all means. Set fire to it and burn it down. But don't count the act as a renunciation. You hate your club. Good morning, my dove. 4. One advantage of the situation of Mr. Prohack's house was that his path therefrom to the Treasury lay almost entirely through verdant parks, Hyde Park, the Green Park, St. James's Park. Not infrequently he referred to the advantage in terms of bland satisfaction. True, in wet weather the advantage became a disadvantage, during his walk through Verdant Parks that morning, the terror of the departments, who habitually thought in millions, was very gloomy. Something resembling death was in his heart. 
humiliation also was certainly in his heart, for he felt that, no matter whose the fault, he was failing in the first duty of a man. He raged against the Chancellor of the Exchequer. He sliced off the head of the Chancellor of the Exchequer with his stick. But it was only an innocent autumn wildflower perilously blooming. And the tang in the air foretold the approach of winter, and the grip of winter, the hell of the poor. Near Whitehall he saw the advertisement of a firm of shop specialists. Bring your business troubles to us. End of chapter 1《Chapter Two of Mr. Prohack by Arnold Bennett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Chapter Two, From the Dead. One. Well, Milton had a good holiday," said Mr. Prohack to the hall porter on entering his chief club for lunch that day. "No, sir," said the hall porter, who was a realist. "Ah, well," said Mr. Prohack soothingly. "Perhaps not a bad thing." There's nothing like an unsatisfactory holiday for reconciling us all to a life of toil, is there? No, sir, said Milton impassively, and added, Mr. Bishop has just called to see you, sir. I told him you'd probably be in shortly. He said he wouldn't wait, but he might look in again. Thanks, said Mr. Prohack. If he does, I should be either in the coffee-room or upstairs. Mr. Prohack walked into the majestic interior of the club, which had been closed rather later than usual, for its annual cleaning. He savoured anew and more sharply the beauty and stateliness of its architecture, the elaboration of its conveniences, the severe splendour of its luxury. And he saw familiar and congenial faces, and on every face was a mild joy, similar to the joy which he himself experienced in the reopening of the club. And he was deliciously aware of the club feeling, unlike and more agreeable than any other atmosphere of an organism in the world. The club took no time at all to get into its tried after the closure. It opened its doors and was instantly its full self. For hundreds of grave men in and near London had risen that very morning from their beds, uplifted by the radiant thought, "'Today I can go to the club again.' Mr. Brohack had long held that the noblest, the most civilised achievement of the British character was not the British Empire, nor the House of Commons, nor the steam engine, nor Adeline dies, nor the music halls, but a good West End club. And somehow, at the doors of a good West End club, there was an invisible magic sieve, through which the human body could pass, but through which human worries could not pass. This morning, however, Mr. Brohack perceived that one worry could pass through the sieve, namely a worry concerning the club itself. Give up the club? Was the sacrifice to be consummated? Impossible. Could he picture himself strolling down St. James's Street without the right to enter the sacred gates, save as a guest? And supposing he entered as a guest, could he bear the hall porter to say to him, If you'll take a seat, sir, I'll send and see if Mr. Blank is in the club. What name, sir? Impossible. Yet Milton would be capable of saying just that. Milton would never pardon a defection. Well, then, he must give up the other club. But the other and smaller club, had great qualities of its own. Indeed, it was indispensable. And could he permit the day to dawn on which he would no longer be entitled to refer to my other club? Impossible. Nevertheless, he had decided to give up his other club. He must give it up, if only to keep even with his wife. The monetary saving would be unimportant, but the act would be spectacular. And Mr. Prohack perfectly comprehended the value of the spectacular in existence. 2. He sat down to lunch among half a dozen cronies at one of the larger tables in a window embrasure of the vaulted coffee-room with its precious portrait of that historic clubman, Charles James Fox, and he ordered himself the cheapest meal that the menu could offer, and poured himself out a glass of water. "'Same old menu,' remarked savagely Mr. Prehack's great crony, Sir Paul Spinner, the banker, who suffered from carbuncles and who always drove over from the city in the middle of the day. "'Here's old Paul grumbling again,' said Sims of Downing Street. "'After all, this is the best club in London.' "'It certainly is,' said Mr. Prohack, "'when it's closed. "'During the past four weeks this club has been the most perfect institution on the face of the earth.' They all laughed. 
and they began recounting to each other the unparalleled miseries and indignities which such of them had had remained in London and had to endure in the clubs that had extended their hospitality to members of the closed club. The catalogue of ills was terrible. Yes, there was only one club deserving of the name. Still, said Sir Paul, they might give us a rest from prunes and rice. This club, said Mr. Prohack, like all other clubs, is managed by a committee of Methuselahs who can only digest prunes and rice. And, after a lot more talk about the idiosyncrasies of clubs, he said, with a casual air, For myself, I belong to too many clubs, said Hunter, a fellow official of the Treasury. But I thought you only had two clubs, Arthur. Only two, but it's one too many. In fact, I'm not sure if it isn't two too many. Are you getting disgusted with human nature? Sim suggested. No, said Mr. Prohack. I'm getting hard up. I've committed the greatest crime in the world. I've committed poverty. And I feel guilty. And the truth was that he did feel guilty. He was entirely innocent. He was a victim. He had left undone nothing that he ought to have done. But he felt guilty, thus proving that poverty is indeed seriously a crime, and that those who in sardonic jest describe it as a crime are deeper philosophers than they suppose. "'Never say die,' smiled the monocle Mixon, a publisher of scientific works, and began to inveigh against the government as an ungrateful and unscrupulous employer and exploiter of dutiful men in an inferno of rising prices. But the rest thought Mixon unhappy in his choice of topic. Hunter of the Treasury said nothing. What was there to say that would not tend to destroy the true club atmosphere? Even the beloved Prohack had perhaps failed somewhat intact. They all understood. They all mildly sympathised. But they could do no more, particularly in a miscellaneous assemblage of eight members. No, they felt a certain constraint, and in a club constraint should be absolutely unknown. Some of them glanced uneasily about the crowded, chattering room. 3. It was then that a remarkable coincidence occurred. "'I saw Bishop at Inverness last week,' said Sir Paul Spinner to Mr. Prohack, apropos of nothing whatever. "'Seems he's got a big moor this year in Sutherlandshire, so I suppose he's recovered from his overdose of shipping shares.' Bishop, Fred Farrows, was a financier with a cheerful, negligent attitude towards the insecurities and uncertainties of a speculative existence. He was also a close friend of Prohack, of Sir Paul, and of several others at the table, and a member of Prohack's secondary club, though not of his primary club. "'That's strange,' said Mr. Prohack. "'I hear he's in London.' "'He most positively isn't in London,' said Sir Paul. "'He's not coming back until November.' "'Then that shows how little the evidence of the senses can be relied upon,' remarked Mr. Prohack gently. "'According to the hall-porter, he called here for me a few minutes ago, and he may call again.' The banker grunted. "'A deuce he did. Does that mean he's in some fresh trouble, I wonder?' At the same moment, a page girl, the smart severity of whose uniform was mitigated by a pigtail and a bow of ribbon, approached Mr. Prohack's chair, and, bending her young head to his ear, delivered to him with the manner of a bearer of formidable secrets. "'Mr. Bishop to see you, sir.' "'There he is!' exclaimed Mr. Prohack. "'Now he's bound to want lunch. Why on earth can't we bring guests in here? Waitress, have the lunch I've ordered served in the guests' dining-room, please. No doubt Bishop and I'll see you chaps upstairs later.' He went off to greet and to welcome Bishop, full of joy at the prospect of tasting anew the rich personality of his old friend. It is true that he had a qualm about the expense of standing Bishop a lunch. A fellow who relished his food and drink and could distinguish between the best and the second best. But on the other hand, he could talk very freely to Bishop concerning the crisis in which he found himself. And he knew that Bishop would not allow Bishop's affairs, however troublesome they might be, unduly to bother him. Bishop was not on the bench in the hall where visitors were appointed to wait. Only one man was on the bench a spectacled, red-faced person. Mr. Prohack glanced about. Then the page-girl pointed to the spectacled person, who jumped up and approached Mr. Prohack somewhat effusively. "'How do you do, Prohack?' "'Well, Bishop,' Mr. Prohack responded, "'it's you!' 
It was another bishop, a bishop whom he had forgotten, a bishop who had resigned from the club earlier and disappeared. Mr. Prohack did not like it. Mr. Prohack said to himself, This fellow is after something, and I always knew he was an adventurer. Funny feeling it gives you to be asked to wait in the call of a club that you used to belong to, said Bishop. Apparently simple words, heavy with sinister significance, sank like a depth charge into Mr. Prohack's consciousness. Among other things, said Mr. Prohack to himself, this fellow is very obviously after a free lunch. Now Mr. Prohack suffered from a strange form of insincerity which he had often unsuccessfully tried to cure, partly because it advanced unsympathetic acquaintances at his expense, and partly because his wife produced unanswerable arguments against it with mortal effect. Although an unconceited man, as men go, and a very honest man, he could not help pretending to like people whom he did not like. And he pretended with a histrionic skill that deceived everybody, sometimes even himself. There may have been some good nature in this moral twist of his, but he well knew that it originated chiefly in three morbid desires. The desire to please, the desire to do the easiest thing, and the desire to nourish his reputation for amiability. So that when the unexpected Mr. Bishop, whose Christian name was Softly, said to him, I won't keep you now, only I was passing, and I want you to be kind enough to make an early appointment with me at some time and place entirely convenient to yourself. Mr. Prohack proceeded to persuade Mr. Bishop to stay to lunch, there being no sort of reason in favour of such a course, and various sound reasons against it. Mr. Prohack deceived Mr. Softly Bishop as follows. No time and place like the present. You must stay to lunch. This is your old club, and you must stay to lunch. But, but you've begun your lunch, Bishop protested. I've not. The fact is, I was half expecting you to look in again. The hall porter told me. And Mr. Prohack actually patted Mr. Bishop on the shoulder, a trick he had. Come now, don't tell me you've got another lunch appointment. It's twenty-five to two. And to himself, leading Mr. Bishop to the stranger's dining-room, he said, why should I further my own execution in this way? He ordered a lunch as copious and as costly as he would have ordered for the other, the real bishop. P powerful and vigorous in some directions, Mr. Brohack's mentality was deplorably weak in at least one other. Mr. Softly Bishop was delighted with his reception, and Mr. Hope Prohack began to admit that Mr. Bishop had some personal charm. Nevertheless, when the partridge came, Mr. Prohack acidly reflected. I'm offering this fellow a portion of my daughter's new frock on a charger. They talked of the club, Mr. Bishop, as a former member, being surely entitled to learn all about it. And then they talked about clubs in the United States, where Mr. Bishop had spent recent years. But Mr. Bishop persisted in giving no hint of his business. It must be something rather big and annoying, thought Mr. Prohack and ordered another portion of his daughter's new frock in the shape of excellent cigar. "'You don't mean to say we can smoke here?' exclaimed Mr. Bishop. "'Yes,' said Mr. Prohack. "'Not in the members' coffee-room, but we can here. Stroke of genius on the part of the committee. You see, it tends to keep guests out of the smoking-room, which for a long time has been getting uncomfortably full after lunch.' "'Good God!' murmured Mr. Bishop, simply. 4. And he added at once, as he lighted the Corona Corona, "'Well, I'd better tell you what I've come to see you about. "'You remember that chap Silas Angmering?' "'Silas Angmering? Of course I do. He used to belong here. "'He cleared off to America ages ago.' "'He did, and you lent him a hundred pounds to help him to clear off to America.' "'Who told you?' "'He did,' said Mr. Bishop, with a faint, mysterious smile. "'What's happened to him?' "'Oh, all sorts of things.' He made a lot of money out of the war. He established himself in Cincinnati, and there were um, opportunities. How came he to tell you that I'd lent him anything? Mr. Prohack interrupted sharply. I had business with him at one time, before the war, and also just after the war began. Indeed, I was in partnership with him. Mr. Bishop spoke with a measured, soothing calmness. And you say he's made a lot of money out of the war? What do you mean, a lot? Well, 
said Mr. Bishop, looking at the tablecloth through his glittering spectacles. I mean, a lot. His tone was confidential, but then his tone was always confidential. He continued, He's lost it all since. Pity he didn't pay me back my hundred pounds while he got it. How did he lose his money? In the same way as most British men lose their money, answered Mr. Bishop. He died. Although Mr. Prohack would have been capable of telling a similar story in a manner very similar to Mr. Bishop's, he didn't quite relish his guest's theatricality. It increased his suspicion of his guest, and checked the growth of friendliness which the lunch had favoured. Still, he perceived that there was a good chance of getting his hundred pounds back, possibly with interest, and the interest would mount up to fifty or sixty pounds, and a hundred and fifty pounds appeared to him to be an enormous sum. Then it occurred to him that probably Mr. Bishop was not indeed after anything, and that he had been unjust to Mr. Bishop. Married? he questioned casually. Angry? No, he never married. You know as well as anybody, I expect, what sort of a card he was. No relations, either. Then uh, who's come into his money? Well, said Mr. Bishop, with elaborate ease and smoothness of quiet delivery, I've come into some of it. And there was a woman, actress sort of young thing, about whom perhaps the less said the better. She's come into some of it. And you've come into some of it. We share it in equal thirds. The deuce we do. Yes. How long's he been dead? About five weeks or less. I sailed as soon as I could after he was buried. I'd arranged before to come. I dare say I ought to have stayed a bit longer, as I'm the executor under the will. But I wanted to come, and I've got a very good lawyer over there, and over here, too. I landed this morning, and here I am. Strictly speaking, I suppose I should have cabled you, but it seemed to me that I could explain better by word of mouth. I wish you would explain, said Mr. Prohack. You say he's been rich a long time, but he didn't pay his debts to me, and yet he goes and makes a will, leaving me a third of his fortune. Wants some explaining, doesn't it? Mr. Bishop replied, it does, and it doesn't. You knew he was a champion postponer, poor old chap. Profoundly unbusinesslike. It's astonishing how unbusinesslike successful men are. He was always meaning to come to England to, to see you, but he never found time. He constantly talked of you. But do you know, Mr. Prohack intervened, that from that day to this I've never heard one single word from him? Not even a picture postcard. What more? I've never heard a single word of him. Yeah, just like Silas that was. Just. He died from a motor accident. He was perfectly conscious and knew he'd only got a few hours to live. Spine. He made his will in a hospital, and died about a couple of hours after he made it. I wasn't there myself. I was in New York. Well, well, muttered Mr. Prohack. Poor fellow. Well, well, this is the most amazing tale I've ever heard in my life. It is rather strange, Mr. Bishop compassionately admitted. A silence fell, respectful to the memory of the dead. The members' coffee-room seemed to Mr. Prohack to be a thousand miles off, and the chat with his cronies at the table in the window embrasure to have happened a thousand years ago. His brain was in anarchy, and waving like a flag above the anarchy was the question, How much did old Silas leave? but the deceitful fellow would not permit the question to utter itself. He had dominion over himself at any rate to that extent. He would not break the silence. He would hide his intense curiosity. He would force softly Bishop to divulge the supreme fact upon his own initiative. And at length Mr. Bishop remarked musingly, Yes, thanks to the exchange being so low, you stand to receive at the very least a hundred thousand pounds clear after all deductions had been made. "'Do I really?' said Mr. Prohack, also musingly. End of chapter 2 Chapter 3 of Mr. Prohack by Arnold Bennett This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers Mr. Prohack, Chapter 3 1 the law. His tranquil tone disguised the immense anarchy within. 
Silas Angmering had evidently been what is called a profiteer. He had made his money out of the war. And Silas was an Englishman. While Englishmen, and later Americans, had given up lives, sanity, fortunes, limbs, eyesight, health, Silas had gained riches. There was nothing highly unusual in this. Mr. Prohack had himself seen in the very club in which he was now entertaining softly Bishop, a man who had left an arm in France, chatting and laughing with a man who had picked up over a million pounds by following the great principle that a commodity is worth what it will fetch when people want it very badly and there is a shortage of it. Mr. Prohack, too, had often chatted and laughed with this same picker-up of a million, who happened to be a quite jolly and generous fellow. Mr. Prohack would have chatted and laughed with Barabbas, convinced as he was that iniquity is the result of circumstances rather than of deliberate naughtiness. He seldom condemned. He greatly liked Silas Angmering, who was a really educated and a well-intentioned man, with a queer, regrettable twist in his composition. That Silas should have profiteered when he got the chance was natural. Most men would do the same. Most heroes would do the same. The man with one arm would conceivably do the same. But, between excusing and forgiving a brigand, who has not despoiled you, and sharing his plunder, there was a gap, a chasm. Few facts gave Mr. Prohack a more serene and proud satisfaction than the fact that he had materially lost through the war. He was positively glad that he had lost, and that the government, his employer, had treated him badly. And now to become the heir of a profiteer! Nor was that all. To become the co-heir with a woman of dubious renown, and with Mr. Softly Bishop. He knew nothing about the woman, and would think nothing. But he knew a little about Mr. Softly Bishop. Mr. Bishop, it used to be known and said in the club, had never had a friend. He had the usual number of acquaintances, but no relationship more intimate. Mr. Prohack in the old days had not for a long time actively disliked Mr. Bishop, but he had been surprised at the amount of active dislike which contact with Mr. Bishop engendered in other members of the club. Why such dislike? Was it due to his fat red face, his spectacles, his conspiratorial manner, tone and gait, the evenness of his temper, his cautiousness, his mysteriousness. Nobody knew. In the end Mr. Prohack also had succeeded in disliking him. But Mr. Prohack produced a reason, and that reason was Mr. Bishop's first name. On it being pointed out to Mr. Prohack by argufiers that Mr. Bishop was not responsible for his first name, Mr. Prohack would reply that the mentality of parents capable of bestowing on an innocent child the Christian name of Softly was incomprehensible, and in a high degree suspicious, and that therefore, by the well-known laws of heredity, there must be something devilish odd in the mentality of their offspring, especially seeing that the offspring pretended to glory in the Christian name as being a fine old English name. No. Mr. Prohack might stomach co-heirship with a far-off dubious woman, but could he stomach co-heirship with Softly Bishop? It would necessitate friendship with Mr. Bishop. It would bracket him for ever with Mr. Bishop. 2. These various considerations, however, had little to do with the immense inward anarchy that Mr. Prohack's tone had concealed, as he musingly murmured, Do I really? The disturbance was due almost exclusively to a fierce imperial joy in the prospect of immediate wealth. The origin of the wealth scarcely affected him. The associations of the wealth scarcely affected him. He understood in a flash the deep wisdom of that old proverb, whose truth he had often hitherto denied, that money has no smell. Perhaps there might be forty good reasons against his accepting the inheritance, but they were all ridiculous. Was he to abandon his share of the money to Softly Bishop and the vampire woman? Such a notion was idiotic. It was contrary to the robust and matter-of-fact common sense which always marked his actions, if not his theories. No more should his wife be compelled to scheme out painfully the employment of her housekeeping allowance. Never again should there be a question about a new frock for his daughter. He was conscious, before anything else, of a triumphant, protective and spoiling tenderness for his women. He would be absurd with his women. He would ruin their characters with kindness and with invitations to be capricious 
and exacting and expensive and futile. They nobly deserved it. He wanted to shout and to sing and to tell everybody that he would not in future stand any damned nonsense from anybody. He would have his way. Why? thought he, pulling himself up. I've developed all the peculiarities of a millionaire in about a minute and a half. And again he cried to himself, in the vast and imperfectly explored jungle that every man calls his heart. Ha! I could not have borne to give up either of my clubs. No, I was deceiving myself. I could not have done it. I could not have done it. Anything rather than that. I see it now. By the way, I wonder what all the fellows will say when they know. And how shall I break it to them? Not to-day. Not to-day. To-morrow. At the moment when Mr. Prohack ought to have been resuming his ill-remunerated financial toil for the nation at the Treasury, Bishop suggested in his off-hand murmuring style that they might pay a visit to the city solicitor who was acting in England for him and the angering estate. Mr. Prohack opposingly suggested that national duty called him elsewhere. "'Does that matter now?' said Bishop, and his accents were charged with meaning. Mr. Prohack saw that it did not matter, and that in future any nation that did not like his office hours would have to lump them. He feared greatly lest he might encounter some crony member on his way out of the club with Bishop. If he did, what should he say? How should he carry off the situation? For he was feeling mysteriously guilty, just as he had felt guilty an hour earlier. Not guilty as the inheritor of profiteering in particular, but guilty simply as an inheritor. It might have been different if he had come into the money in reasonable instalments, say, of five thousand pounds every six months. But a hundred thousand unearned increment at one coup? Fortunately, the cronies were still in the smoking-room. He swept Bishop from the club stealthily, swiftly. Bishop had a big motor-car waiting at the door. 3. He offered no remark as to the car, and Mr. Prohack offered no remark. But Mr. Prohack was very interested in the car, he who had never been interested in cars, and he was interested in the clothes and in the deportment of the chauffeur. He was indeed interested in all sorts of new things. The window of a firm of house agents who specialised in country houses, the jewellers' shops, the big hotels, the advertisements of theatres and concerts the establishments of trunk-makers and of historic second-hand booksellers and of equally historic wine-merchants. He saw them all with a fresh eye. London suddenly opened to him its possibilities as a bud opens its petals. "'Not a bad car they hired out to me,' said Bishop at length, with casual approval. "'You've hired it?' "'No, oh, yes.' And shortly afterwards Bishop said, it's fantastic the number of cars there are in use in America. You know, it's a literal fact that almost every American family has a car. For instance, whenever there's a big meeting of strikers in New York, all the streets near the hall are blocked with cars. Mr. Prohack had food for reflection. His outlook upon life was changed. And later Bishop said, again apropos of nothing, Of course it's only too true that the value of money has fallen by about half. But on the other hand, interest has about doubled. You can get ten per cent on quite safe security in these days. Even governments have to pay about seven, uh, as you know. Yes, concurred Mr. Brohack. Ten thousand pounds a year. And then he thought, What an infernal nuisance it would be if there was a revolution. Oh, but there couldn't be. It's unthinkable. Revolution everywhere, yes, but not in England or America and he saw with the most sane and steady insight that the final duty of a government was to keep order. Change there must be, but let change come gradually. Injustices must be rem remedied naturally, but without any upheaval. Yet in the club some of the cronies, and he among them, after inveighing against profiteers and against the covetousness of trades unions, had often held that a, a good red revolution was the only way of knocking sense into the heads of these two classes. The car got involved in a block of traffic near the mansion-house, and rain began to fall. The two occupants of the car watched each other surreptitiously, mutually suspicious, like dogs. Scraps of talk were separated by long intervals. 
Mr. Brohack wondered what the deuce Softly Bishop had done that Angwin should leave him a hundred thousand pounds. He tried to feel grief for the tragic and untimely death of his old friend Angmering, and failed. No doubt the failure was due to the fact that he had not seen Angmering for so many years. At last, Mr. Prohack, his hands in his pockets, his legs stretched out, his gaze uplifted, said suddenly, "'I suppose it'll hold water.' "'What? The roof of the car?' "'No, the will.' Mr. Softly Bishop gave a short laugh, but made no other answer. Four. The car halted finally before an immense new block of buildings, and the inheritors floated up to the fifth floor in a padded lift manned by a brilliantly uniformed attendant. Mr. Prohack saw Smathe and Smathe in gilt on a glass door. The inquiry office resembled the anteroom of a restaurant, as the whole building resembled a fashionable hotel. Everywhere was mosaic flooring. Uh, Mr. Percy Smathe, demanded Bishop of a clerk, whose head glittered in the white radiance of a green-shaded lamp. "'I'll see, sir. Please step into the waiting room.' And he waved a patronising, negligent hand. Uh, "'What name?' he added. "'Have you forgotten my name already?' Mr. Bishop retorted sharply. "'Bishop, tell Mr. Percy Smith I'm here at once, please.' And he led Mr. Prohack to the waiting-room, which was a magnificent apartment with stained glass windows, furnished in Chippendale similar to, but much finer than, the furnishing of Mr. Prohack's own house. On the table were newspapers and periodicals, not the Engineering Times of April in the previous year, or A Punch of the previous decade, and The Vaccination Record, but such things as The Current, Tatler, Times, Economist, and La Vie Parisienne. Mr. Prohack had uncomfortable qualms of apprehension. For several minutes past he had been thinking, Suppose there is something up with that will. He had little confidence in Mr. Softly Bishop. And now the aspect of the solicitor's office frightened him. It had happened to him, being a favourite trustee of his relations and friends, to visit the offices of some of the first legal firms in Lincoln's Inn Fields. You entered these lairs by a dirty door and a dirty corridor and another dirty door. He were interrogated by a shabby clerk who sat on a foul stool at a foul desk in a foul office. And finally, after an interval in the cubbyhole that could not boast even the anti-vaccination record, he were driven along a dirtier passage into a dirtiest room whose windows were obscured by generations of filth. And in that room sat a spick-and-span lawyer of great name who was probably an ex-president of the Incorporated Law Society. The offices of Smathe and Smathe corresponded with alarming closeness to Mr. Prohack's idea of what a bucket shop might be. Mr. Prohack had the gravest fears for his hundred thousand pounds. This is the solicitor's office new style, said Bishop, who seemed to have an uncanny gift of reading thoughts. Very big firm, Anglo-American. Smathe and Smathe are two cousins. Percy's American, English mother. They specialise in what I may call the international complication business, pleasant and unpleasant. Mr. Prohack was not appreciably reassured. Then a dapper, youngish man, with a carnation in his buttonhole, stepped neatly into the room, and greeted Bishop in a marked American accent. "'Here I am again,' said Bishop curtly. "'Mr. Prohack, may I introduce Mr. Percy Smith? "'Oh, Mr. Prohack, I'm delighted to make your acquaintance.' Mr. Prohack beheld the lawyer's candid, honest face, heard his tones of extreme deference, and noticed that he had come to the inquiry room to fetch his clients. "'There's only one explanation of this,' said Mr. Prohack to himself. "'I'm a genuinely wealthy person.' And in Mr. Percy Smathe's private room he listened but carelessly to a long legal recital. Details did not interest him. He knew he was all right." End of chapter 3
That afternoon Mr. Prohack just got back to his bank before closing time. He negligently declined to comprehend a very discreet hint from Mr. Percy Smythe that if he desired ready money he could have it, in bulk. Nevertheless, he did desire to feel more money than usual in his pocket, and he satisfied this desire at the bank, where the September quarter of his annual salary lay almost intact. His bank was near Hanover Square, a situation inconvenient for him, but he had chosen that particular branch because its manager happened to be a friend of his. The Prohack account did no good to the manager personally, and only infinitesimal good to the vast corporation of which the branch manager was the well-dressed, well-spoken serf. The corporation was a sort of sponge, prodigiously absorbent, but incapable of being squeezed. The manager could not be of the slightest use to Mr. Prohack in a financial crisis, for the reason that he was empowered to give no accommodation whatever without the consent of the head office. Still, Mr. Prohack, being a vigorous sentimentalist, as all truly wise men are, liked to bank with a friend. On the present occasion he saw the branch manager, Insert by name, explained that he wanted some advice, and made an appointment to meet the latter at the latter's club, the Oriental, at six-thirty. Thereupon he returned to the Treasury, and from mere high fantasy spread the interesting news that he had broken a back tooth at lunch and had had to visit his dentist at Putney. His colleague, Hunter, remarked to him that he seemed strangely gay for a man with a broken tooth, and Mr. Prohack answered that a philosopher always had resources of fortitude within himself. He then winked, a phenomenon hitherto unknown at the Treasury. He stayed so late at his office that he made the acquaintance of two charwomen, whom he courteously chafed. He was defeated in the subsequent encounter, and acknowledged the fact by two half-crowns. At the Oriental Club he told Insert that he might soon have some money to invest, and he was startled and saddened to discover that Insert knew almost nothing about exciting investments, or about anything at all, except the rigours of tube travel to Golders Green. Insert had sunk into a deplorable groove. When, confidentially, Insot told him the salary of a branch manager of a vast corporation near Hanover Square, and incidentally mentioned that a bank clerk might not marry without the consent in writing of the vast corporation, Mr. Prohack understood and pardoned the deep, deplorable groove. Insot could afford a club simply because his father, the once celebrated authority on Japanese armour, had left him a hundred and fifty a year. Compared to the ruck of branch managers, Insert was a free and easy plutocrat. As he departed from the Oriental, Mr. Prohack sighed, Poor Insert! A sturdy and even exultant cheerfulness was, however, steadily growing in him. Poor Insert, unaware that he had been talking to a man with an assured income of ten thousand pounds a year, had unconsciously helped that man to realise the miracle of his own good fortune. Mr. Prohack's route home lay through a big residential square or so, and along residential streets of the first quality. All the houses were big, and they seemed bigger in the faint October mist. It was the hour after lighting up, and before the drawing of blinds and curtains. Mr. Brohack had glimpses of enormous and magnificent interiors, some right in the sky, some on the ground, with carved ceilings, rich candelabra, heavily framed pictures, mighty furniture, statuary, and superb and nonchalant menials engaged in the pleasant task of shutting away those interiors from the vulgar gaze. The spectacle continued furlong upon furlong, monotonously. There was no end to the succession of palaces of the wealthy. Then it would be interrupted, while Mr. Prohack crossed a main thoroughfare, where scores of young women struggled against a few men for places in glittering motor-buses that were already packed with successful fighters for room in them, and then it would be resumed again in its majesty. The sight of the street travellers took Mr. Prohack's mind back to insult. He felt a passionate sympathy for the insults of the world, and also for the Prohacks of six hours earlier. Once Mr. Prohack had been in easier circumstances, but those circumstances, thanks to the ambitions of statesmen and generals, and to the simplicity of publics, had gradually changed from easy to distressed. He saw with terrible clearness from what fate the angmering miracle had saved him and his. 
he wanted to reconstruct society in the interest of those to whom no miracle had happened. He wanted to do away with all excessive wealth, and by excessive he meant any degree of wealth beyond what would be needed for the perfect comfort of himself, Mr. Prohack, a reasonable man if ever there was one. Ought he not to devote his fortune to the great cause of reconstructing society? Could he enjoy his fortune while society remained unreconstructed? Well, societies were not to be reconstructed by the devoting of fortunes to the work. Moreover, if he followed such an extreme course, he would be regarded as a crank, and he could not have borne to be regarded as a crank. He detested cranks more than murderers or even profiteers. As for enjoying his fortune in present circumstances, he thought that he might succeed in doing so, and that anyhow it was his duty to try. He was regrettably inconsistent. 2. Having entered his house, as it were, surreptitiously, and avoiding his children, Mr. Prohack peeped through the half-open door between the conjugal bedroom and the small adjoining room, which should have been a dressing-room, but which Mrs. Prohack styled her boudoir. He espied her standing sideways in front of the long mirror, her body prettily curved, and her head twisted over her shoulder, showed that she could see three-quarters of her back in the mirror an attitude familiar to Mr. Prohack, and one that he liked. She was wearing the Chinese garment of the morning, but he perceived that she had done something to it. He made a sharp noise with the handle of the door. She shrieked and started, and as soon as she had recovered she upbraided him, and as soon as she had upbraided him she asked him anxiously what he thought of the robe, explaining that it was really too good for a dressing-gown, that with careful treatment it would wear for ever, that it could not have been bought now for a hundred pounds or at least eighty, that it was in essence far superior to many frocks worn by women who had more money and less taste than herself, that she had transformed it into a dinner-dress for quiet evenings at home, and that she had done this as part of her part of the new economy scheme. It would save all her other frocks, and as for her dressing-gown, she had two old ones in her reserves. Mr. Prohack kissed her and told her to sit down on the little sofa. "'To see the effect of it sitting down?' she gasped. "'If you like,' said he. "'Then you don't care for it? You think it's ridiculous?' said she anxiously, when she had sat down. He replied, standing in front of her, "'You know that Oxford Concise Dictionary that I bought just before the war? Where is it?' "'Arthur,' she said, "'what's the matter with you? You look so queer. I suppose the dictionary is where you keep it. I never touch it.' I want you to be sure to remind me to cross the word economy out of it to-night. In fact, I think I'd better tear out the whole page. Arthur! she exclaimed again. Are you ill? Has anything serious happened? I warn you, I can't stand much more to-day. Something very serious has happened, answered the incorrigible Mr. Prohack. It may be all for the best. It may be all for the worst. Depends how you look at it. Anyway, I'm determined to tell you. Of course, I shouldn't dream of telling anybody else until I'd told you. He seated himself by her side. There was just space enough for the two of them on the sofa. Oh, dear, sighed Mrs. Prohack with apprehension, and instinctively she stretched her arm out and extinguished one of the lights. He had been touched by her manoeuvre, half economy and half coquetry, with the Chinese dress. He was still more touched by the gesture of extinguishing a light. For a year or two past, Mrs. Prohack had been putting forward a theory that an average degree of illumination tried her eyes, and the household was now accustomed to twilight rooms in the evening. Mr. Prohack knew that the recent taste for obscurity had nothing to do with her eyes and everything to do with her ears, but he pretended to be deceived by her duplicity. Not for millions would he have given her cause to suspect that he was not perfectly deceived. He understood and sympathised with her in all her manifestations. He did not select choice pieces of her character for liking, and dislike or disapprove of the rest. He took her undivided, unchipped, and liked the whole of her. It was very strange. When he married her he had assumed, but was not sure, that he loved her. For thirteen or fourteen years she had endangered the bond between them by what seemed to him to be her caprices, illogicalities, perversities and had saved it by her charming demonstrations of affection. During this period he had remained, as it were, neutral, 
an impassive spectator of her union with a man who happened to be himself. He had observed and weighed all her faults, and had concluded that she was not worse than other wives whom he respected. He continued to wonder what it was that held them together. At length, and very slowly indeed, he had begun to have a revelation, not of her, but of himself. He guessed that he must be profoundly in love with her, and that his original assumption was much more than accurate. He was a bull's-eye. His love developed into a passion, not one of your eruptive, scalding affairs, but something as placid as an English landscape, with white heat far, far below the surface. He felt how fine and amusing it was to have a genuine, incurable, illogical passion for a woman, a passion that was almost an instinct. He deliberately cultivated and dwelt on it, and enjoyed it. He liked reflecting upon it. He esteemed that it must be about the most satisfying experience in the entire realm of sentiment, and that no other earthly experience of any sort could approach it. He made this discovery for himself, with the same sensations as if he had discovered a new star, or the circulation of the blood. Of course he knew that two-thirds of the imaginative literature of the world was based on, and illustrative of, this great human discovery, and therefore he was not exactly a pioneer. No matter, he was a pioneer all the same. "'Do you remember a fellow named Angmering?' he began, on a note of the closest confiding intimacy, a note which always flattered and delighted his wife. "'Yes. What was he like? Wasn't he the man that started to run away with Ronnie Philp's wife, and thought better of it, and got her out of the train at Crewe, and put her into the London train that was standing at the other platform, and left her without a ticket? Was it Crewe or Rugby? I forget which. No, no, you're all mixed up. That wasn't angering. Well, you have such funny friends, darling. Tell me, then. Angmering never ran away with anybody except himself. He went to America, and before he left I lent him a hundred pounds. Arthur, I swear you never told me that at the time. In fact, you always said positively you wouldn't lend money to anybody. You promised me. I hope he paid you back. He hasn't, and I've just heard he's dead. I felt that was coming. Yes, I knew from the moment you began to talk that it was something of that kind, and just when he could do with that hundred pounds, heaven knows, oh, Arthur. He's dead, said Mr. Prohack clinchingly, but he's left me ten thousand a year. Ha, 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 ha. He put his hand on her soft shoulder, and gave a triumphant wink. 3. "'Dollars, naturally,' said Mrs. Prohack, after listening to various romantic details. "'No, pounds.' "'And do you believe it? Are you sure this man Bishop isn't up to some game? You know anybody can get the better of you, sweetest.' "'Yes,' said Mr. Prohack. "'I know I'm the greatest and sweetest imbecile that the Almighty ever created. But I believe it.' But why should he leave you all this money? It doesn't stand to reason. It doesn't. But, you see, the poor fellow had to leave it to someone. And he'd no time to think. I expect he just did the first thing that came into his head, and was glad to get it over. I dare say he rather enjoyed doing it, even if he was in great pain, which I don't think he was. And who do you say the woman is that's got as much as you have? I don't say, because I don't know. "'I guarantee she hadn't lent him a hundred pounds,' said Mrs. Prohack, with finality. "'And you can talk as long as you like about real property in Cincinnati. "'What is a real property? Isn't all property real? "'I shall begin to believe in the fortune the day you give me a pearl necklace worth a thousand pounds, and not before.' "'Lady,' replied Mrs. Prohack, "'then I will never give you a pearl necklace.' Mrs. Prohack laughed. "'I know that,' she said. After a long meditative pause, which her husband did not interrupt, she murmured, "'So I suppose we shall be what you call rich?' "'Some people will undoubtedly call us rich. Others won't.' "'You know, we shan't be any happier,' she warned him. "'No,' Mr. Prohack agreed. "'It's a great trial besides being a great bore. But we must stick with it. "'I shan't be any different, so you mustn't expect it.' I never have expected it. I wonder what the children will say. Now, Arthur, don't go and tell them at dinner while the maid's there. I think I'll fetch them up now. You'll do nothing of the kind. 
said Mr. Prohack sharply. "'Why not?' "'Because I can't stand the strain of telling them to-night. <laughs> "'Ha-ha-ha!' he laughed. "'I intend to think things over and tell them to-morrow. "'I've had quite enough strain for one day.' "'Strain, darling?' "'Strain! "'These extremes of heat and cold would try a stronger man than me.' "'Extremes of heat and cold, darling?' "'Or oh, just think how cold it was this morning, and how warm it is to-night.' "'You quaint boy!' she murmured, admiring him. "'I quite understand. Quite. How sensitive you are. But then you always were. Now listen here. Shall I tell the children?' She gave him a long kiss. "'No,' said he, making prods at her cheek with his finger and smiling vaguely. "'No, you'll do nothing of the kind. But there's something you can do for me.' Yes. Will you do it? Yes. Whatever it is. If you aren't going to play a trick on me. No, it's no trick. Very well, then. First, you must have one of your best headaches. Second, you must go to bed at once. Third, you must sprinkle some eau de cologne on the bed to deceive the lower orders. Fourth, you must be content with some soup for your dinner, and I'll smuggle you up some dessert in my pocket if you're hungry. Fifth, you must send word to those children of yours that you don't wish to be disturbed. But you want to treat me like a baby. And supposing I do, for once, can't you be a baby to oblige me? But it's too ridiculous. Why do you want me to go to bed? You know why. Still, I'll tell you. You always like to be told what you know. For instance, that I'm in love with you. I can't tell those kids tonight, and I'm not going to. The rumpus, the conflict of ideas, the atmospheric disturbance when they do get to know will be terrific, and I simply won't have it to-night. I must have a quiet evening to think in, or else I shan't sleep. On the other hand, do you suppose I could sit through dinner opposite you, and you knowing all about it, and me knowing all about it, and both of us pretending that there was nothing unusual in the air? It's impossible. Either you'd give the show away, or I should, or I should burst out laughing. "'No, I can manage the situation alone, but I can't imagine it if you're there. "'Hence, lady, you will keep your kind promise and hop into bed.' "'Without another word, but smiling in a most enigmatic manner, "'Mrs. Prohack passed into the bedroom. "'The tyrant lit a cigarette and stretched himself all over the sofa. "'He thought, "'She's a great woman. She understands. "'Or at any rate she acts as if she did. "'Now how many women in similar circumstances would have—' etc., etc. He listened to her movements. He had not told her everything, for example, the profiteering origin of the fortune, and he wondered whether he had behaved quite nicely in not doing so. "'Arthur!' she called from the bedroom. "'Hello?' "'I do think this is really too silly.' "'You're not paid to think, my girl.' A pause. "'Arthur!' she called from the bedroom. "'Hello?' "'You're sure you won't blurt it out to them when I'm not there?' Annie replied, "'I'm sorry you've got such a frightful headache, Marion. "'You wouldn't have these headaches if you took my advice.' A pause. "'I'm in bed.' "'All right, stay there.' When he finished his cigarette, he went into the bedroom. Yes, she was, veritably, in bed. "'You're a pig, Arthur. I wonder how many wives—' He put his hand over her mouth. "'Stop,' he said. "'I'm not like you. "'I don't need to be told what I know already.' "'But really—' "'She dropped her head on one side and began to laugh, "'and continued to laugh rather hysterically "'until she could not laugh any more. "'Oh, dear, we are the queerest pair!' "'It is possible,' said he. "'You've forgotten the eau de cologne.' "'He handed her the bottle. "'It is quite possible that we are the queerest pair, "'but this is a very serious day in the history of the Prohack family.' The Prohack family has been starving, and someone's given it an enormous beefsteak. Now it's highly dangerous to give a beefsteak to a starving person. The consequences might be fatal. That's why it's so serious. That's why I must have time to think. The sound of Sissy playing a waltz on the piano came up from the drawing-room. Mr. Prohack started to dance all by himself in the middle of the bedroom floor. End of chapter 4《Chapter 5 of Mr. Prohack by Arnold Bennett. 
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Mr. Prohack, Chapter 5 Charlie 1. When Mr. Prohack, in his mature but still rich velvet jacket, came down to dinner, he found his son Charlie leaning against the mantelpiece in a new dark brown suit and studying the owner driver. Charlie seemed never to read anything but motor car and light car and side car and motor bicycle periodical literature, but he read it conscientiously, indefatigably, and completely, advertisements and all. He read it as though it were an endless novel of passion, and he an idle woman deprived of the society her heart longed for. He possessed a motor bicycle which he stabled in a mews behind the square. He possessed several such machines. He bought, altered, and sold them, apparently always with profit to himself. He had no interest in non-mechanical literature, or in any of the arts. "'Your mother's gone to bed with a headache,' said Mr. Prahack, with a fair imitation of melancholy. "'Oh,' said the young man apathetically. His face had a wearied, disillusioned expression. "'Is this the latest?' asked his father, indicating the new brown suit. "'My respectful congratulations. Very smart, especially at the waist.' For a youth who had nothing in the world but what remained of his wound gratuity, and other trifling military emoluments, and what he made out of commerce in motor-bicycles, Charlie spent a lot in clothes. His mother had advised his father to speak to him about it, but his father had declined to offer any criticism, on the ground that Charlie had fought in Mesopotamia, Italy, and France. Moreover, Charlie had scotched any possible criticism by asserting that good clothes were all that stood between him and the ruin of his career. "'If I dressed like the dad,' he had once grimly and gloomily remarked, "'it would be the beginning of the end for me.' "'Smart!' he now exclaimed, stepping forward. "'Look at that!' He advanced his right leg a little. "'Look at that crease! See where it falls?' The trouser-crease, which, as all wise men know, ought to have fallen exactly on the centre of the boot-lacing, fell about an inch to the left thereof. "'And I've tried this suit on four times!' All the bally tailors in London seem to think you've got nothing else to do but call and try on and try on and try on. Never seems to occur to them they don't know their business. It's as bad as staff work. However, if this fellow thinks I'm going to stick these trousers, he'll have the surprise of his life tomorrow morning. The youth spoke in a tone of earnest disgust. My boy, said Mr. Prohack, you have my most serious sympathy. Your life must be terribly complicated by this search for perfection. "'Yes, that's all very well,' said Charlie. "'Where's Sissy? Hanged if I know. "'I heard her playing the piano not five minutes since. "'So did I.' Machin, the house parlour-maid, then intervened. Uh, "'Miss Sissy had a telephone call, and she's gone out, sir.' "'Where to?' "'She didn't say, sir. She only said she wouldn't be in for dinner, sir. "'I made sure she'd told you herself, sir.' The two men, by means of their eyes, transmitted to each other a unanimous judgment upon the whole female sex, and sat down to dine alone in the stricken house. The dinner was extremely frugal, this being the opening day of Mrs. Prehack's new era of intensive economy, but the obvious pleasure of Machin in serving only men brightened up somewhat its brief course. Charlie was taciturn and curt, though not impolite. Mr. Prohack, whose private high spirits not even the amazing and inexcusable absence of his daughter could impair, pretended to a decent woe, and chatted as he might have done to a fellow clubman on a wet Sunday night at the club. At the end of the meal Charlie produced the enormous widow's cruise which he called his cigarette case, and offered his father a cigarette. "'Doing anything to-night?' asked Mr. Prohack, puffing. "'No,' answered desperately Charlie, puffing. "'Ring the bell, will you?' While Charlie went to the mantelpiece, Mr. Prohack secreted an apple for his starving wife. "'A uh, Machin,' said he to the incoming house parlour-maid, "'see if you can find some port.' Charlie raised his fatigued eyebrows. "'Yes, sir,' said the house parlour-maid vivaciously, and whisked away her skirts, which seemed to remark, "'You're quite right to have port. I feel very sorry for you two attractive gentlemen taking a poor dinner all alone.' Charlie drank his port in silence and Mr. Prohack watched him. 2. 
Mr. Brohack's son was, in some respects, a great mystery to him. He could not understand, for instance, how his own offspring could be so unresponsive to the attractions of the things of the mind, and so interested in mere machinery and the methods of moving a living or a lifeless object from one spot on the earth's surface to another. Mr. Brohack admitted the necessity of machinery, but an automobile had for him the same status as a child's scooter, and no higher. It was an ingenious device for locomotion, and there for him the matter ended. On the other hand, Mr. Brohack sympathised with and comprehended his son's general attitude towards life. Charlie had gone to war from Cambridge at the age of nineteen. He went a boy and returned a grave man. He went thoughtless and light-hearted and returned full of magnificent and austere ideals. Six months of England had destroyed these ideals in him. He had expected to help in the common task of making heaven in about a fortnight. In the war he had learnt much about the possibilities of human nature, but scarcely anything about its limitations. His father tried to warn him, but of course failed. Charlie grew resentful, then cynical. He saw in England nothing but futility, injustice, and ingratitude. He refused to resume Cambridge, and was bitterly sarcastic about the generosity of a nation which, through its war office, was ready to pay to studious warriors anxious to make up university terms lost in a holy war, decidedly less than it paid to its street-sweepers. Having escaped from death, the aforesaid warriors were granted the right to starve their bodies while improving their minds. He might have had sure situations in vast corporations. He declined them. He spat on them. He called them graves. What he wanted was an opportunity to fulfil himself. He could not get it, and his father could not get it from him. While searching for it, he frequently met warriors covered with ribbons, but lacking food and shelter, not only for themselves, but for their women and children. All this, human nature being what it was, was inevitable, but his father could not convincingly tell him so. All that Mr. Prohack could effectively do, Mr. Prohack did, namely, provide the saviour of Britain with food and to shelter. Charlie was restlessly and dangerously waiting for his opportunity. But he had not developed into a revolutionist, nor a communist, nor anything of the sort. Oh no, quite the reverse. He meditated a different revenge on society. Mr. Prohack knew nothing of this meditated revenge, did not suspect it. If he had suspected it, he might have felt less compassion than, on this masculine evening with the unusual port, he did, in fact, feel. For he was very sorry for Charlie. He longed to tell him about the fortune, and to exult with him in the fortune, and to pour, as it were, the fortune into his lap. He did not care a fig now about advisable precautions. He did not feel the slightest constraint at the prospect of imparting the tremendous and gorgeous news to his son. He had no desire to reflect upon the proper method of telling. He merely and acutely wanted to tell so that he might see the relief and the joyous anticipation on his son's enigmatic and melancholy face. But he could not tell it, because it had been tacitly agreed with his wife that he should not tell in her absence. True, he had given no verbal promise, but he had given something just as binding. "'Nothing exciting today, I suppose,' he said, when the silence had begun to distress him in his secret plea. "'No,' Charlie replied. I got particulars of an affair at Glasgow, but it needs money. What sort of an affair? Oh, uh, rather difficult to explain. Buying and selling, usual thing. What money is needed? I should say three hundred or thereabouts. Might as well be three thousand, so far as I'm concerned. Where did you hear of it? Club. Charlie belonged to a little club in Savile Place, where young warriors told each other what they thought of the nature of society. Mr. Prohack drew in his breath with an involuntary gasp, and then said, "'I expect I could let you have three hundred. "'You couldn't.' "'I expect I could.' Mr. Prohack had never felt so akin to a god. It seemed to him that he was engaged in the act of creating a future, yea, a man. Charlie's face changed. He had been dead. He was now suddenly alive. "'When?' 
Well, any time. Now? Why not? Charlie looked at his watch. Well, I'm much obliged, he said. 3. Mr. Prohacker brought a new cheque-book from the bank. It lay in his hip pocket. He had no alternative but to write out a cheque. Three hundred pounds would nearly exhaust his balance, but that did not matter. He gave Charlie the cheque. Charlie offered no further information concerning the affair for which the money was required, and Mr. Prohack did not choose to inquire. Perhaps he was too proud to inquire. The money would probably be lost, and if it were lost, no harm would be done. Good, rather, for Charlie would have gained experience. The lad was only a child, after all. The lad ran upstairs, and Mr. Prohack sat solitary in delightful meditation. After a few minutes the lad reappeared in hat and coat. Mr. Prohack thought that he heard a bag dumped in the hall. Uh, "'Where are you off to?' he asked. "'Glasgow. I shall catch the night train.' He rang the bell. Uh, "'Machin, run out and get me a taxi, Sharp?' "'Yes, sir.' Machin flew. This was the same girl of whom Mrs. Prohack had dared to demand nothing. Mr. Prohack himself would have hesitated to send her for a taxi. But Charlie ordered her about like a slave, and she seemed to like it. "'Rather sudden, this, isn't it?' said Mr. Prohack, extremely startled by the turn of events. "'Well, you've got to be sudden in this world, Governor,' Charlie replied, and lit a fresh cigarette. Mr. Prohack was again too proud to put questions. Still, he did venture upon one question. "'Have you got loose money for your fare?' The lad laughed. "'Oh, don't let that worry you, Governor.' He looked at his watch once more. "'I wonder whether that infernal girl is manufacturing that taxi or only fetching it.' "'What must I say to your mother?' demanded Mr. Prohack. "'Give her my respectful regards.' The taxi was heard. Machin dashed into the house and dashed out again with the bag. The lad clasped his father's hand with a warm vigour that pleased and reassured Mr. Prowhack in his natural bewilderment. It was not consistent with the paternal dignity to leave the dining-room and stand valedictory on the front doorstep. "'Well, I'm dashed,' Mr. Prowhack murmured to himself as the taxi drove away. And he had every right to be dashed. End of chapter 5《Chapter Six of Mr. Prohack by Arnold Bennett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Chapter Six. Sissy. One. Had any dinner? Mr. Prohack asked his daughter. No. Aren't you hungry? No, thanks. Sissy seized the last remaining apple from the dessert dish and bit into it with her beautiful and efficient teeth. She was slim and rather taller than necessary, or than she desired to be. A pretty girl, dressed in a short-skirted, short-sleeved, dark-blue, pink-heightened frock, that seemed to combine usefulness with a decent, perverse frivolity, and to carry forward the expression of her face. She had bright brown hair. She was perfectly mistress of the apple. "'Where's Mother?' "'In bed with a headache. "'Did she have dinner with you?' She did not, and she doesn't want to be disturbed. Oh, I shan't disturb a poor thing. I told her this afternoon she would have one of her headaches. Well, said Mr. Prohack, that's one of the most remarkable instances of sound prophecy that I ever came across. Father, what's amusing you? Nothing. Yes, something is. You've got your funny smile, and you were smiling all to yourself when I came in. I was thinking— my right to think is almost the only right I possess that hasn't yet been challenged in this house. Where's Charles? Gone to Glasgow. Gone to Glasgow? Yes. What, just now? Ten minutes ago. Whatever has he gone to Glasgow for? I don't know, any more than I know why you went out before dinner and came back after dinner. Would you like to know why I went out? Sissy spoke with sudden ingratiatingness. "'No, not at all. But I should like to know why you went out without telling anybody. 
when people are expected to dinner and fail to appear, they usually give notice of the failure. But, Father, I told Machin. I said, anybody. Don't you know that the whole theory of the society which you adorn is based on the assumption that Machin is nobody? I was called away in a frightful hurry, and you and Mother were gossiping upstairs, and it's as much as one's life's worth to disturb you two when you are together. Oh, that's news. Besides, I should have had to argue with Mother, and you know what she is. You flatter me. I don't even know what you are, and you're elementary compared to your mother. Anyhow, I'm glad Mother's in bed with a headache. I came in here trembling just now. Mother would have made such a tremendous fuss, although she's perfectly aware that it's not the slightest use making a fuss, and it makes me stupid and obstinate. Showers and showers of questions that have been, whereas you have to ask a single one. Yes, you're rather upset by my lack of curiosity. But let me just point out that it is not consistent with my paternal duty to sit here and listen to you slanging your mother. As a daughter you have vast privileges, but you mustn't presume on them. There are some things I couldn't stand from any woman without protest. But you must admit the mother is a bit awful when she breaks loose. No, I've never known your mother awful, or even a bit awful. You aren't being intellectually honest, Dad. I am. Ah, well, of course, she only shows her best side to you. She has no other side. In that sense, she is certainly one-sided. Here, have another. Mr. Prohack took the apple from his pocket and threw it across the table to Sissy, who caught it. 2. Mr. Prohack was extremely happy, and Sissy, too, in so far as concerned the chat with her father, was extremely happy. They adored each other, and they adored the awful woman laid low with a headache. Sissy's hat and cloak, which she had dropped carelessly on a chair, slipped to the floor, the hat carried away by the coat. Mr. Prohack rose and picked them up, took them out of the room, and returned. "'So now you've straightened up, and you're pleased with yourself,' observed Sissy. "'So now,' said he, "'perhaps I may turn on my curiosity tap.' "'Don't,' said Sissy. "'I'm very gloomy. I'm very disappointed. I might burst into tears at any moment.' "'Yes, I'm not joking.' "'Out with it.' "'Oh, it's nothing. It's only that I saw a chance of making some money, and it hasn't come off. But what do you want to make money for?' "'I like that. Hasn't Mother been telling me off and on all day that something will have to be done?' "'Done about what?' "'About economy, naturally,' Sissy spoke rather sharply. "'But you don't you mean your mother has spent the day in urging you to go forth and earn money?' "'Of course she hasn't, father. How absurd you are. You know very well mother would hate the idea of be earning money. Hate it. But I mean to earn some. Surely it's much better to bring more money in than to pinch and scrape. I loathe pinching and scraping.' "'It's a sound loathing.' "'And I thought I'd got hold of a scheme. But it's too big. I have fifty pounds odd of my own. But what use is fifty pounds when a hundred's needed? It's all off, and I'm in the last stage of depression.' She threw away the core of the second apple. "'Is that port? I'll have some.' "'So that you're short of fifty pounds,' said Mr. Prohag, obediently pouring out the port, but only half a glass. "'Well, I might be able to let you have fifty pounds myself, if you would deign to accept it.' Sissy cried compassionately. "'But you haven't got a cent, Dad!' "'No, oh, haven't I? Did your mother tell you that?' "'Well, she didn't exactly say so.' I should hope not. And allow me to inform you, my girl, that in accusing me of not having a cent, you are being guilty of the worst possible taste. Children should always assume that their fathers have mysterious stores of money, that nothing is beyond their resources, and if they don't rise to every demand, it's only because in their inscrutable wisdom they deem it better not to. Or it may be from mere cussedness. Yes, said Sitty, that's what I used to think when I was young. "'But I've looked up your salary in Whittaker's Almanac.' "'It was very improper of you. "'However, nothing is secret in these days, "'and so I don't mind telling you that I've backed a winner today, "'Not today, but some little time since. "'And I can, if necessary and agreeable, "'let you have fifty pounds.' 
Mr. Brohack, as it were, shook his crest in plenary contentment. He had the same sensation of creativeness as he had a while earlier with his son, a godlike sensation. And he was delighted with his girl. She was so young and so old, and her efforts to play the woman of the world with him was so comic and so touching. Only two or three years since she had been driving a motor van in order to defeat the Germans. She had received twenty-eight shillings a week for six days, or from twelve to fourteen hours. She would leave the house at eight and come back at eight, nine, or ten. And on her return, pale enough, she would laugh and say she had had her dinner and would go to bed. But she had not had her dinner. She was simply too tired and nervously exasperated to eat. And she would lie in bed and tremble and cry quietly from fatigue. She did not know that her parents knew these details. The cook, her confidante, had told them much later. And Mr. Prohack had agreed that Sissy must never know that they knew. She had stuck to the task during a whole winter, skidding on glassy asphalt, slimy wood and slithery stone sets in the East End, and had met with but one accident, a minor affair. The experience seemed to have had no permanent effect on her, but it had had a permanent effect on her father's attitude towards her. Her mother had always strongly objected to what she called the episode, had shown any relief when it concluded, and had awarded no merit for it. "'Can you definitely promise me fifty pounds, Dad?' Sissy asked quietly. Mr. Prohack made no articulate answer. His reply was to take out his cheque-book and his fountain pen and fill in a cheque to Miss Sissy Prohack, or Order. He saw no just reason for differentiating between the sexes in his offspring. He had given a cheque to Charlie. He gave one to Sissy. "'Then you aren't absolutely stone-break,' said Sissy, smiling. "'I should not so describe myself.' "'Just like Mother,' she murmured, the smile fading. Mr. Prohack raised a sternly deprecating hand. "'Enough!' "'But don't you want to know what I want the money for?' Sissy demanded. "'No. <laughs> then I shall tell you. The fact is, I must tell you. 3. "'I've decided to teach dancing,' said Sissy, beginning again nervously, as her father kept a notable silence. "'I thought you weren't so very keen on dancing.' "'I'm not, but perhaps that's because I don't care much for the new fashion of dancing a whole evening with the same man.' Still, the point is that I'm a very fine dancer. Even Charlie will tell you that. But I thought that all the principal streets in London were full of dancing academies at the present time, chiefly for the instruction of aged gentlemen. I don't know anything about that, Sissy replied seriously. What I do know is that now I can find a hundred pounds, I have a ripping chance of taking over a studio, at least part of one, and it's got quite a big connection already. In fact, pupils are being turned away. "'And this is all you can think of?' protested Mr. Prohack with melancholy. "'We are living on the edge of a volcano, the, the country as I mean, "'and your share in the country's work is to teach the citizens to dance.' "'Well,' said Sissy, "'they'll dance anyhow, and so they may as well learn to dance properly. "'And what else can I do? "'Have you had me taught to do anything else? "'You and Mother have brought me up to be perfectly useless "'except as the wife of a rich man. "'That's what you've done, and you can't deny it.' "'Once,' said Mr. Prohack, "'you very nobly drove a van.' "'Yes, I did, but no thanks to you and Mother. "'Why, I'd even to learn to drive in secret, lest you should stop me. "'And I can tell you one thing. "'If I was to start driving a van now, "'I should probably get mobbed in the streets. "'All the men have a horrid grudge against us girls "'who did their work in the war. "'If we want to get a job in these days, "'we jolly well have to conceal the fact that we in the WAAC "'or in anything at all during the war.' They won't look at us if they find out that. Our reward. However, I don't want to drive a van. I want to teach dancing. It's not so dirty, and it pays better. And if people feel like dancing, why shouldn't they dance? Come on, Dad, be reasonable. That's asking a lot from any human being, and especially from a parent. Well, have you gotten any argument against what I say? I prefer not to argue. That's because you can't. "'It is, it is. But what is this wonderful chance you've got?' "'It's that studio where Charlie and I went last night, at Putney.' "'At Putney?' "'Well, why not Putney? They have a gala night every other week, you know.' 
It belongs to Viola Rydal. Right, Viola's going to get married and live in Edinburgh, and she's selling it. And Eliza asked me if I'd join her in taking it over. Eliza telephoned me about it tonight, and so I rushed across the park to see her. But Viola's asking a hundred pounds premium and a hundred for the fittings. Very cheap it is, too. In fact, Viola's a fool, I think. But then she's fond of Eliza. Now, Eliza, is that Eliza Brating, or am I getting mixed up? Yes, it's Eliza Brating. Ah. You needn't be so stuffy, Dad, because her father's only a second division clerk at the Treasury. Oh, I'm not. It was only this morning that I was saying to Mr. Hunter that we must always remember that second division clerks are also God's creatures. Father, you're disgusting. Don't say that, my child. At my age one needs encouragement, not abuse. And I'm glad to be able to tell you that there is no longer any necessity either for you to earn money or to pinch and scrape. Satisfactory arrangements have been made. Really? Well, that's splendid. But of course it won't make any difference to me. There may be no necessity so far as you're concerned, but there's my inward necessity. I've got to be independent. It wouldn't make any difference if you had an income of ten thousand a year. Mr. Prohack blenched guiltily. Um, uh, uh, what was I going to say? Oh, yes, where's this Eliza of yours got her a hundred pounds from? I don't know. It's no business of mine. But do you insist? Shall you insist on introductions from your pupils? Father, how you do chop about? No, naturally we shan't insist on introductions. Then any man can come for lessons? Certainly provided he wears evening dress on gala nights, and pays the fees, and behaves properly. Fiona says some of them prefer afternoon lessons, because they haven't got any evening dress. "'If I were you, I shouldn't rush at it,' said Mr. Prohack. "'But we must rush at it, or lose it. And I've no intention of losing it. Fiona has to make her arrangements at once.' "'I wonder what your mother will say when you ask her.' "'I shan't ask her. I shall tell her. Nobody can decide this thing for me.' I have to decide it for myself, and I've decided it. As for what Mother says, Sissy frowned and then smiled, that's your affair. My affair? Miss Brehack exclaimed in real alarm. What on earth do you mean? Well, you and she are so thick together, you've got to live with her. I haven't got to live with her. I ask you, what on earth do you mean? But surely you've understood, Father, that I shall have to live at the studio. Somebody has to be on the spot and there are two bedrooms. But of course you'll be able to put all that right with Mother, Dad. You'll do it for your own sake, but a bit of mine, too. She giggled nervously, ran round the table, and kissed her parent. I'm frightfully obliged for the fifty pounds, she said. You and the mater will be fearfully happy together soon, if Charlie doesn't come back. Ta-ta, I must be off now. Where? To Eliza's, of course. We shall probably go straight down to Putney together and see Viola and fix everything up. I know Viola's had at least one other good offer. I may sleep at the studio, if not at Eliza's. Anyhow, it would be too late for me to come back here. I absolutely forbid you to go off like this. Yes, do, father. You forbid for all your worth, if it gives you any pleasure. But it won't be much use unless you can carry me upstairs and lock me in my room. Oh, father, you are a great pretender. You know perfectly well you're delighted with me. Indeed I'm not. I suppose you'll have the decency to see your mother before you go. What, and wake her? You said she wasn't to be disturbed on any account. I deny that I said on any account. I shouldn't dream of disturbing her. And you'll tell her so much better than I could. You can do what you like with her. 4. Where's my dessert? demanded Mrs. Prohack, anxiously and resentfully, when her husband at length reached the bedroom. I'm dying of hunger, and I've got a real headache now. Oh, Arthur, how absurd all this is! At least it would be if I wasn't so hungry. Uh, a sissy at all the dessert, Mr. Brehack answered timidly. He no longer felt triumphant, careless, and free. Indeed, for some minutes he had practically forgotten that he had inherited ten thousand a year. The child ate it every bit, so I couldn't bring any. Shall I ring for something else? And why, Mrs. Prohack continued, why have you been so long? And what's all this business of taxis running up to the door all the evening? Marian, said Mr. Prohack, ignoring her gross exaggeration of the truth as to the taxis, I'd better tell you at once. 
Charlie's gone to Glasgow on his own business, and Sissy's just run down to Viola Rydal's studio about a new scheme of some kind that she's thinking of. For the moment we're alone in the world. It's always the same, she remarked with indignation, when with forced facetiousness he'd given her an extremely imperfect and bowdlerized account of his evening. It's always the same. As soon as I'm laid up in bed, everything goes wrong. My poor boy, I cannot imagine what you've been doing. I suppose I'm very silly, but I can't understand it. Nor could Mr. Prowacker himself, now that he was in the sane, conjugal atmosphere of the bedroom. End of chapter 6《セブン・ミスター・プロハック》by Arnold Bennett。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers。Chapter Seven。The Sympathetic Quack。One。The next morning, Mr. Prohack had a unique shock, for he was awakened by his wife coming into the bedroom. She held a big piece of cake in her hand. Never before had Mrs. Prohack been known to rise earlier than her husband. Also, the hour was eight twenty, whereas never before had Mr. Prohack been known on a working day to rise later than eight o'clock. He realized with horror that it would be necessary for him to hurry. Still, he did not jump up. He was not a brilliant sleeper, and he had had a bad night, which had only begun to be good at the time when, as a rule, he woke finally for the day. He did not feel very well, despite the fine sensation of riches which rushed reassuringly into his arms the moment consciousness returned. Arthur said, "Mrs. Prohack, who was in her Chinese robe, do you know that girl hasn't been home all night? Her bed hasn't been slept in." Neither has mine," answered Mr. Prohack. "What girl? Sissy, of course." "Ah, Sissy," murmured Mr. Prohack, as if he had temporarily forgotten that such a girl existed. Didn't I tell you last night she mightn't be back? No, you didn't, and you know very well you didn't. Honestly," said Mr. Prohack, meaning dishonestly, as most people do in similar circumstances. I thought I did. Do you suppose I should have slept one wink if I'd thought Sissy wasn't coming home? Yes, I do. The death of Nelson wouldn't keep you awake. And now either I shall be late at the office, or else I shall go without my breakfast. I think you might have wakened me. Mrs. Prohack, munching the cake despite all her anxieties, replied in a peculiar tone, "What does it matter if you are late at the office?" Mr. Prohack reflected that all women were alike in a lack of conscience where the public welfare was concerned. He was rich, therefore he was entitled to neglect his duty to the nation. A pleasing argument. Mr. Prohack sat up, and Mrs. Prohack had a full view of his face for the first time that morning. Arthur. She exclaimed, absolutely and in an instant forgetting both cake and daughter, "You're ill." He thought how agreeable it was to have a wife who was so marvellously absorbed in his being. There was something uncanny, something terrible in it. "Oh no, I'm not," he said. "I swear I'm not. I'm very tired, but I'm not ill. Get out of my way." "But your face is as yellow as a cheese," protested Eve, frightened. "It may be," said Mr. Prohack. "You won't get up." I shall get up. Eve snatched her hand mirror from the dressing table and gave it to him with a menacing gesture. He admitted to himself that the appearance of his face was perhaps rather alarming at first sight, but really he did not feel ill. He only felt tired. Oh, it's nothing. Liver. He made a move to emerge from the bed. Exercise is all I want. He saw Eve's lips tremble. He saw tears hanging in her eyes. These phenomena induced in him the sensation of having somehow committed a solecism or a murder. He withdrew the move to emerge. She was hurt and desperate. He at once knew himself defeated. He thought how annoying it was to have a woman in the house who was so marvellously absorbed in his being. She was wrong, but her unreasoning desperation triumphed over his calm sagacity. Telephone for Doctor Vega," said Mrs. Prohack to Machin. For whom she had rung, V E I G A, Bruton Street. He's in the book, and I'll soon to come along as soon as he can to see Mr. Prohack. Now Mr. Prohack had heard of, but never seen Doctor Vega. 
He had more than once listened to the Portuguese name on Eve's lips, and the man had been mentioned more than once at the club. Mr. Brohack knew that he was, if not a foreigner, of foreign descent, and hence he did not like him. Mr. Brohack took kindly to foreign singers and cooks, but not to foreign doctors. Moreover, he had doubts about the fellow's professional qualifications. Therefore, he strongly resented his wife's most singular and startling order to Machin, and as soon as Machin had gone, he expressed himself. Anyway, he said curtly, after several exchanges, I shall see my own doctor, if I see any doctor at all, which is doubtful. Eve's response was to kiss her husband, a sisterly rather than a wifely kiss. And she said, in a sweet, noble voice, It's I that want Dr. Vega's opinion about you, and I must insist on having it. And what's more, you know I've never cared for your friend Dr. Plot. He never seems to be interested. He scarcely listens to what you have to say. He scarcely examines you. He just makes you think your health is of no importance at all, and it doesn't really matter whether you're ill or well, and that you may get better or you mayn't, and that he'll humour you by sending you a bottle of something. Stuff, said Mr. Prohack. He's a first-rate fellow. No infernal nonsense about him. And what do you know about Vega? I should like to be informed. I met him at Mrs. Cundiff's. He cured her of cancer. You told me Mrs. Cundiff hadn't got cancer at all. Well, it was Dr. Vega who found out she hadn't, and stopped the operation just in time. She says he saved her life, and she's quite right. He's wonderful. Mrs. Prohack was now sitting on the bed. She gazed at her husband's features with acute apprehension, and yet with persuasive grace. Oh, Arthur, she murmured, you are a worry to me. Mr. Prohack, not being an ordinary Englishman, knew himself beaten, for the second time that morning. He dared not trifle with his wife in her earnest, lofty mood. "'I bet you Vega won't come,' said Mr. Prohack. "'He will come,' said Mrs. Prohack blandly. "'How do you know?' "'Because he told me he'd come at once if ever I asked him. He's a perfect dear.' "'Oh, I know the sort,' Mr. Prohack said sarcastically. "'And you'll see the fee he'll charge.' "'When it's a question of health, money doesn't matter.' "'It doesn't matter when you've got the money. You'd never have dreamed of having Vega this time yesterday. You wouldn't need to have sent for old Plot.' Mrs. Prohack merely kissed her husband again, with a kind of ineffable resignation. Then Machin came in with her breakfast, and said that Dr. Vega would be round shortly, and was told to telephone to the Treasury that her master was ill in bed. "'And what about my breakfast?' the victim inquired with irony. "'Give me some of your egg.' "'No, dearest, egg is the very last thing you should have with that colour. "'Well, if you'd like to know, I don't want any breakfast, couldn't eat any.' "'There you are,' Mrs. Prohack exclaimed triumphantly. "'And yet you swear you aren't ill. "'That just shows it would be quite the best thing for you not to take anything until Dr. Vega's been.' Mr. Prohack, helpless, examined the ceiling, and decided to go to the office in the afternoon. He tried to be unhappy, but couldn't. Eve was too funny, too delicious, too exquisitely and ingenuously firm, too blissful in having him at her mercy for him to be unhappy. To say nothing of the hundred thousand pounds. And he knew that Eve also was secretly revelling in the hundred thousand pounds. Dr. Vega was her first bite at it. 2. Considering that he was well on the way to being a fashionable physician, Dr. Vega arrived with a surprising promptitude. Miss Brohack wondered what hold Eve had upon him, and how she had acquired it. He was prejudiced against the fellow, before he came into the bedroom, simply because Eve, on hearing the noise of a car and a doorbell, had hurried downstairs, and a considerable interval had elapsed between the doctor's entrance into the house and his appearance at the bedside. Mr. Brohack guessed easily that those two had been plotting against him. Strange how Eve could be passionately loyal and basically deceitful simultaneously. The two-faced creature led the doctor forward with a candid smile that partook equally of the smile of a guardian angel and the smile of a cherub. She was an unparalleled comedian. Dr. Vega was fattish and rather shabby, about sixty years of age. He spoke perfectly correct English with a marked foreign accent. His demeanour was bland, slightly familiar, philosophical and sympathetic. 
Dr. Plock's eyes would have said, This is my thirteenth visit this morning, and I've eighteen more to do, and it's all very tedious. Why do you people let yourselves get ill, if it's a fact that you really are ill? I don't think you are, but I'll see. Dr. Vega's eyes said, How interesting your case is. You've had no luck this time. We must make the best of things, but also we must face the truth. God knows I don't want to boast, but I expect I can put you right with the help of your own strong common sense. Mr. Prohack, a connoisseur in human nature, noted the significances of the Vega glance, but he suspected that there might also be something histrionic in it. Dr. Vega examined heart, pulse, tongue. He tapped the torso. He asked many questions. Then he took an instrument out of a leather case which he carried, and fastened a strap round Mr. Prohack's forearm, and attached it to the instrument, and presently Mr. Prohack could feel the strong pulsations of the blood current in his arm. "'Dear, dear,' said Dr. Vega, "'one hundred and seventy-five. Blood pressure too high. Much too high. Must get that down.' Eve. Eve looked as though the end of the world had been announced, and even Mr. Prohack had qualms. Ten minutes earlier Mr. Prohack had been a strong, healthy man, a trifle unwell in a bedroom. He was suddenly transformed into a patient in a nursing home. "'A little guitar,' said Dr. Vega. "'I've got no guitar,' said Mr. Prohack, with conviction. "'Yes, yes, guitar of the stomach. Probably had it for years. The duodenum is obstructed. A little accident that easily happens.' He addressed himself, as if it were, privately to Mrs. Prohack. "'The judium is no thicker than that,' he indicated the pencil with which he was already writing in a pocket-book. "'We'll get it right.' "'What is the duodenum?' Mr. Prohack wanted to cry out, but he was too ashamed to ask. It was hardly conceivable that he, so wise, so prudent, had allowed over forty years to pass in total ignorance of this important item of his own body. He felt himself to be a bag full of disconcerting and dangerous mysteries or he might have expressed it that he had been smoking in criminal nonchalance for nearly half a century on the top of a powder magazine. He was deeply impressed by the rapidity and assurance of the doctor's diagnosis. It was wonderful that the queer fellow could in a few minutes single out an obscure organ no bigger than a pencil and say, There is the ill. The fellow might be a quack, but sometimes quacks were men of genius. His shame and his alarm quickly vanished under the doctor's reassuring and bland manner. So much so that when Dr. Vega had written out a prescription, Mr. Prohack said lightly, "'I suppose I can get up, though.' To which Dr. Vega amiably replied, "'I shall leave that to you. Perhaps if I tell you you'll be lucky if you don't have jaundice. But I think you will be lucky. I'll try to look in again this afternoon.' These last words staggered both Mr. and Mrs. Prohack. "'I've been expecting this for years. I knew it would come,' Mrs. Prohack breathed tragically. And even Mr. Prohack reflected aghast. "'My God, doctor, calling twice a day!' True, duodenum was a terrible word. Mr. Prohack gazed at Dr. Vega as at a high priest, and waited to be vouchsafed a further message. "'Anyhow, if I find it impossible to call, I'll telephone in any case,' said Dr. Vega some slight solace in this. Mrs. Prohack, like an acolyte, personally attended the high priest as far as the street, listening with acute attention to his recommendations. When she returned, she put on a carefully bright face. Evidently she had decided, or had been told, that cheerfulness was essential to ward off jaundice. "'Now that's what I call a doctor,' said she, "'to think of your friend Plot. I've telephoned for a messenger boy to go to the chemist's. "'You're at liberty to call the man a doctor,' answered Mr. Prohack, "'and I'm at liberty to call him a fine character actor.' "'I knew the moment you sat up it was jaundice,' said Mrs. Prohack. "'Well,' said Mr. Prohack, "'I lay you five to one I don't have jaundice. "'Not that you'd ever pay me if you lost.' Mrs. Prohack said, "'When I saw you were asleep at a, after eight o'clock this morning, "'I knew there must be something serious. "'I felt it. "'However, as the doctor says, if we take it seriously, it will soon cease to be serious. And he's not a bad phrase-maker, said Mr. Prohack. In the late afternoon, Dr. Vega returned, like an old and familiar acquaintance, with his confident air of saying, 
We can manage this affair between us, I am almost sure. Mr. Brohack felt worse, and the room, lighted by one shaded lamp, had begun to look rather like a real sick room. Mr. Brohack, though he mistrusted the foreign accent, the unprofessional appearance, and the adventurous manner, was positively glad to see his new doctor, and indeed felt that he had need of succour. Yes, said Dr. Vega, after investigation. My opinion is that you'll escape jaundice. In four or five days you ought to be as well as you were before the attack. I don't say how well you were before. Mr. Prohack instantly felt better. It will be very awkward if I can't get back to the office early next week, said he. I'm sure it will, Dr. Vega agreed. And it might be still more awkward if you went back to the office early next week and then never went any more. What do you mean? Dr. Vega smiled understandingly at Mrs. Prohack, as though he and she were the only grown-up persons in the room. "'Look here,' he addressed the patient. "'I see I shall have to charge you a fee for telling you what you know as well as I do. The fact is, I get my living by doing that. How old are you?' Forty-six. "'Every year of the war counts double, so you're over fifty. A difficult age. You can run an engine ten hours a day for fifty years.' "'But it's Vaughan, it's second-hand. "'And if you keep on running it ten hours a day, "'you'd soon discover how Vaughan it is. "'But you could run it five hours a day for another twenty years "'with reasonable safety and efficiency. "'That's what I wanted to tell you. "'You aren't the man you were, Mr. Prohack. "'You've lost the trick of getting rid of your waste products. "'You say you feel tired. "'Why do you feel tired? "'Being tired simply means being clogged.' The moment you feel tired, your waste products are beginning to pile up. Look at those finger joints. Waste products. Friction. Why don't you sleep well? You say the more tired you are, the worse you sleep. And you seem surprised. But you're only surprised because you haven't thought it out. Morpheus himself wouldn't sleep if his body were a mass of friction-producing waste products from top to toe. You aren't a body and soul, Mr. Prohack. You're an engine. I wish you'd remember that and treat yourself like one. The moment you feel tired, stops the engine. If you don't, it'll stop itself. It pretty nearly stopped today. You need lubrication, too. The best lubricant is a tumbler of hot water four times a day. And don't take coffee or any salt except what your cook puts into the dishes. Don't try to be cleverer than nature. Don't think the clock is standing still. It isn't. If you treat yourself as well as you treat your watch, you'll bury me. If you don't, I shall bury you. All that I've told you I know by heart, because I'm saying it to men of your age every day of my life. Mr. Brohack felt like a reprimanded schoolboy. He feared the wrath to come. Don't you think my husband ought to take a long holiday? Eve put in. Well, of course he ought, said Dr. Vega opening both mouth and eyes in protest against such a silly question. Uh, six months? Or at least. Where ought he to go? Oh, doesn't matter. Portugal, the Riviera, Switzerland. But it's not the season yet for any of these places. If he wants to keep on pleasant terms with nature, he'll get out his car and motor about his own country for a month or two. After that he might go to the continent. But of course he won't, I know, these official gentlemen. If you ask them to disturb their routine, they'll die first. They really would sooner die. Very natural, of course. Routine is their drug. My husband will take six months' holiday, said Eve quietly. I suppose you could give the proper certificate. You see, in these government departments, I'll give you the certificate tomorrow. Mr. Prohack was pretending to be asleep or at least to be too fatigued and indifferent to take notice of this remarkable conversation. But as soon as Dr. Vega had blandly departed under the escort of Eve, he slipped out of bed and cautiously padded to the landing where there was a bookcase. Duodenum, duodenum, must be something to do with twelve. Then he found a dictionary and brought it back into the bedroom and consulted it. So it's twelve inches long, is it? he murmured. He had just time to plunge into bed and pitch the dictionary under the bed before his wife returned. 3. She was bending over him. 
Darling! He opened his deceiving eyes. Her face was within a foot of his. How do you feel now? I feel, said he, that this is the darndest swindle that ever was. If I hadn't come into a fortune, I should have been back at the office the day after tomorrow. In about eight hours, with the help of that Portuguese mountebank, you've changed me from a sane, normal man into a blooming valetudinarian who must run all over the earth in search of health. I've got to winter somewhere, have I? You'll see. It's absolutely incredible. It's more like masculine and cooks than anything I ever came across. He yawned. He knew that it was the disturbed duodenum that caused him to yawn, and that also gave him a dry mouth and a peculiar taste therein. Yes, darling. Eve smiled above him, the smile of her impenetrable Anglicism. Yes, darling, you're better. The worst was that she'd beaten him on the primary point. He had asserted that he was not ill. She had asserted that he was. She'd been right, he wrong. He could not deny even to himself that he was ill. Not gravely, only somewhat. But supposing that he was gravely ill, supposing that old Plot would agree with all that Vega had said. It was conceivable. Misgivings shot through him. And Eve had him at her sweet mercy. He was helpless. She was easily the stronger. He perceived then what many a husband did without having perceived, that his wife had a genuine individual existence and volition of her own, that she was more than his complement, his companion, the mother of his children. She lowered her head further and gave him a long, fresh, damp kiss. They were very intimate, with an intimacy that her enigmatic quality could not impair. He was annoyed, aggrieved, rebellious, but extremely happy in a weak sort of way. He hated and loved her. He despised and adored her. He reprehended and admired her all at once. What specially satisfied him was that he had her to himself. The always impinging children were not there. He liked this novel solitude of two. Darling, where is Charlie staying in Glasgow? Why? I want to write to him. Post's gone, my poor child. Then I shall telegraph. What about? Never mind. I shan't tell you the address until you promise to show me the telegram. I intend to be master of my own house, even if I am dying. Then he saw the telegram, which ran, Father ill in bed, what is the best motor-car to buy, love mother? The telegram astounded Mr. Prohack. "'Have you taken leave of your senses?' he cried. Then he laughed. What else was there to do? What else but the philosopher's laugh was adequate to the occasion? While Eve, with her own unrivalled hand, was preparing the bedroom for the night, Machin came in with a telegram. Without being asked to do so, Eve showed it to the sufferer. "'Tell him to buck up. Eagle six-cylinder. Everything fine here. Charles.' "'I think he might have sent his love,' said Eve. Mr. Prohack no longer attempted to fight against the situation, which was like a net winding itself round him. End of chapter 7Chapter 8 of Mr. Prohack by Arnold Bennett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Chapter 8 Sissy's Business 1. One evening, ten days later, Mr. Prohack slipped out of his own house as stealthily as a thief might have slipped into it. He was cured provisionally. The unseen, unfelt, sinister duodenum no longer mysteriously deranged his whole engine. Only a continual sensation of slight fatigue indicated all the time that he was not cleverer than nature, and that he was not victoriously disposing of his waste products. But he could walk mildly about, his zest for smoking had in part returned, and to any uninstructed observer he bore a close resemblance to a healthy man. Four matters worried him, of which three may be mentioned immediately. He could not go to the Treasury. His colleague Hunter had amiably called the day after his seizure, and Mrs. Prahag had got hold of Hunter. Her influence over sane and well-balanced males was really extraordinary. 
Mr. Brohack had remained in perfect ignorance of the machinations of these two for eight days, at the end of which period he received by post an official document informing him that my Lords of the Treasury had granted him six months' leave of absence for reasons of ill health. Dr. Vega had furnished the certificate unknown to the patient. The quick dispatch of the affair showed with what celerity a government department can function when it is actuated from the inside. The leave of absence for reasons of ill health of course prevented Mr. Pohack from appearing at his office. How could he, with decency, appear at his office seemingly vigorous when it had been officially decided that he was too ill to work? And Mr. Brohack desired greatly to visit the Treasury. The habit of a lifetime had been broken in a moment, and since Mr. Prohack was the creature of that habit, he suffered accordingly. He had been suffering for two days. This was the first matter that worried Mr. Prohack. The second matter had to do with his clubs. He was cut off from his clubs, partly for the same reason as that which cut him off from the Treasury for both his clubs were full of civil servants, and partly because he was still somehow sensitive concerning the fact of his inheritance. He would have had a similar objection to entering his clubs in Highland Kilt. The explanation was obvious. He hated to be conspicuous. His inheritance was already, through Mr. Softly Bishop, the talk of certain official and club circles, and Mr. Prohack apprehended that every eye would be curiously upon him if he should set foot in a club. He could not bear that, and he could not bear the questions and the pleasantries. One day he would have to bear them, but not yet. The third matter that worried him was that he could not, even in secret, consult his own doctor. How could he go to old Plot and say, Plot, old man, I've been ill, and my wife insisted upon having another doctor, but I've come to ask you to tell me whether or not the other doctor's right. The thing was impossible yet he badly wanted to verify Vega by plot. He still mistrusted Vega, though his mistrust lessened daily, despite his wish to see it increase. Mrs. Prohack had benevolently suggested that he should run down to his club, but on no account for a meal, merely for a change. He had declined without giving the reason, and she had admitted that perhaps he was right. He attributed all the worries to his wife, I pay a fine price for that woman, he thought as he left the house, a rare fine price. But as for her price, he never haggled over it. She, just as she existed in her awful imperfection, was his first necessary of life. She had gone out after dinner to see an acquaintance about a housemaid, for already she was reorganising the household on a more specious scale. She was a mile off at least, but she would have disapproved of him breaking loose into his clubs at night and so the terror of the departments stole forth, instead of walking forth, intimidated by that moral influence which she left behind her. Undoubtedly, since the revolt of the duodenum, her grip of him had sensibly tightened. Not that Miss Brohack was really going to a club. He deceitfully told himself that he might stroll down to his principal club for the sake of exercise. His close friends among the members were lunchers, not diners but the central self within himself was aware that no club would see him that evening. A taxi approached in the darkness. He knew by its pace that it was empty. He told the driver to drive to Putney. In the old days of eleven days ago he would not have dared to tell a taxi driver to drive to Putney, for the fare would have unbalanced his dizzy private weekly budget, and even now he felt he was going the deuce of a pace. Even now he would prudently not have taken a taxi, had not part of the American hundred thousand pounds already materialised. Mr. Softly Bishop had been to see him on the previous day, and in addition to being mysteriously sympathetic about his co-heir's ill health, had produced seven thousand pounds of the hundred thousand. A New York representative had cabled fourteen thousand, not because Mr. Prohacker was in a hurry for seven, but because Mr. Softly Bishop was in a hurry for seven and Mr. Softly Bishop had pointed out something which Mr. Prohack, Treasury official, had not thought of. He had pointed out that Mr. Prohack might begin immediately to spend just as freely as if the hundred thousand were actually in hand. "'You see,' said he, "'the interest has been accumulating over there ever since Angmering's death, and it will continue to accumulate until we get all the capital. 
and the interest runs up to about a couple of hundred a week for each of us. Now Mr. Prohack had directed the taxi to his daughter's dance studio, and perhaps it was the intention to do so that had made him steal ignobly out of the house. For Eve would assuredly have rebelled. A state of war existed between Eve and her daughter, and Mr. Prohack's intelligence, as well as his heart, had ranged him on Eve's side. Since Sissy's departure, the girl had given no sign whatever to her parents. Mrs. Prohack had expected her to see her on the next day after her defection. But there was no Sissy, and there was no message from Sissy. Mrs. Prohack bulged with astounding news for Sissy of her father's illness and inheritance. But Mrs. Prohack's resentful pride would not make the first move, and would not allow Mr. Prohack to make it. They knew, at second hand through a friend of Violet Rydell's, that Sissy was regularly active at the studio. Also, Sissy had had the effrontery to send a messenger for some of her clothes, without even a note. The situation was incredible, and waxed daily in incredibility. Sissy's behaviour could not possibly be excused. This was the fourth and the chief matter that worried Mr. Prohack. He regarded it sardonically as rather a lark, but he was worried to think of the girl making a fool of herself with her mother. Her mother was demonstrably in the right. To yield to the chit's appalling heartlessness would be bad tactics, and it would be humiliating. Nevertheless, Mr. Prohack had directed the taxi-driver to the dance studio at Putney. On the way it suddenly occurred to him, almost with a shock, that he was a rich man, secure from material anxieties, and that therefore he ought to feel light-hearted. He had been losing sight of this very important fact for quite some time. 2. The woman in the cubicle near the door was putting a fresh disc onto a gramophone and winding up the instrument. She was a fat, youngish woman, in a parlour-maid's cap and apron, and Mr. Prohack had a few days earlier had a glimpse of her seated in his own hall, waiting for a package of Sissy's clothes. "'Very sorry, sir,' said she, turning her head negligently from the gramophone and eyeing him seriously. "'I'm afraid you can't go in if you're not in evening dress.' Evidently, from her firm, polite voice, she knew just what she was about, did that young woman. She added, "'The rule's very strict on Fridays.' At the same moment a bell rang once. The woman immediately released the catch of the gramophone and lowered the needle onto the disc, and Mr. Prohack heard music, but not from the cubicle. There was a round hole in the matchboard partition, and the trumpet attachment of the gramophone disappeared beyond the hole. This affair is organised, thought Mr. Prohack, decidedly impressed by the ingenuity of the musical arrangement and by the promptness of the orchestral director in obeying the signal of the bell. Uh, my name is Prohack, said he. I am Miss Prohack's father. This important announcement ought to have startled the sang froid of the guardian, but it did not. She merely said, with a slight mechanical smile, As soon as his dance is over, sir, I'll let Miss Prohack know she's wanted. She did not say, Sir, a person of your eminence is above rules. Go right in. Two girls in all enveloping dark cloaks entered behind him. "'Good evening, Lizzie,' one of them greeted the guardian, and Lizzie's face relaxed into a bright, genuine smile. "'Good evening, miss. Good evening, miss.' The two girls vanished rustlingly through a door over which was hung a piece of cardboard with the written words, "'Ladies' Cloakroom.' In a few moments they emerged, white and fluffy apparitions, eager, self-conscious, and they vanished through another door. Mr. Prohack judged from their bridling and from their whispers to each other that they belonged to the class which ministers to the shopping class. He admitted that they looked very nice and attractive, but he had the sensation of having blundered into a queer, hitherto unknown world, and of astonishment and qualms that his daughter should be a ruler in that world. Lizzie stood up and peeped through a little square window in the match-boarding. As soon as she had finished peeping, Mr. Prohack took liberty to peek also, and the dance-studio was revealed to him. Somehow he could scarcely believe that it was not a hallucination, and that he was really in Putney, and that his own sober house in which Sissy had been reared still existed not many miles off. 
for Mr. Prohack, not continuously, but at intervals, possessed a disturbing faculty that compelled him to see the phenomena of human life as they actually were, and to disregard entirely the mere names of things, which mere names, by the magic power of mere names, usually suffice to satisfy the curiosity of most people, and to allay their misgivings, if any. Mr. Prohack now saw, when he looked downwards, a revolving disc which was grating against a stationary needle, and thereby producing unpleasant rasping sounds. But it also produced a quite different order of sounds. He did not in the least understand, and he did not suppose, that anybody in the dance studio understood the delicate secret mechanism by which these other sounds were produced. All he knew was that by the means of the trumpet attachment they were transmitted through the wooden partition and let loose into the larger air of the studio, where the waves of them had a singular effect on the brains of certain bright young women and sombre young and middle-aged men who were arranged in clasped couples with the result that the brains of the women and men sent orders to their legs, arms, eyes, and they shifted to and fro in rhythmical movements. Each woman placed herself very close, breast against breast, to each man, yielding her volition absolutely to his, and, if the man was the taller, often gazing up into his face with an ecstatic expression of pleasure and acquiescence. The physical relations between the units of each couple would have caused censorious comment had the couple been alone or standing still. But the movement and the association of couples seemed mysteriously to lift the whole operation above criticism and to endow it with a perfect propriety. The motion of the couples, and their manner of moving, over the earth's surface, were extremely monotonous. Some couples indeed only walked stiffly to and fro. On the other hand, a few exhibited variety, lightness, and grace, in manoeuvres which involved a high degree of mutual trust and comprehension. While only some of the faces were ecstatic, all were rapt. The ordinary world was shut out of this room, whose inhabitants had apparently abandoned themselves with all their souls to the performance of a complicated and solemn rite. Odd as the spectacle was, Mr. Prohack enjoyed it. He enjoyed the youth and the prettiness and the litheness of the brightly dressed girls and the stern masculinity of the men, and he enjoyed the thought that both girls and men had had the wit to escape from the ordinary world into this fantastic environment created out of four walls, a few Chinese lanterns, some rouge, some stuffs, some spangles, friction between two pieces of metal, and the profoundest instinct of nature. Beyond everything, he enjoyed the sight of the lithest and most elegant of the girls, whom he knew to be Eliza Brating, and who was dancing with a partner whose skill obviously needed no lessons. He would have liked to see his daughter Sissy in Eliza's place, but Sissy was playing the man's role to a stout and nearly middle-aged lady, whose chief talent for the right appeared to be an iron determination. Mr. Prohack was in danger of being hypnotised by the spectacle, but suddenly the conflict between the disc and the needle grew more acute, and Lizzie, the guardian, dragged the needle sharply from the bosom of its antagonist. The sounds ceased, and the brains of the couples in the studio, no longer inspired by the sounds, ceased to inspire the muscles of the couples, and the rite suddenly finished. Mr. Prohack drew breath. To think, he reflected, that this sort of thing is seriously going on all over London at this very instant, and that many earnest persons are making a livelihood from it, and that nobody but me perceives how marvellous, charming, incomprehensible, and disconcerting it is. He said to the guardian, There doesn't seem to be much lesson about this business. Everybody here seems to be able to dance all right. To which Lizzie replied with a sagacious, even ironic smile, You see, sir, on these garden nights they all do their very best. Father! Sissy had arrived upon him. Clearly she was preoccupied, if not worried, and the unexpected sight of her parent forced her, as it were, unwillingly from one absorbing train of ideas into another. She was startled, self-conscious, nervous. Still she jumped at him and kissed him, as if in a dream. "'Nothing the matter, is there?' "'Nothing. I'm frightfully busy to-night. Just come in here, will you?' And she took him into the ladies' cloakroom, 
an apartment the like of which he had never before seen. It had only one chair in front of a sort of dressing-table covered with mysterious apparatus and instruments. Mr. Prohack inspected his daughter as though she had been somebody else's daughter. "'Well,' said he, "'you look just like a real businesswoman, except the dress.' She was very attractive, very elegant, comically young, to him, and very businesslike in her smart, short frock, stockings and shoes. "'Can't you understand?' she objected firmly. "'that this is my business dress, "'just as much as a black frock and high collar "'would be in an office.' "'He gave a short, gentle laugh. "'I don't know what you're laughing at, Dad,' "'she reproached him, not unkindly. "'Anyhow, I'm glad someone's come at last. "'I was beginning to think my home had forgotten all about me. "'Even when I sent up for some clothes, "'no message came back.' "'The lifelong experience of Mr. Prohack "'had been that important and unusual interviews rarely corresponded with the anticipation of them, and the present instance most sharply confirmed his experience. He had expected to be forgiving an apologetic daughter, but the reality was that he found himself in the dock. He hesitated for words, and Sissy went on. "'Here have I been working myself to death reorganising this place after Viola went, and I can tell you it needed reorganising. haven't had a minute in the mornings, and of course there are the lessons afternoon and evening.' "'and no one's been down to see how I was getting on or even written. "'I do think it's a bit steep. "'Mother might have known that if I had had any spare time I should have run up. "'I've been rather queer,' he excused himself and the family. "'And your mother's been looking after me, and, and of course you know Charlie's still in Glasgow.' "'I don't know anything,' she corrected him. "'But you needn't tell me that if you've been unwell Mother's been looking after you. "'Does she ever do anything else? "'Are you better? "'What was it? "'You look all right.' "'Oh, general derangement. I, I haven't been to the office since you decamped.' He did not feel equal to telling her that he would not be returning to the office for months. She had said that he looked all right, and her quite honest, if hasty verdict on his appearance gave him a sense of guilt, and also renewed suspicions of Dr. Vega. "'Not been to the office?' The statement justly amazed the girl, almost shocked her. But she went on in a fresh, satirical accent, recalling Mr. Prohack's own. "'You must have been upset. But, of course, you're highly nervous, Dad, and I expect the excitement of the news of your fortune was too much for you. I know exactly how you get when anything unusual happens.' She had heard of the inheritance. "'I, I was going to tell you all about that little affair,' he said awkwardly. "'So you knew. Who told you?' "'Nobody in my family, at any rate,' she answered. I heard of it from an outsider, and, of course, from sheer pride I had to pretend that I knew all about it. And what's more, Father, you knew when you gave me that fifty pounds, only you wouldn't let on. Don't deny it. Naturally, I'm glad about it, very glad. But yet I'm not. I really rather regret it for you and Mother. You'll never be as happy again. Riches will spoil my poor darling Mother. That remains to be seen, Miss Worldly Wise Miss he reported with unconvincing lightness. He was disturbed, and he was impressed by her indifference to the fortune. It appeared not to concern or to interest her. She spoke not merely as one who objected to unearned wealth, but as one to whom the annals of the Prohack family were henceforth a matter of minor importance. It was very strange, and Mr. Prohack had to fight against a feeling of intimidation. The girl, whom he had cherished for over twenty years, and whom he thought he knew to the core, was absolutely astounding him by the revelation of her individuality. He didn't know her. He was not her father. He was helpless before her. "'How are things here?' he demanded, amiably inquisitive as an acquaintance. "'Excellent,' said she. "'Jolly hard work, though.' "'Yes, I should imagine so. Teaching men dancing by Jove. "'There's not so much difficulty about teaching men. The difficulty is with the women.' "'Father, they're awful. You can't imagine their stupidity.' Lizzie glanced into the room. She simply glanced, and Miss Sissy returned the glance. "'You'll have to excuse me a bit, Father,' said Sissy. "'I'll come back as quick as I can. Don't go.' She departed hurriedly. "'I'd better get out of this anyhow,' thought Mr. Brohack, surveying the ladies' cloakroom. "'If one of them came in, I should have to explain my unexplainable presence in this sacred grot.' 3. 
having received no suggestions from his daughter as to how he should dispose of himself while awaiting her leisure, Mr. Brohack made his way to the Guardian's cubicle, and there he discovered a chubby and intentionally young man in the act of gazing through the small window into the studio, exactly as he himself had been gazing a few minutes earlier. "'Hello, Prohack!' exclaimed the chubby and intentionally young man, with the utmost geniality and calmness. Uh, "'How do you do?' responded Mr. Prohack, with just as much calmness and perhaps ten per cent less geniality. Mr. Prohack was a peculiar fellow, and that on this occasion he gave rather less geniality than he received was due to the fact that he had never before spoken to the Cupid in his life, and that he was wondering whether membership of the same club entirely justified so informal a mode of address, without an introduction, and outside the club premises. For, like all modest men, Mr. Prohack had some sort of a notion of his own dignity, a sort of a notion that occasionally took him quite by surprise. Mr. Prohack did not even know the surname of his aggressor. He only knew that he never overheard other men call him anything but Aussie. Had not Mr. Prohack been buried away all his life in the catacombs of the Treasury, and thus cut off from the great world movement, he would have been fully aware that Oswald Morphy was a person of importance in the West End of London, that he was an outstanding phenomenon of the age, that he followed very closely all the varying curves of the great world movement, that he was constantly to be seen on the pavements of Piccadilly, Bond Street, St. James's Street, Pall Mall and Hammersmith, that he was never absent from a good first night or a private view of very new or very old pictures, or a distinguished concert, or a poetry reading, or a fashionable auction at Christie's, that he received invitations to dinner for every night in the week, and accepted all those that did not clash with the others, that in return for these abundant meals he gave, about once a month, a tea-party in his trifling Japanese flat in Bruton Street, where the sandwiches were as thin as the sound of the harpsichord which eighteenth-century ladies played at his request, and that he was in truth what Mr. Asprey Crown called social secretary to Mr. Asprey Chown. Mr. Prohack might be excused for his ignorance of this last fact, for the relation between Asprey Chown and Ozzy was never very clearly defined, at any rate by Ozzy. He had no doubt learned, from an enforced acquaintance with the sides of motor omnibuses, that Mr. Asprey Chown was a theatre manager of some activity, but he certainly had not truly comprehended, was head of one of the two great rival theatrical combines, and reputed to be the most accomplished showman in the Western Hemisphere, with a jewelled finger in notable side enterprises such as prize fights, restaurants, and industrial companies. The knowing ones, from whom naught is hidden, held that Asprey Chown had never given a clearer proof of genius than in engaging this harmless and indefatigable parasite of the West End to be his social secretary. The knowing ones that said further that whereas Ozzy was saving money, nobody could be sure that Asprey Chown was saving money. The engagement had a double effect. It had at once put Asprey Chown into touch with everything that could be useful to him for the purpose of special booming and it put Ozzy into touch with half the theatrical stars of London, in an age when a first-rate heroine of review was worth at least two duchesses and a dame, in the scale of social values. Mr. Oswald Morphy, doubtless in order to balance the modernity of his taste in the arts, wore a tight black stock and a wide eyeglass ribbon in the daytime, and in the evening permitted himself to associate a soft silk shirt with a swallow tailcoat. It was to Mr. Prohack's secondary, and more exclusive, club that he belonged. Inoffensive though he was, he managed innocently to offend Mr. Prohack. "'Who is the fellow?' Mr. Prohack at once asked a fellow in the club, and having received no answer but Ozzy, Mr. Prohack had added, "'He's a perfect ass,' and had given us a reason for this harsh judgment. "'Well, I can't stick the way he walks across the hall.' In the precincts of the dance studio, Mr. Oswald Morphy said in that simple, half-lisping tone, and with that wide-open, childlike glance that characterised most of his remarks, "'A very prosperous little affair here!' Having said this, he let his eyeglass fall into the full silkiness of his shirt-front, and turned and smiled very amicably and agreeably on Mr. Prohack, who could not help thinking, "'Perhaps, after all, you aren't such a bad sort of an idiot.' 
Do you often get as far as Putney? For Mr. Oswald Morphy, enveloped as he unquestionably was in the invisible aura of the West End, seemed conspicuously out of place in a dance studio in a side street in Putney, having rather the air of an angelic visitant. Well, now I come to think of it, I don't. Mr. Morphy answered nearly all questions, as though they were curious, disconcerting questions that took him by surprise. This mannerism was universally attractive, until you got tired of it. Mr. Brahack was now faintly attracted by it, so that he said in a genuine attempt at good fellowship, "'If I come for the life of me, remember your name. You must excuse me, my memory for names is not what it was. And I hate to dissemble, don't you?' The announcement was a grave shock to Mr. Oswald Morphy, who imagined that half the taxi-drivers in London knew him by sight. Nevertheless, he withstood the shock like a little man of the world, and replied with miraculous and sincere politeness, "'I am sure there's no reason why you should remember my name.' And he vouchsafed his name. "'Of course, of course,' exclaimed Mr. Prohack, with a politeness equally miraculous, for the word Morphy had no significance for the benighted official. Ah, how stupid of me! By the way, said Mr. Morphy, in a lower, confidential tone, your eagle will be ready to-morrow instead of next week. My eagle? Your new car! It was Mr. Prohack's turn to be staggered, and to keep his nerve. Not one word had he heard about the purchase of a car since Charlie's telegram from Glasgow. He had begun to think that his wife had either forgotten the necessity of a car, or was waiting till his more complete recovery before troubling him to buy it. And he had taken care to say nothing about it himself, for he had discovered, upon searching his own mind, that his interest in motor-cars was not an authentic interest, and that he had no desire at all to go motoring in pursuit of his health. And lo, Eve had been secretly engaged in the purchase of a car for him. Ha! A remarkable woman, Eve! She would stop at nothing when his health was in question not even at a two-thousand-pound car. Uh, "'Ah, yes,' said Mr. Prague, with as much tranquillity as though his habit was to buy a car once a week or so. Uh, "'Tomorrow, you say? Good!' Was the fellow then a motor-car tout working on commission? "'You see,' said Ozzy, "'my old man owns a controlling interest in the Eagle Company, and that's how I happen to know.' Ah, "'I see,' murmured Mr. Prague, speculating wildly in private, as to the identity of Ozzy's old man. When Ozzy, with a nod and a smile and a refixing of his monocle, left the cubicle to enter the studio, he left Miss Brohack freshly amazed at the singularities of the world and of women, even the finest women. How disturbing to come down to Putney in a taxicab in order to learn from a stranger that you have bought a two-thousand-pound car which is to come into your possession on the morrow! The dangerousness, the excitingness of being rich, struck Mr. Brohack very forcibly. A few minutes later he beheld a sight which affected him more deeply, and less pleasantly, than anything else in an evening of thunderclaps. Through the little window he saw Sissy dancing with Ozzy Morphy. And although Sissy was not gazing upward ecstatically into Ozzy's face, she could not, because they were of a size, and although her features had a rather stern, fixed expression, Mr. Brohack knew, from his knowledge of her, that Sissy was in a secret ecstasy of enjoyment while dancing with this man. He did not like her ecstasy. Was it possible that she, so sensible and acute, had failed to perceive that the fellow was a perfect ass? For in spite of his amiability, a perfect ass the fellow was. The sight of his sissy held in the arms of Ozzy Morphy revolted Mr. Prohack. But he was once again helpless, and the most sinister suspicions crawled into his mind. Why was the resplendent, the utterly correct Ozzy, dancing in a dancing studio in Putney? Certainly he was not there to learn dancing. He danced to perfection. The feet of the partners seemed to be married into a mystic unity of direction. The performance was entrancing to watch. Could it be possible that Ozzy was there because Sissy was there? Darker still, could it be possible that Sissy had taken a share in the studio for any reason other than a purely commercial reason? "'He thinks you're a darling,' said Sissy to her father afterwards, when he and she and Eliza Brating, alone together in the studio, 
were informally consuming buns and milk in the corner where the stove was. The talk ran upon dancers, and whether Ozzie Morphy was not one of the finest dancers in London. Was Sissy's tone quite natural? Mr. Prohack could not be sure. Eliza Brating said she must go at once in order not to miss the last tram home. Mr. Prohack, without thinking, said that he would see her home in his taxi, which had been ruthlessly ticking his fortune away for much more than an hour. "'Kiss Mother for me,' said Sissy, "'and tell her that she's a horrid old thing, and I shall come along and give her a piece of my mind one of these days.' And she gave him the kiss for her mother. And as she kissed him, Mr. Prohack was very proud of his daughter, so efficient, so sound, so straight, so graceful. She's all right, anyway, he reflected. And yet she could be ecstatic in the arms of that perfect ass. And in the taxi, fancy me seeing home this dancing mistress. Eliza lived at Brook Green. She was very elegant and quite unexceptionable until she opened her mouth. She related to him how her mother, who had once been a premier sujet in the Covent Garden Ballet, was helpless from sciatica. But she related this picturesque and pride-causing detail in a manner very insipid, naive, and even vulgar. After all, there was a difference between first division and second division in the civil service. She was boring him terribly before they reached Brook Green. She took leave with a deportment correct but acquired at an age too late. Still, he had liked to see her home in the taxi. She was young, and she was an object pleasing to the eye. He realised that he was not accustomed to the propinquity of young women. What would his cronies at the club say to the escapade? Odd, excessively odd, that the girl should be Sissy's partner in a business enterprise of so odd a character. The next thing was to meet Eve after the escapade. Should he keep to the defensive, or should he lead off with an attack apropos of the eagle car? End of chapter 8《Chapter Nine of Mr. Prohack by Arnold Bennett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Chapter Nine, Collision. One. After an eventful night, Mr. Prohack woke up late to breakfast in bed. Theoretically, he hated breakfast in bed, but in practice, he had recently found that the inconveniences to himself were negligible compared to the intense and triumphant pleasure which his wife took in seeing him breakfast in bed, in being fully dressed while he was in pyjamas and dressing-gown, and in presiding over the meal, and over him. Recently Marian had formed the habit of rising earlier, and appearing to be very busy upon various minute jobs, at an hour when, a few weeks previously, she would scarcely have decided that day had given place to night. Mr. Prohack, without being able precisely to define it, thought that he understood the psychology of the change in this unique woman. Under ordinary circumstances he would have been worried by his sense of fatigue, but now, as he had nothing whatever to do, he did not much care whether he was tired or not. Neither the office nor the state would suffer through his lack of tone. The events of the night had happened exclusively inside Mr. Prohack's head, nor were they traceable to the demeanour of his wife when he returned home from the studio. She had mysteriously behaved to him as though nocturnal excursions to disgraceful daughters in remote quarters of London were part of his daily routine. She had been very sweet and very incurious. Whereon Mr. Prohack had said to himself, She has some diplomatic reason for being an angel. And, even if she had not been an angel, even if she had been the very reverse of an angel, Mr. Mr. Prohack would not have minded, and his night would not have been thereby upset for he regarded her as a beautiful natural phenomenon is regarded by a scientist, lovingly and wonderingly, and he was incapable of being irritated for more than a few seconds by anything that might be done or said by this forest creature of the prime who had strayed charmingly into the twentieth century. He was a very fortunate husband. No, the eventfulness of the night originated in reflection upon the relations between Sissy and Ozzie Morphy. 
if thoughts could take physical shape and solidity, the events of the night would have amounted to terrible collisions and catastrophes in the devil-haunted abysses of Mr. Brohack's brain. The forces of evil were massacring all opponents between 3 and 4 a.m. It was at this period Mr. Brohack was convinced that Sissy, in addition to being an indescribably heartless daughter, was a perfect fool hoodwinked by a perfect ass, and that Ozzy's motive in the affair was not solely or chiefly admiration for Sissy, but admiration of the great fortune which he had learnt had fallen into the lap of Sissy's father. After five o'clock, according to the usual sequence, the forces of evil lost ground, and at six-thirty, when the oblong of the looking-glass glimmered faintly in the dawn, Mr. Brohack had said roundly, "'I'm an idiot,' and went to sleep. "'Now, darling,' said Eve, when he emerged from the bathroom, "'don't waste any more time. I want you to give me your opinion about something downstairs.' "'Child,' said Mr. Brohack, "'what on earth do you mean, wasting time?' Haven't you insisted, and hasn't your precious doctor insisted, that I must read the papers for an hour in bed after I've had my breakfast in bed? Talk about wasting time, indeed. Yes, of course, darling, Eve concurred, amazingly angelic. I don't mean you've been wasting time, only I don't want you to waste any more time. My mistake, said Mr. Prohack. From mere malice and wickedness he spun out the business of dressing to nearly its customary length and twice Eve came uneasily into the bedroom to see if she could be of assistance to him. No nurse could have been so beautifully attentive. During one of her absences he slipped furtively downstairs into the drawing-room, where he began to strum on the piano, though the room was yet by no means properly warm. She came after him, admirably pretending not to notice that he was behaving unusually. She was attired for the street, and she carried his hat and his thickest overcoat. "'You're coming out,' said she, holding up the overcoat cajolingly. "'That's just where you're mistaken,' said he. "'But I want to show you something.' "'What do you want to show me?' "'You shall see when you come out.' "'Is it by chance the bird of the mountains that I am to see?' "'The bird of the mountains? My dear Arthur, what are you driving at now?' "'Is it the eagle car?' And as she staggered speechless under the blow, he proceeded, "'Ah! Did you think you could deceive me with your infantile conspiracies and your tacit deceits and your false smiles?' She blushed. "'Someone's told you, and I do think it's a shame.' "'And who should have told me? Who have I seen? I suppose you think I picked up the information at Putney last night. And haven't you opened all my letters since I was ill on the pretext of saving me worry? Shall I tell you how I know? I knew from your face.' Your face, my innocent, can't be read like a book. It can be read like a newspaper placard. And for days past I've seen on it extra special, exciting purchase of a motor car by a cunning wife. Then he laughed. Oh, no, chit! That fellow Oswald Morphy let it out last night. When she had indignantly inquired how Oswald Morphy came to be mixed up in her private matters, she said, Well, darling, I hope I needn't tell you that my sole object was to save you trouble. The car simply had to be bought, and as quickly as possible. So I did it. Need I tell you? You needn't, certainly, Mr. Prohack agreed, and going to the window he lifted the curtain. Yes, there stood a real car, a land or let, with the illustrious eagle on the front of its radiator, and a real chauffeur by its side. The thing seemed entirely miraculous to Mr. Prohack, and he was rather impressed by his wife's daring and, and enterprise. After all, it was somewhat of an undertaking for an unworldly woman to go out alone into the world, and buy a motor-car and engage a chauffeur, not to mention clothing the chauffeur. But Mr. Prohack kept all his imperturbability. "'Isn't it lovely?' "'Is it paid for?' "'Oh, no!' "'Didn't you have to pay any deposit?' "'Of course I didn't. I gave your name, and that was sufficient. We needn't keep it if we don't like it after the trial run.' "'And is it insured?' "'Of course, darling.' And what about the license? Oh, the Eagle Company saw to all those stupid things for me. And how many times have you forged my signature while I've been lying on a bed of pain? The fact is, darling, I made the purchase in my own name. Now come along, we're going round the park. The way she patted his overcoat when she had got it on to him. The way she took him by the hand and pulled him towards the drawing-room door. 
she had done an exceedingly audacious deed, and her spirits rose as she became convinced from his demeanour that she had not pushed audacity too far. For she was never absolutely sure of him. "'Wait one moment,' said Mr. Prohack, releasing himself and slipping back to the window. "'What's the matter?' I made a desire to look at the chauffeur's face. Is it a real chauffeur, not an automaton? Arthur! I'm sure he's quite human. Mrs. Prohack closed the piano, and then stamped her foot. Listen, said Mr. Prohack, I'm about to trust my life to the mysterious being inside that uniform. Did you imagine that I would trust my life to a perfect stranger? In another half-hour he and I may be lying in hospital side by side, and I don't even know his name. Fetch him in, my dove, and allow me to establish relations with him. But confide to me his name first. The expression on Mrs. Prohack's features was one of sublime forbearance under ineffable provocation. This is Carthew, she announced, bringing the chef to the drawing room. Carthew was a fairly tall, fairly full bodied, grizzled man of about forty. He carried his cap and one gauntleted glove in one gloved hand and his long, stiff, green overcoat slanted down from his neck to his knees in an unbroken line. He had the impassivity of a policeman. "'Good morning, Carthew,' Mr. Prohack began, rising. "'I thought that you and I would like to make one another's acquaintance.' "'Yes, sir.' Mr. Prohack held out his hand, which Carthew calmly took. "'Will you sit down?' Uh, "'Thank you, sir.' Uh, "'Have a cigarette?' Carthew hesitated. Do you mind if I have one of my own, sir? These are Virginian. Oh, thank you, sir. McCarthy took a cigarette from Mr. Prohack's case. Light? After you, sir. No, no. Thank you, sir. McCarthy coughed, puffed, and leaned back a little in his chair. At this point Mrs. Prohack left the room. She said afterwards that she left the room because she couldn't have borne to be present when Carthew's back broke the back of the chair. Carthew sat silent. "'Well,' said Mr. Prohack, "'what do you think of the car? I ought to tell you I know nothing of motors myself, and this is the first one I've ever had.' "'The Eagle is a very good car, sir. If you ask me, I should say it was light on tyres and a bit thirsty with petrol. It's one of them cars as anybody could drive, if you understand what I mean. I mean, anybody could make it go. But, of course, that's only the beginning of what I call driving.' Uh, just so, agreed Mr. Prohack, drawing by his smile a very faint smile from Carthew. My son seems to think it's about the best car on the market. Well, sir, I've been mixed up with cars pretty well all my life. I mean, since I was twenty. Have you, indeed? I have, sir. Carthew neatly flicked some ash on the carpet, and Mr. Prohack thoughtfully did the same. I have, sir, and I haven't yet come across the best car on the market, if you understand what I mean. Perfectly, said Mr. Prohack. Carthew sat silent. But it's a very good car. Nobody would wish for a better, I'll say that, he added at length. Have many accidents in your time? I've been touched, sir, but I've never touched anything myself. You can have an accident while you're drawn up alongside the curb. It rather depends on how many fools have been let loose in the traffic, doesn't it, sir, if you understand what I mean? Exactly, said Mr. Prohack. Carthew sat silent. "'I gather you've been through the war,' Mr. Prohack began again. "'I was in the first territorial regiment that landed in France, and I got my discharge July 1919.' "'Wounded?' "'Well, sir, I've been blown up twice, and buried once, and pitched into the sea once, but nothing ever happened to me.' "'I see you don't wear any ribbons.' "'It's like this, sir. I've seen enough ribbons on chests since the armistice. It isn't as if I was one of them conscripts. No, murmured Mr. Prohack thoughtfully, then brightening. And as soon as you were discharged, you went back to your old job? I did, and I didn't, sir. The fact is, I've been driving an ambulance for the City of London. But as soon as I heard of something private, I chucked that. I can't say as I like these corporations. There's a bit too much stone wall about them corporations for my taste. "'Family man?' asked Mr. Prohack lightly. "'I have two children myself, and both of them can drive.' "'Really, sir, I am a family man, as you might say. "'But my wife and me, we're best apart.' 
Sorry to hear that. I didn't want to. Oh, not at all, sir. That's all right. But you see, the war, me being away and all that. I've got the little boy. He's nine. Well, said Mr. Prohack, jumping up nervously, suppose we go and have a look at the car, shall we? Certainly, sir, said Carthew, throwing the end of his cigarette into the fender and hastening. My dove, said Mr. Prohack to his wife in the hall, I congratulate you on your taste in chauffeurs. Carthew and I have laid the foundations of a lasting friendship. I really wonder you asked him to smoke in the drawing-room, Mrs. Prohack critically observed. Why, he saved England for me, and I am trusting my life to him. I do believe you'd like there to be a revolution in this country. Not at all, Angel, and I don't think there will be one. But I'm taking my precautions in case there should be one. He's only a chauffeur. That's very true. He was doing some useful work driving an ambulance to hospitals, but we've stopped that. He's now only a chauffeur to the idle rich. Oh, Arthur, I wish you wouldn't try to be funny on such subjects. You know you don't mean it. Mrs. Prohack was now genuinely reproachful, and the first conjugal joyride might have suffered from a certain constraint had it taken place. It did not, however, take place. Just as Carthy was holding out the rug, which Eve's prodigious thoroughness had remembered to buy, preparatory to placing it on the knees of his employers, a truly gigantic automobile drove up to the door, its long bonnet stopping within six inches of the eagle's tail lantern. The eagle looked like nothing at all beside it. Mr. Prohack knew that Leviathan. He had many times seen it in front of the portals of his principal club. It was the car of his great club crony, Sir Paul Spinner, the city magnate. Sir Paul, embossed with carbuncles, got out, and was presently being presented to Eve, for the friendship between Mr. Prohack and Sir Paul had been a purely club friendship. Like many such friendships, it had had no existence beyond the club, and neither of the cronies knew anything of real interest about the domestic circumstances of the other. Sir Paul was very apologetic to Eve, but he imperiously desired an interview with Mr. Prohack at once. Eve most agreeably and charmingly said that she would take a little preliminary airing in the car by herself and return for her husband. Mr. Prohack would have preferred her to wait for him, but though Eve was sagacious enough at all normal times, when she got an idea into her head, that idea ruthlessly took precedence of everything else in the external world. Moreover, the car was her private creation, and she was incapable of resisting its attractions one minute longer. 2. "'Now here you've come into half a million, Arthur,' said Paul Spinner, after he had shown himself very friendly and optimistic about Mr. Prohack's health, and given the usual bulletin about his own carbuncles and the shortcomings of the club. "'But you don't believe it, Paul?' "'I don't,' agreed Paul. "'Things get about pretty fast in the city, and we can size them up fairly well. And I should say, putting two and two together, that a hundred and fifty thousand will be nearer the mark.' "'It certainly is,' said Mr. Prohack. "'If Paul Spinner had suggested fifty thousand, Mr. Prohack would have corrected him, but, being full of base instincts, he had no impulse to correct the larger estimate, which was just as inaccurate. "'Well, well, it's a most romantic story, and I congratulate you on it. No such luck ever happened to me.' Sir Paul made this remark in a tone to indicate that he had practically no luck himself. And he really believed that he had had no luck, though the fact was that he touched no enterprise that failed. Every year he signed a huger cheque for super-tax, and every year he signed it with a gesture signifying that he was signing his own ruin. This distressing illusion of Sir Paul's was probably due to his carbuncles, which of all pathological phenomena were among the most productive of, of pessimistic philosophy. The carbuncles were well known up and down Harley Street. They were always to be cured, and they never were cured. They must have cost their owner about as much as his motor-car for upkeep, what with medical fees, travelling, and foreign hotels. And nobody knew whether they remained uncured because they were incurable, or because the medical profession thought it would be cruel at one stroke to deprive itself of a regular income, and Sir Paul of his greatest hobby. The strange thing was that Sir Paul, with all his powerful general sagacity and shrewdness, continued firmly, despite endless disappointments, in the mystical faith that one day the carbuncles would be abolished. 
"'I won't beat about the bush,' said he. "'We know one another. "'I came here to talk frankly, and I'll talk frankly.' <laughs> "'You go right ahead.' Mr. Prehack benevolently encouraged him. First of all, I should like to give you just the least hint of warning against that fellow softly bishop. I dare say you know something about him. Oh, I know nothing about him except the way he looks down his nose. But no man who looks down his nose the way he looks down his nose is going to influence me in the management of my financial affairs. I am only an official. I should be a lamb in the city, but I have my safeguards, old chap. Thanks for the tip all the same. Sir Paul Spinner laughed hoarsely, as Mr. Prohack had made him laugh hundreds of times in the course of their friendship. And Mr. Prohack was aware of a feeling of superiority to Sir Paul. The feeling grew steadily in his breast, and he was not quite sure how it originated. Perhaps it was due to a note of dawning obsequiousness in Sir Paul's laugh, reminding Mr. Prohack of the ancient proverb that the jokes of the exalted are always side-splitting. "'As I say,' Sir Paul proceeded, "'you and I know each other.' Mr. Prohack nodded, with a trace of impatience against unnecessary repetition. Yet he was suddenly struck with the odd thought that Sir Paul certainly did not know him, but only odd bits of him, and he was doubtful whether he knew Sir Paul. He saw an obese man of sixty sitting in the very chair that a few moments ago had been occupied by Carthew the chauffeur a man with big purplish features and a liverish eye, a man smoking a plutocratic and heavenly cigar and eating it at the same time, a man richly dressed and braided and jewelled, a man whose boots showed no sign of a crease, an obvious millionaire of the old type, in short, a man who was practically all prejudices and waste products. And he wondered why and how that man had become his friend and won his affection. Sir Paul looked positively coarse in Mr. Prohack's frail Chippendale drawing-room, seeming to need for suitable environment the pillared marble and gilt of the vast club. Well, after having eaten many hundreds of meals and drunk many hundreds of cups of coffee in the grunting society of Sir Paul, all that Mr. Prohack could be sure of knowing about Sir Paul was, first, that he had an absolutely unspotted reputation, second, that he was a very decent, simple-minded, kindly, ignorant fellow. Ignorant, that is, in the matters that interested Mr. Prohack. Third, that he instinctively mistrusted intellect and brilliance. Fourth, that for nearly four years he had been convinced that Germany would win the war. And, fifth, that he was capable of astounding freaks of generosity. Stay, there was another item. Sir Paul's invariable courtesy to the club servants, which courtesy he somehow contrived to combine with continual grumbling the club servants held him in affection. It was probably this sixth item that outweighed any of the others in Mr. Prohack's favourable estimate of the financier. And then Mr. Prohack, as in a dream, heard from the lips of Paul Spinner the words, "'Oil concessions in Romania.' In a flash, in an earthquake, in a blinding vision, Mr. Prohack instantaneously understood the origin of his queer, nascent feeling of superiority to old Paul. What he had previously known subconsciously, he now knew consciously. Old Paul, who had no doubt been paying in annual taxes about ten times the amount of Mr. Prohack's official annual salary, old Paul, whose name was the synonym for millions, and the rumours of whose views on the stock markets caused the readers of financial papers to tremble, old Paul was after Mr. Prohack's money. Marvellous, marvellous, thrice marvellous money! It was the most astounding, the most glorious thing that had ever happened. Mr. Prohack immediately began to have his misgivings about Sir Paul Spinner. Simultaneously he felt sorry for old Paul, and such was his constraint that he made the motion of swallowing, and had all he could do not to blush. Mr. Prohack might be a lamb in the city, but he had a highly trained mind, and a very firm grasp of the mere technique of finance. Therefore, Sir Paul could explain himself succinctly and precisely in technical terms, and he did so, with much skill and a sort of unconsidered persuasiveness, realising in his rough common sense that there was no need to drive ideas into Mr. Prohack's head with a steam-hammer, or to intoxicate him with a heady vapour of superlatives. In a quarter of an hour, 
Mr. Prohack learned that Sir Paul was promoting a strictly private syndicate as a preliminary to the formation of a big company for the exploitation of certain options on Romanian oil territory which Sir Paul held. He learnt about the reports of the trial borings. He learnt about the character and the experience of the expert whom Sir Paul had sent forth to Romania. He learnt about the world supply of oil and the world demand for oil. He learnt about the great rival oil groups that were then dividing the universe of oil. He had the entire situation clearly mapped on his brain. Next, he obtained some startling inside knowledge about the shortage of liquid capital in the circles of big money. And then followed Sir Paul's famous club disquisition upon the origin of the present unsaleableness of securities and the appalling uneasiness, not to say collapse, of markets. What we want is stability, old boy. We want it to be left alone. We're being governed to death. Social reform is all right. I believe in it, but everything depends on the pace. Change there ought to be, but it must be like a transformation scene in a pantomime. And so on. Mr. Brahack was familiar with it all. He expected the culminating part of the exposition. But Sir Paul curved off towards the Navy and the needs of conserving, in British hands, a more than adequate gush of oil for the Navy. Mr. Brahack wished that Sir Paul could have left out the Navy. And then the Empire was reached. Mr. Brahack wished that Sir Paul could have left out the Empire. Finally, Sir Paul arrived at the point. I have realised all I could do in reason, and I am eighty thousand short. Of course I can get it, get it easily, but not without giving away a good part of my share in quarters that I should prefer to keep quite in the dark. I thought of you. You are clean outside, all that sort of thing. And also I know you'd lie low. You might make a hundred percent, you might make two hundred percent. But I guarantee you this, you won't lose whatever happens. Of course, your capital may not be liquid, you may be able to get at it. I don't know. But I thought it was just worth mentioning it to you, and so I said to myself I'd look in here on my way to the city. The Paul Spinner touting for a miserable eighty thousand pounds. Hanged if I know how my capital is, said Mr. Prohack. I suppose your lawyer knows. Smith, isn't it? That's it. How soon do you want an answer, yes or no? Mr. Brahack asked, with a feeling that he had his back to the wall, and old Paul had a gun. Oh, I don't want an answer now, anyhow, old boy. You must think it over. You see, once we've got the thing, I shall set the two big groups biddy against each other for it, and we shall see some fun. And I wouldn't ask them for cash payments, only for payment in their own shares, which are worth more than money. Want an answer tomorrow? Could you make it tonight? Sir Paul surprisingly answered. And assuming you say yes, I, I only say assuming. Couldn't you run down with me to Smaith's now and find out about your capital? I wouldn't bind you in any way. I'm particularly anxious you should think it over very carefully. By the way, I'd better keep these papers to refer to. But if you can't get at your capital, no use troubling further. That's the first thing to find out. I, I, I can't go to Smaith's now, Mr. Prohack stammered. Why not? Because I'm going out with my wife in the car. But, my dear old boy, it's a big thing, and it's urgent. Yes, I quite see that, but I've got to go with Marion. I'll tell you what I can do. I'll telephone Smaith that you're coming down to see him yourself, and he must tell you everything. That'll be best. Then I'll let you know my decision later. As they parted, Sir Paul said, We know each other, and you may take it from me it's all right. I'll say no more. However, you think it over. Oh, I will. Oh? Paul touting for eighty thousand pounds. A wondrous world, a stupefying world. Mr. Brohack, who didn't know what to do with a hundred thousand pounds, saw himself the possessor of a quarter of a million, and was illogically thrilled by the prospect. But the risk! Supposing that honest Paul was wrong for once, or suppose he was carried off in the night by a carbuncle, Mr. Brohack might find himself a pauper with a mere trifle of twenty thousand pounds to his name. As soon as he had telephoned, he resumed his hat and coat, and went out onto the pavement to look for his car, chauffeur, and wife. There was not a sign of them. 3. Mr. Brohack was undeniably a very popular man. He had few doubts concerning the financial soundness of old Paul's proposition, but he hesitated, 
for reasons unconnected with finance or with domesticity, about accepting it. And he conceived the idea, which none but a very peculiar man would have conceived, of discussing the matter with some enemy of old Paul's. Now old Paul had few enemies. Mr. Prowack, however, could put his hand on one, Mr. Francis Fieldfair, the editor of an old established and lucrative financial weekly, and familiar to readers of that and other organs as F.F. Mr. Fieldfair's offices were quite close to Mr. Prowack's principal club, of which Mr. Fieldfair also was a member, and Mr. Fieldfair had the habit of passing into the club about noon, and reading the papers for an hour, lunching early, and leaving the club again just as the majority of the members were ordering their after-lunch coffee. Mr. Fieldfair pursued this course because he had a deep instinct for being in the minority. Mr. Prohack looked at his watch. The resolution of every man is limited in quantity. Only in mad people is resolution inexhaustible. Mr. Prohack had no more resolution than becomes an average sane fellow, and his resolution to wait for his wife had been seriously tried by the energetic refusal to go with Spinner to see Smain. It now suddenly gave out. Pooh, said Mr. Prowack, I've waited long enough for her. She'll now have to wait a bit for me. And off he went by taxi to his club. The visit, he reflected, would serve the secondary purpose of an inconspicuous re-entry into club life after absence from it. He thought, They may have had an accident with that car. One day she's certain to have an accident anyhow. She's so impulsive. Of course, Mr. Fieldfair was not in the morning room of the club, as he ought to have been. That was bound to happen. Mr. Brohack gazed around at the monumental somnolence of the great room, was ignored, and backed out into the hall, meaning to return home. But in the hall he met F. F. just arriving. It surprised, and perhaps a little pained, Mr. Brohack to observe that F. F. had evidently heard neither of his illness nor of his inheritance. Mr. Fieldfair was a spare, middle-aged man of apparently austere habit, short, shabby, a beautiful, resigned face, burning eyes, and a soft voice. He was weighed down, and had been weighed down for thirty years, by a sense of the threatened immediate collapse of society, of all societies, and by the solemn illusion that he more clearly than anybody else understood the fearful trend of events. Mr. Brohack had once, during the war, remarked on seeing F. F. glance at the tape in the club, Look at F. F. afraid, lest there may be some good news. Nevertheless, he liked F. F. As editor of a financial weekly, F. F. naturally had to keep well under control his world sadness. High finance cannot prosper in an atmosphere of world sadness, and hates it. F. F. ought never to have become the editor of a financial weekly, but he happened to be an expert statistician, an honest man and a courageous man, and an expert in the pathology of stock markets, and on this score his proprietors excused the slight traces of world sadness occasionally to be found in the paper. He might have left his post and obtained another, but to be forced by fate to be editor of a financial weekly was F. F.'s chief grievance in life, and he loved a good grievance beyond anything. "'But, my dear fellow,' said F. F. with his melancholy ardent glance, when Mr. Prohack had replied suitably to his opening question, I'd no idea you'd been unwell. I hope it isn't what's called a breakdown. Oh, no, Mr. Prohack laughed nervously. But you know what doctors are. A little rest has been prescribed. F. F. gazed at him, softly compassionate, as if to indicate that nothing but trouble could be expected under the present political regime. They examined the tape together. Things can't go on much longer like this, observed F. F. comprehensively in front of the morning's messages from the capitals of the world. Still, said Mr. Prohack, we've won the war, haven't we? I suppose we have, said F. F., and sighed. Mr. Prohack felt that he had no more time for preliminaries, and in order to cut them short, started some ingenious but quite inexcusable lying. You didn't happen to see old Paul Spinner going out as you came in? No, answered F. F. Why? Oh, nothing. Only a man in the morning-room was wanting to know if he was still in the club, and I told him I'd see. "'I hear,' said F. F. after a moment, and in a lower voice, "'I hear he's getting up some new big oil scheme.' "'Ah!' 
murmured Mr. Prohack, delighted at so favourable a coincidence with a wonderful imitation of casualness. And what may that be? Nobody knows. Some people would give a good deal to know. But if I'm any judge of my spinner, they won't know till he's licked off all the cream. It's marvellous to me how Spinner and his sort can keep on devoting themselves to the old ambitions while the world's breaking up. Marvellous. Money, you mean? Personal aggrandisement. Well, answered Mr. Prohack with a judicial detached air, I've always found Spinner a very decent, agreeable chap. Oh, yes, agreed, agreed. They're all too confoundedly agreeable for anything. All that lot are. But surely he's honest. Quite. A straight a man has ever breathed, especially according to his own lights. All his enterprises are absolutely what is known as sound. They all make rich people richer, and in particular they make him richer. I bet even he's been feeling the pinch lately. They all have. Still, I expect old Spinner desires the welfare of the country just as much as anyone else. It's not all money with him. No, but did you ever know Spinner touch anything that didn't mean money in the first place? I never did. What he and his lot mean by the welfare of the country is the stability of the country as it is. They see the necessity for development, improvement in the social scheme. Oh, yes, they see it and admit it. Then they go to church, or they commune with heaven, on the golf course, and their prayer is, Give us needed change, O Lord, but not just yet. The pair moved to the morning room. Look here, said Mr. Prohack lightly, ignoring the earnestness in F.F.'s tone. Supposing you had a bit of money, say, eighty thousand pounds, and the chance to put it into one of old who's its schemes, what would you do? I should be ashamed to have eighty thousand pounds, F.F. replied with dark, whispering passion. And in any case, nothing would induce me to have any dealings with the gang. Are they all bad? They're all bad, all. They're all antisocial, all. They're all a curse to the country and to all mankind. F. F. had already rung the bell, and he now beckoned coldly to the waitress who entered the room. Everybody who supports the present government is guilty of a crime against human progress. Oh, bring me a glass of that brown sherry I had yesterday, you know the one, and three small pieces of cheese. Mr. Brohack went away to the telephone and got Paul Spinner at Smaith's office. "'I only wanted to tell you that I've decided to come into your show, if Smaith can arrange for the money. I've thought it all over carefully, and I'm yours, old boy.' He hung up the receiver immediately. 4. The excursion to the club had taken longer than Mr. Prohack had anticipated, and when he got back home it was nearly lunchtime. No sign of an eagle car or any other car in front of the house. Mr. Prohack let himself in. The sounds of a table being set came from the dining-room. He opened the door there. Machin met him at the door. Each withdrew from the other, avoiding a collision. "'Your mistress returned?' "'Yes, sir.' Machin seemed to hesitate, her mind disturbed. "'Where is she?' "'I was just coming to tell you, sir. She told me to say that she was lying down.' "'Oh!' Disdaining further to interrogate the servant, he hurried upstairs. He had to excuse himself to Eve, and he had also to justify to her the placing of eighty thousand pounds in a scheme which she could not possibly understand, and for which there was nothing whatever to show. She would approve, of course. She would say that she had complete confidence in his sagacity. But all the inflections of her voice, all her gestures and glances, would indicate to him that in her opinion he was a singularly ingenuous creature, the natural prey of sharpers and that the chances of their not being ruined by his incurable simplicity were exceedingly small. His immense reputation in the Treasury, his sinister fame as the terror of the departments, would not weigh an atom in her general judgment of the concrete case affecting the fortunes of the Prohack family. Then she would be brave, she would be bravely resigned to the worst. She would kiss his innocence, she would quite unconvincingly assure him, in her own vocabulary, that he was a devil of a fellow, and the smartest man in the world. Further, she would draw in the horns of her secret schemes of expenditure. She would say that she had intended to do so-and-so, and to buy so-and-so, but that perhaps it would be better, in view of the uncertainties of destiny, neither to do nor to buy so-and-so. 
In short, she would succeed in conveying to him the idea that to live with him was like being in an open boat with him, adrift in the middle of the stormy Atlantic. She loved to live with him. The compensations were exquisite. And moreover, what would be his fate if he were alone? Still, it was like being in an open boat with him adrift in the middle of the stormy Atlantic. And she would cling closer to him and point to the red sun setting among black clouds of tempest. And this would continue until he could throw, say, about a hundred and sixty thousand pounds into her lap, whereupon she would calmly assert that, in her opinion, he and she had really been safe all the while on the glassy lake of the Serpentine in a steamer. "'I ought to have thought of all that before,' he said to himself. "'And if I had, I should have bought houses, something for her to look at and touch. And even then she would have suggested that if I hadn't been a coward I could have done better than houses. She would have found in the Times every day instances of companies paying twenty and thirty per cent.' No, it would have been impossible for me to invest the money without losing her esteem for me as a man of business. I wish to heaven I hadn't got any money. So here goes. And he burst with assumed confidence into the bedroom, and simultaneously to intensify his unease, the notion that profiteering was profiteering, whether in war or in peace, and the notion that F.F. F. was a man of lofty altruistic ideals, surged through his distracted mind. Eve was lying on the bed. She looked very small on the bed, smaller than usual. At the sound of the door opening she said, without moving her head, he could not see her face from the door, "'Is that you, Arthur?' "'Yes. What's the matter?' "'Just put my cloak over my feet, will you?' He came forward and took the cloak off a chair. "'What's the matter?' he repeated, arranging the cloak. "'I'm not hurt, dearest. I assure you I'm not.' Not at all. She is speaking in a faint, weak voice, like a little child. Then you've had an accident. She glanced up at him sideways, timidly, compassionately, and nodded. You mustn't be upset. I told Machin to go on with her work and not to say anything to you about it. I preferred to tell you myself. I know how sensitive you are where I'm concerned. Mr. Prohack had to adjust his thoughts, somewhat violently, to the new situation, and he made no reply. But he was very angry about the mere existence of motor-cars. He felt that he had always had a prejudice against motor-cars, and that the prejudice was not a prejudice, because it was well founded. "'Darling, don't look so stern. It wasn't Carthew's fault. Another car ran into us. I told Carthew to drive in the park, and we went right round the park in about five minutes.' So as I felt sure you'd be a long time with that fat man, I had the idea of running down to Putney to see Sissy. Eve laughed nervously. I thought I might possibly bring her home with me. After the accident, Carthy put me into a taxi and I came back. Of course, he had to stay to look after the car. And then you weren't here when I arrived. Where are you going, dearest? I'm going to telephone for the doctor, of course, said Mr. Prohack quietly but very irritably. "'Oh, darling, I've sent for the doctor. He wasn't in, they said, but they said he'd be back quite soon, and then he'd come at once. I don't really need the doctor. I only sent for him because I knew you'd be so frightfully angry if I didn't.' Mr. Prohack had returned to the bed. He took his wife's hand. "'Feel my pulse. It's all right, isn't it?' "'I can't feel it at all.' "'Oh, Arthur, you never could. I can feel your hand trembling. That's what I can feel.' Now, please don't be upset, Arthur. I suppose the car's smashed. She nodded. It's a bit broken. Where was it? It was just on the other side of Putney Bridge, on the tram lines there. Carthy wasn't hurt? Oh, no, Carthy was simply splendid. How did it happen exactly? Oh, Arthur, you with your exactlies. Don't ask me. I'm too tired. Besides, I didn't see it. My eyes were shut. She closed her eyes. Suddenly she sat up and put her hand on his shoulder in a sort of appeal, vaguely smiling. He tried to smile, but could not. Then her hand dropped. A totally bewildered expression veiled the anxious kindness in her eyes. The blood left her face until her cheeks were nearly as white as the embroidered cloth on the night-table. Her eyes closed. She fell back. She fainted. She was just as if dead. A hand was as cold as the hand of a corpse. 
Such was Mr. Prague's vast experience of life that he had not the least idea what to do in this crisis. But he tremendously regretted that Angmering, Bishop, and the inventor of the motor-car had ever been born. He rushed out onto the landing and loudly shouted, Machin, Machin, ring that damned doctor again, and if he can't come, ring Dop Dr. Plot at once. Yes, sir, yes, sir. He rushed back into the bedroom, discovered Eve's smelling salts, and held them to her nose. Already the blood was mounting again. Well, she's not dead, anyway, he said to himself grimly. He could see the blood gently mounting, mounting. It was a wonderful, a mysterious, and a reassuring sight. I don't care so long as she isn't injured internally, he said to himself. Eve opened her eyes in a dazed look. Then she grinned as if apologetically. Then she cried copiously. Mr. Brough had heard a car outside. It was Dr. Vega's. The mere sound of Dr. Vega's car soothed Mr. Prohack, accused him of losing his head, and made a man of him. Dr. Vega entered the bedroom with exactly the same style as on his first visit to Mr. Prohack himself. He had heard the nature of the case from Machin on his way upstairs. He listened to Mr. Prohack, who spoke in the most deceitful way, as if he had been through scores of such affairs. Exactly, said Dr. Vega, examining the eve summarily. She sat up, the blood naturally left her head, and she fainted. Fainting is nothing but a withdrawing of blood from the head. Will you ring for that servant of yours, please? I'm positive I'm quite all right, doctor, Eve murmured. Will you kindly not talk, said he. If you're so positive you're all right, why did you send for me? Did you walk upstairs? Then your legs aren't broken, at least not seriously. <laughs> he laughed softly. But shortly afterwards, when Mr. Prohack, admirably dissembling his purposes, crept with dignity out of the room, Dr. Vega followed him and shut the door, leaving Machin busy within. "'I don't think there is any internal lesion,' said Dr. Vega, with seriousness. "'But I will not say it absolutely. She has had a very severe shock, and her nerves are considerably jarred.' "'But is nothing physical?' "'My dear sir, of course it's physical. Do you conceive the nerves are not purely physical organs?' I can't conceive them as anything but physical organs, can you? Mr. Prohack felt schoolboyish. It's you that she's upset about, though. Did you notice she motioned me to give you some of the brandy she must take? Very sweet of her, was it not? What are you going to do now? I'm going to fetch my daughter. Excellent. But have something before you go. You may not know it, but you have been using up nervous tissue which has to be replaced. As he was driving down to Putney in a taxi, Mr. Prohack certainly did feel very tired. But he was not so tired as not to insist on helping the engine of the taxi. He pushed the taxi forward all his might all the way to Putney. He pushed it till his arms ached, though his hands were in his pockets. The distance to Putney had incomprehensibly stretched to nine hundred and ninety-nine miles. He found Sissy in the studio giving a private lesson to a middle-aged gentleman, who ought, Mr. Prohack considered, to have been thinking of his latter end rather than of dancing. He broke up the lesson very abruptly. "'Your mother has had a motor accident. You must come at once.' Sissy came. "'Then it must have been about here,' said she, as the taxi approached Putney Bridge on the return journey. "'So it must. He certainly had not thought of the locus of the accident. He had merely pictured it in his own mind, according to his own frightened fancy. "'Yes, it must have been just about there.' and yet there was no sign of it in the roadway. Carthew must have had the wounded eagle removed. Mr. Brohack sat stern and silent. A wondrous woman, his wife. Absurd, possibly, about such matters as investments, but an angel. Her self-forgetfulness, her absorption in him. Staggering. The accident was but one more proof of it. He was greatly alarmed about her, for the doctor had answered for nothing. He seemed to have a thousand worries. He had been worried all his life, but the worries that had formed themselves in a trail to the inheritance were worse worries than the old simple ones. No longer did the thought of the inheritance brighten his mind. He somehow desired to go back to former days. Glancing askance at Sissy, he saw that she too was stern. He resumed the hard pushing of the taxi. It was not quite so hard as before, because he knew that Sissy also was pushing her full share. End of chapter 9
Chapter Ten of Mr. Prohack by Arnold Bennett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Chapter Ten: The Theory of Idleness. One. Within the next seven days, Mr. Prohack had reason to lose confidence in himself as an expert in human nature. After all, he reflected, I must have been a very simple-minded man to have thought that I thoroughly understood another human being. Every human being is infinite, and will beat your understanding in the end. The reference, of course, was to his wife. Since the automobile accident, she had become another person, and a more complex person. The climax, or what seemed to be the climax, came one cold morning when she and Mr. Prohack and Sissy and Dr. Vega were sitting together in the little boudoir beyond the bedroom. They were packed in there because Eve, otherwise Marion, had taken a fancy to the sofa. Eve was relating to the admired and trusting doctor all her peculiar mental and moral symptoms. She was saying that she could no longer manage the house, could not concentrate her mind on anything, could not refrain from strange caprices, could not remain calm, could not keep her temper, and was the worst conceivable wife for such a paragon as Arthur Prohack. Her daughter alone had saved the household organism from a catastrophe. Her daughter Sissy, "'Come here, Sissy.' Sissy obeyed the call, and was suddenly embraced by her mother with deep tenderness. This in front of the doctor. Still more curious was the fact that Sissy, of late her mother's frigid critic, came forward and responded to the embrace almost effusively. The spectacle was really touching. It touched Mr. Prohack, who yet felt as if the floor had yielded under his feet, and he was falling into the tube a railway underground. Indeed, Mr. Prohack had never had such sensations as drew and caught at him then. Well, said Dr. Vega to Mrs. Prohack in his philosophical, realistic manner, I've been marking time for a week. I shall now proceed to put you right. You can't sleep. You will sleep tonight. I shall send you something. I suppose it isn't your fault that you've taken the digestive tonic I sent you last thing at night under the impression that it was a sedative, in spite of the label. But it is regrettable. As for your headaches, I will provide a pleasing portion. As for this sad lack of application, don't attend application. As for your strain to caprices, indulge them. One thing is essential. You must go away to the sea. You must go to Frinton on sea. It is an easy journey. There is a Pullman car on the morning train, and the air is unrivalled for your, shall I say, idiosyncrasy. "'Yes, darling mother,' said Sissy, "'you must go away, and father and I will take you.' "'Of course,' confirmed Mr. Prohack, with an imitation of pettishness, as they had been steadily advocating a change of scene for days past. But he had done nothing of the kind. "'Oh!' Eve cried piteously. "'That is the one thing I can't do.' Dr. Vega laughed. "'Afraid of the expense, I suppose?' "'No,' Eve answered with seriousness. "'My husband had just made a very fortunate investment.' which means a profit of at least a hundred thousand pounds, like that. She snapped her fingers and laughed lightly. Here was another point to puzzle an expert in human nature. Instead of being extremely incredulous and apprehensive about the vast speculation with Sir Paul, Eve had in truth accepted it for a gold mine. She did not assume satisfaction. She really was satisfied. Her satisfaction was absurd, and nothing that Mr. Prohack could say would diminish it. She had already begun to spend the financial results of the speculation with enormous verve. For instance, she had hired another eagle, to take the place of the wounded eagle, without uttering a word to her husband of what she had done. Mr. Prohack could see the dregs of his bank balance, and in a dream he had had glimpses of a sinister edifice at the bottom of a steep slope, the building being the bankruptcy court. "'Is it a railway strike you're afraid of?' demanded Dr. Vega cruelly. And Eve replied with sweetness, "'I can't leave London until my son Charlie comes back from Glasgow, and he's written me to say he'll be here next week.' A first-rate example this of her new secretiveness. She had said absolutely nothing to Mr. Prohack about a letter from Charlie. "'When did you hear that?' Mr. Prohack might well have asked. But he was too loyal to her to betray her secretiveness by such a question. He did not wish the Portuguese quack to know that he, the husband, was kept in the dark about anything whatever. 
He had his ridiculous dignity, had Mr. Prohack, and all his motives were mixed motives, not a perfectly pure motive in the whole of his volitional existence. However, Sissy put the question in her young, blundering way. "'Oh, mother dear, you never told us.' "'I received the letter the day before yesterday,' Eve continued gravely, "'and Charlie is certainly not coming home to find me away.' For two entire days she'd had the important letter and had concealed it. Mr. Prohack was disturbed. "'Oh, very well,' Dr. Vega concurred. "'It doesn't really matter whether you go to Frinton now or next month, or even next year but one. You're a powerful woman, and you'll last a long time yet, especially if you don't worry. I won't go for about a week, and if you'd like to consult another doctor, do.' He smiled at her in an avuncular manner, and rose. Whereupon Mr. Prohack also jumped up. "'I'm not worrying.' she protested, with a sweet, pathetic, answering smile. "'Yes, I am. Yes, I am. I'm worrying because I know I'm worrying my poor husband.' She went quickly to her poor husband, and kissed him lavishly. Eve was an artist in kissing, and never a greater artist than at the moment. And now Mr. Prohack, though still to the physical eye a single individual, became two Mr. Prohacks. There was the Mr. Prohack who strongly deprecated this departure from the emotional reserve which is one of the leading and sublimest characteristics of the British governing class. And there was the Mr. Prohack, all nerves and heart and humanity, who profoundly enjoyed the demonstration of a woman's affection, disordered and against the rules though the demonstration might be. The first Mr. Prohack blushed and hated himself for blushing. The second was quite simply enraptured and didn't care who knew it. "'Dr. Vega, Eve appealed, clinging to Mr. Prohack's coat, it is my husband who needs looking after. He's not making any progress, and it is my fault. And let me tell you that you've been neglecting him for me. She was a dramatic figure of altruism, of the everlasting sacrificial feminine. She was quite possibly absurd. But beyond doubt, she was magnificent. Mr. Brohack felt ashamed of himself, and the more ashamed because he considered that he was, was in quite tolerable health. Mother! murmured Sissy, with the sweetness of which Mr. Prohack had imagined her to be utterly incapable. "'Come and sit down.' And Eve, guided by her daughter, the callous, home-deserting, dancing mistress, came and sat down. 2. "'My dear sir,' said Dr. Vega, "'there is nothing at all to cause alarm. She will gradually recover, believe me.' He and Mr. Prohack and Sissy were conspiring together in the dining-room, the drawing-room being at that hour, and on that day, under the dominion of servants with brushes. "'But what's the matter with her? What is it?' "'A uh, merely neurasthenia, traumatic neurasthenia.' "'But what's that?' Mr. Prohack spoke low, just as though his wife could overhear from the boudoir above, and was listening to them under the impression that they were plotting against her life. "'It's uh, a morbid condition due to a violent shock.' "'But how?' You told me the other day that it was purely physical. Oh, well, said Dr. Vega, it is, because it must be. But I assure you that if a post-mortem were to be held on Mrs. Prohack— Oh, doctor, please! Sissy stopped him resentfully. The doctor paused and then continued. There will be no trace of any morbid condition in any of the organs. Then how do you explain it? Uh, we don't explain it, cried Dr. Vega suddenly throwing the onus on the whole medical profession. We can't! We don't know! It's very, very unsatisfactory, all this ignorance. It certainly is. But did you suppose that medical science, alone among all sciences, had achieved finality and omniscience? We've reached the state of knowing that we don't know, and that's something. I hope I'm not flattering you by talking like this. I only do it to people whom I suspect to be intelligent. But, of course, if you prefer the omniscient bedside manner, you can have it without extra charge. Mr. Prohack thought, frightened. I shall be making a friend of this quack soon, if I'm not careful. And, by the way, about your health, Dr. Vega proceeded, after having given further assurances as to his other patient. Mrs. Prohack was perfectly correct. You are not making progress. The fact is, you are bored. You haven't organized your existence and the lack of organization is reacting on your health. "'Something is reacting on his health,' Sissy put in. "'I'm not at all pleased.' 
She was now not Mr. Prohack's daughter, but his aunt. "'How can I organise my existence?' Mr. Prohack burst out crossly. "'I haven't got any existence to organise. I haven't got anything to do. I thought I had too much to do the other day. Illusion. Of course I'm bored. I feel all right, but bored I am, and it's your fault.' "'It is,' the doctor admitted. "'It is my fault. I took you for a person of common sense, and so I didn't tell you that two and two makes four, and a lot more important things of the same sort. I ought to have told you. You've taken on the new profession of being idle. It's essential for you, but you aren't treating it seriously. You have to be a professionally idle man, which means that you haven't got a moment to spare. When I advised you to try idleness, I didn't mean you to be idle idly. That's worse than useless. You've got to be idle busily. You aren't doing half enough. Do you ever have a Turkish bath? No, never could bear the idea of them. Well, you will kindly take two Turkish baths a week. You can be massaged at the same time. A Turkish bath is as good as a day's hunting, as far as exercise goes. But you must have more exercise. Do you dance? Oh, I see you don't. You had better begin dancing. There is no finer exercise. I absolutely prescribe it. At this juncture, Mr. Prohack was rather relieved that the sound of an unaccustomed voice in the hall drew his daughter out of the dining-room. When she had gone, Dr. Vega went on in a more confidential tone. "'There's another point. An idle man who really knows his business will visit his tailors, his hosiers, his bootmakers, his barbers, more oftener and much more conscientiously than you do. You've got a mind above clothes, of course. So have I. I take a wicked pleasure in being picturesquely untidy. But I'm not a patient. My life is a great lark. Yours isn't. Yours is serious. You have now a serious profession. Idleness. Bring your mind down to clothes. I say this partly because to be consistently well-dressed means much daily expenditure of time, and partly because really good clothes have a distinctly curative effect on the patient who wears them. And then again, Mr. Prohack was conscious of a sudden joyous uplifting of the spirit. Here, said he, interrupting Dr. Vega with a grand gesture, have a cigar. I cannot, my friend. Dr. Vega looked at his watch. You must have a corona. Mr. Prohack moved to the cigar cabinet which he had recently purchased. Uh, no, my next patient is evading me in Hyde Park Gardens at this moment. Let him die, exclaimed Mr. Prohack ruthlessly. You've got to have a cigar with me. Look, I'll compromise. I'll make it a half corona. You can charge me as if for another consultation. The doctor's foreign eyes twinkled as he sat down and struck a match. You thought I was a quack, he said maliciously, and maliciously he seemed to intensify his foreign accent. I did, admitted Mr. Prohack with candour. So I am, said Dr. Vega. But I'm a fully qualified quack, and all very good doctors are quacks. They have to be. They wouldn't be worth anything if they weren't. Medicine owes a great deal to quacks. Tell me something about one of your cases, said Mr. Prohack imperatively. You're one of the most interesting men I've ever met. So now you know. We want some of your blood transfused into the English character. You've got a soul above medicine as well as clothes. All good doctors have, said Dr. Vega. My life is a romance. And so shall mine be, said Mr. Prohack. 3. When at length Mr. Prohack escorted Dr. Vega out into the hall, he saw Sissy kissing Eliza Brating with much affection on the front doorstep. They made an elegant group for a moment, and then Eliza Brating departed hurriedly, disappearing across the street behind Dr. Vega's attendant car. "'Now I'll just repeat once more to both of you,' resumed Dr. Vega, embracing father and daughter in one shrewd glance. "'You've nothing to worry about upstairs.' He indicated the boudoir by a movement of his somewhat tousled head. "'But you've got just a little to worry about here,' and he indicated Mr. Prohack. "'I know,' said Sissy with assurance. "'But I shall look after him, Doctor. You can rely on me. I understand both cases.' "'Well, there's one good thing,' said Sissy, following her father into the dining-room after the doctor had gone. "'I've done with that foolish Eliza. I knew it couldn't last, and it hasn't. Unless I'm there all the time to keep my eye on everything, 
Of course it all goes to pieces. That girl is the biggest noodle. But haven't I just seen you and her joined in the deepest affection? Oh, naturally I had to kiss her. But I've finished with her. And what's more, she knows what I think of her. She never liked me. Sissy, said Mr. Prohack, you shock me. And indeed he was genuinely shocked, for he had always thought that Sissy was different from other girls, that she had all the feminine qualities without any of the feminine defects. Yes, he had thought that she might develop into a creature more perfect even than Marian. And here she was, talking and behaving exactly as men at the club would relate of their own conventional women. Sissy gazed firmly at her father, as if it were half in pity and half in disdain. Did the innocent fellow not then understand the nature of women? Or was he too sentimental to admit it, too romantic to be a realist? "'Would you believe,' said Cissy, "'that although I was there last night and told her exactly what to do, she's had a quarrel this morning with the landlord of the studio? Well, she has. You know the A.R.A. on the first floor has been making a lot of silly complaints about the noise, music and so on, every night? And some other people have complained. I could have talked the landlord round in ten minutes.' Eliza doesn't merely not talk him round. She quarrels with him. Of course it's all up. And if that wasn't enough, a county council inspector has been round asking about a music and dancing licence. We shall either have to give up business altogether, or else move somewhere else. Eliza says she knows of another studio. Well, I shall write to her tonight and tell her she can have my share of the fittings and furniture and go where she likes, but I shan't go with her. And if she never liked me, I can honestly say I never liked her and I don't want to run a dancing studio any more either. Why should I, after all? We were the new poor. Now we're the new rich. Well, we may as well be the new rich. Mr. Prohack was now still more shocked. Nay, he was almost frightened. And yet he wasn't either shocked or frightened in the centre of his soul. He was rather triumphant. Not about his daughter with the feet of clay, but about himself. "'But I shan't give up teaching dancing entirely,' said Sissy. "'No?' he wondered what would come next. "'No, I shall teach you.' "'Indeed you won't,' he instinctively recoiled. "'Yes, I shall. I promised the doctor he could rely on me. "'You'll buy a gramophone, and we'll have the carpet up at the drawing-room.' "'Oh, you startled dear, do you want to run back into the depths of the forest? "'Father, you are the funniest father that ever was.' She marched to him and put her hand on his shoulder, and just twitched his beard. "'I can look after you quite as well as Mother can. We're pals, aren't we?' Well, "'Yes, like the tiger and the lamb. You've got hold of my silky fleece already.' Four. Mr. Prohack sat in the dining-room, alone. The room was now heated by an electric radiator which Eve had just bought for the sake of economy. But her economy was the economy of the rich for the amount of expensive current consumed by that radiator was prodigious, while the saving it effected in labour, cleanliness, and atmospheric purity could certainly not have been measured without a scientific instrument adapted to the infinitely little. Still, Machin admired and loved it. Mr. Prohack perceived that all four bars of it were brightly incandescent, whereas three bars would have been ample to keep the room warm. He ought to get up and turn a bar off. He had a hundred preoccupations. His daughter had classed him with the new rich. He resented the description, but could he honestly reject it? All his recent troubles sprang from the new riches. If he had not inherited from a profiteer, he would assuredly have been at his office in the Treasury, earning an honest living, at that very moment. For only sick persons of plenteous independent means are ever prescribed for, as he had been prescribed for. The others either go on working, making the best of such health as is left to them, or they die. If he had not inherited from a profiteer, he would not have had a car, and the car would not have had an accident, and he would not have been faced with the prospect, as he was faced with it, of a legal dispute, to be fought by him on behalf of the insurance company with the owner of the colliding car. The owner of the colliding car was a young woman, as to whose veracity Carthew had yet had some exceedingly hard things to say. Mr. Prohack would have settled the matter, but neither Eve nor the insurance company would let him settle it. And if the car had not had an accident, Eve would not have had her traumatic neurasthenia, with all its disconcerting reactions on family life, 
and if he had not inherited from a profiteer, Charlie would not have gone off to Glasgow. He had heard odds and ends of strange tales as to Charlie's doings in Glasgow, not in the least reassuring. And, if he had not inherited from a profiteer, Sissy would not have taken a share in a dancing studio, and might never have dangerously danced with that worm Oswald Murphy. And if he had not inherited from a profiteer, he would not have been speculating, with a rich chance of more profiteering, in Romanian oil with Paul Spinner. In brief, well, he ought to get up and turn off a bar of that wasteful radiator. Yet he was uplifted, happy. Not because of his wealthy ease. No. A week or two ago he'd only to think of his fortune to feel uplifted and happy. But now? No, he was uplifted and happy now for the simple reason that he caught the romance of the doctor's idea of taking idleness seriously and practising it as a profession. If circumstances forced him to be idle, he would be idle in the grand manner. He would do everything that the doctor had suggested, and more. The doctor saw life like a poet. He might be a cross between a comedian and a mountebank, but he was a great fellow. Every species of idleness should have its appointed hour. In the pursuit of idleness he would become the busiest man in London. A definite programme would be necessary, strict routine would be necessary, no more loafing about. He hankered after routine as the drunkard after alcohol. Routine was what he had been missing. The absence of routine, and naught else, was retarding his memory. Yes, he knew in his heart that what they all said was true. He was not getting better. His own daughter had taught him wisdom. Inevitably, unavoidably, he was the new rich. Well, he would be the new rich thoroughly. No other aim was logical. Let the radiator burn. End of chapter 10《11》of《Mr. Prohack》by Arnold Bennett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Chapter 11 Neurasthenia Cured. 1. Three days later, Mr. Prohack came home late with his daughter in the substituted car. He had accompanied Sissy to Putney for the final disposition of the affairs of the dance studio, and had witnessed her blighting politeness to Eliza Brating and Eliza Brating's blighting politeness to her. The last kiss between these two young women would have desolated the heart of any man whose faith in human nature was less strong than Mr. Prohack's. "'I trust that the excellent Eliza is not disfigured for life,' he had observed calmly in the automobile. "'What are you talking about, father?' Sissy had exclaimed, suspicious. "'I was afraid her lips might be scorched. You feel no pain yourself, my child, I hope?' He made the sound of a kiss. After this there was no more conversation in the car during the journey. Arrived home, Sissy said nonchalantly that she was going to bed. "'Burn my lips first, Mr. Prohack implored. "'Father,' said she, having kissed him, "'you are simply terrible.' "'I am a child,' he replied, "'and you are my grandmother.' "'You wait till I give you your next dancing lesson,' Sissy retorted, turning and threatening him from the stairs. It won't be as mild as this afternoon's. He smiled, giving an imitation of the Sphinx. He was happy enough as mortals go. His wife was perhaps a little better, and he was gradually launching himself into an industrious career of idleness. Also he had broken the ice, the ice, that is to say, of tuition in dancing. Not a word had been spoken abroad in the house about the first dancing lesson. He had had it while Mrs. Prohack was, in theory at least, paying calls. At any rate, she had set forth in the car. Mr. Prohack and Sissy had rolled up the drawing-room carpet and moved the furniture themselves. Mr. Prohack had unpacked the gramophone in person. They had locked the drawing-room door. At the end of the lesson they had relayed the carpet and replaced the furniture and enclosed the gramophone and unlocked the door, and Mr. Prohack had issued from the drawing-room like a criminal. The thought in his mind had been that he was no end of a dog, and of a brave dog at that. Then he sneered at himself for thinking such a foolish thought. After all, what was there in learning to dance? But the sneer was misplaced. His original notion that he had done something courageous and wonderful was just a notion. The lesson had favoured the new, nascent intimacy with his daughter. Evidently she was a born teacher, as well as a born dancer. 
he perceived in two minutes how marvellous her feet were. She guided him with pressures light as a feather. She allowed herself to be guided with an intuitive responsiveness that had to be felt to be believed. Her exhortations were delicious, her reprimands exquisite, her patience was infinite. Further, she said that he had what she called natural rhythm, and would learn easily and satisfactorily. Best of all, he had been immediately aware of the physical benefit of the exercise. The household was supposed to know naught of the affair, but the kitchen knew a good deal about it somehow. The kitchen was pleasantly and rather condescendingly excited, and a little censorious, for the reason that nobody in the kitchen had ever before lived in a house, the master of which, being a parent of adult children, took surreptitious lessons in dancing. The thing was unprecedented, and therefore, of course, intrinsically reprehensible. Mr. Prohack guessed the attitude of the kitchen, and had met Machin's respectful glance with a self-conscious eye-eye. He now bolted the front door, and went upstairs, extinguishing the lights after him. Eve had told her husband and child that she would go to bed early. He meant to have a frolicsome, teasing chat with her, for the doctor had laid it down that light conversation would assist the cure of traumatic neurasthenia. She would not be asleep, and even if she were asleep, she would be glad to awaken, because she admired his style of gossip when both of them were in the vein for it. He would describe for her the evening at the studio humorously, in such a fashion as to confirm in her her righteous belief that the misguided sissy had seen the maternal wisdom and quitted dance studios for ever. The lamps were out in the bedroom. She slept. He switched on a light. It had not been occupied. Marion, he called in a low voice, thinking that she might be in the boudoir. And if she was in the boudoir, she must be reclining in the dark there. He ascertained that she was not in the boudoir. Then he visited both the drawing-room and the dining-room. No Marion anywhere. He stood for a moment in the hall, and was in a mind to ring for Machin. He could see from a vague illumination at the entrance to the basement steps that the kitchen was still inhabited. But just then all the servants came upwards on the way to the attics, and at the strange spectacle of their dancing master in the hall, they all grew constrained and either coughed or hurried as though they ought not to be caught in the act of retiring to bed. Mr. Prohack, as it were, threw a lasso over Machin, who was the last of the procession. "'Where is your mistress, Machin?' But something unusual in his tone apparently startled her. "'She's gone to bed, sir. She told me to put her hot water bag in the bed early.' "'Oh, thanks. Uh, good night.' "'Good night, sir.' He could not persuade himself to call an alarm. He could not even inform Machin that she was mistaken, for to do so would have been equivalent to calling an alarm. Hesitating and inactive, he allowed the black-and-white damsels and the blue cook to disappear. Nor would he disturb Sissy, yet. He had first to get used to the singular idea that his wife had vanished from home. Could this vanishing be one of the effects of traumatic neurasthenia? He hurried about and searched all the rooms again, looking with absurd carefulness, as if his wife were an insignificant object that might have dropped unperceived under a chair or behind a couch. Then he telephoned to her sister, inquiring in a voice of studied casualness. Eve was not at her sister's. He had known all the while that she would not be at her sister's. Being unable to recall the number, he had had to consult the telephone book. His instinct now was to fetch Sissy whose common sense had of late impressed him more and more. But he repressed the instinct, holding that he ought to be able to manage the affair alone. He could scarcely say to his daughter, "'Your mother has vanished. What am I to do?' Moreover, feeling himself to be the guardian of Marion's reputation for perfect sanity, he desired not to divulge her disappearance unless obliged to do so. She might return at any moment. She might return very soon. It was inconceivable that anything should have happened in the Prohack family. Almost against his will he looked up police stations in the telephone book. There were scores of police stations. The nearest seemed to be that of Mayfair. He demanded the number. To demand the number of the police station was just like jumping into bottomless cold water. In a detestable dream he gave his name and address, and asked if the police had any news of a street accident. Yes, several. He described his wife. 
He said, reflecting wildly, that she was not very tall and rather plump. Dark hair. Dress? Uh, dark blue. Hat and mantle? He could not say. Age? A queer impulse here. He knew that she hated the mention of her real age, and so he said, Thirty-nine. No, the police had no news of such a person. But the polite, firm voice on the wire said that it would telephone to other stations and would let Mr. Prowcourt hear immediately if there was anything to communicate. Wonderful organisation, the London police force. As he hung up the receiver, he realised what had occurred and what he had done. Marion had mysteriously disappeared, and he had informed the police. He, Arthur Prohack, C.B. What an awful event! His mind ran on the consequences of traumatic neurasthenia. He put on his hat and overcoat and unbolted the front door as silently as he could, for he still did not want anybody in the house to know the secret, and went out into the street. What to do? Ridiculous move! Did he expect to find her lying in the gutter? He walked to the end of the dark street and peered into the cross street, and returned. He had left the front door open. As he re-entered the house, he described in a corner of the hall a screwed-up telegraph envelope. Why had he not noticed it before? He snatched at it. It was addressed to Mrs. Prohack. Mr. Prohack's soul was instantaneously bathed in heavenly solace. Traumatic neurasthenia had nothing to do with Eve's disappearance. His bliss was intensified by the fact that he had said not a word to the servants and had not called Sissy, and it was somewhat impaired by the other fact that he had been ass enough to tell the police. He was just puzzling his head to think what misfortune could have called his wife away. Not that the prospect of any misfortune much troubled him now that Eve's vanishing was explained. When through the doorway he saw a taxi drive up. Eve emerged from the taxi. 2. He might have gone out and paid the fare for her, but he stayed where he was in the doorway, thinking with beatific relief that after all nothing had happened in the family. Ah, he said in the most ordinary, complacent, quite undisturbed tone, I just am beginning to wonder where you've got to. We've been back about five minutes, Sissy and I, and Sissy's gone to bed. I really don't believe she knows you were out. Mrs. Prohack came urgently towards him, pushing the door to behind her with a careless, loud bang. The bang might wake up the entire household, but Mrs. Prohack did not care. Mrs. Prohack kissed him without a word. He possessed in his heart a barometric scale of her kisses, and this was a set fair kiss, a kiss with a somewhat violent beginning and a reluctant close. Then she held her cheek for him to kiss. Both cheek and lips were freshly cold from the night air. Mr. Prohack was aware of an immense romantic felicity, and he immediately became flippant, not aloud, but secretly, to hide himself from himself. He thought, It's a positive fact that I've been kissing this girl of a woman for a quarter of a century, and she's fat. But beneath his flippancy, and beneath his felicity, there was a lancinating calm, which, if he had expressed it, he would have expressed thus. If anything did happen to her, it would be the absolute ruin of me. The truth was that his felicity frightened him. Never before had he been seriously concerned for her well-being. The reaction from grave alarm lightened up the interior of his mysterious soul with a revealing flash of unique intensity. "'What were all these lights burning for?' she murmured. Lights were indeed burning everywhere. He'd been in a mood to turn on, but not to turn off. "'Oh,' he said, "'I was just wandering about.' "'I'll go straight upstairs,' she said, trying to be as matter-of-fact as her Arthur appeared to be. When he had gradually set the whole of the ground floor to rights, he followed her. She was waiting for him in the boudoir. She had removed her hat and mantle, and lighted one of the new radiators, and was sitting on the sofa. "'There came a telegram from Charlie,' she began. "'I was crossing the hall just as the boy reached the door. So I opened the door myself. It was from Charlie to say that he would be at the Grand Babylon Hotel tonight. "'Charlie? The Grand Babylon? Not Buckingham Palace?' Eve ignored his crude jocularity. "'It seems I ought to have received it early in the afternoon. I was so puzzled I didn't know what to do. I just put all my things on and went off to the hotel at once. It wasn't till after I was in the taxi that I remembered I ought to have told the servants where I was going. That's why I hurried back. 
I wanted to get back before you did. Charlie suggested telephoning from the hotel, but I wouldn't let him on any account. Why not? Well, I thought you might be upset and wonder what on earth was going on. What was going on? Mr. Prohack repeated, gazing at her childlike maternal serious face, whose wistfulness affected him in an extraordinary way. What on earth are you insinuating? No, it was inconceivable that this pulsating girl perched on the sofa should be the mother of the mature and independent Charles. Charlie's staying at the Grand Babylon Hotel, said Eve, as though she was saying that Charlie had forged a cheque or blown up the senator. Even the imperturbable man of the world in front of her momentarily blenched at the news. More fool him, observed Mr. Brahack. Yes, and he's got a bedroom and a private sitting-room and a bathroom and a room for a secretary. Hence a secretary, Mr. Brahack put in. Yes, and a secretary. And he dictates things to the secretary all the time, and the telephone's always going. Yes, even at this time of night. He must be spending enormous sums. So, of course, I hurry back to tell you. You did quite right, my pet, said Mr. Brohack. A good wife should share these tidbits with her husband at the earliest possible moment. He was really very like what in his more conventional moments he would have said a woman was like. If Eve had taken the affair lightly, he would without doubt have remonstrated, explaining that such an affair ought by no means to be taken lightly. But seeing that she took it very seriously, his instinct was to laugh at it, though in fact he was himself extremely perturbed by this piece of news which confirmed, a hundredfold, and in the most startling manner, certain sinister impressions of his own concerning Charlie's deeds in Glasgow. And he assumed the gay attitude, not from a desire to reassure his wife, but from mere contrariness. Positive of the strangest husband that ever lived, and entirely different from normal husbands. Then he saw the tears hanging in Eve's eyes. Tears not of resentment against his lack of sympathy, tears of bewilderment and perplexity. She simply did not understand his attitude. And he sat down close by her on the sofa, and solaced her with three kisses. She was singularly attractive in her alternations of sagacity and helplessness. "'But it's awful,' she whimpered. "'The boy must be throwing money away at the rate of twenty or twenty-five pounds a day.' "'Very probably,' Mr. Prohack agreed. "'Where's he getting it from?' she demanded. He must be getting it from somewhere. I expect he's made it. He's rather clever, you know. But he can't have made money like that. People do, sometimes. Not honestly. You know what I mean, Arthur. This was an earthquaking phrase to come from a mother's lips. And yet, said Mr. Prohack, everything Charlie did used to be right for you. But he's carrying on just like an adventurer. I've read in reports of trials about people carrying on just like that. A fortnight ago he hadn't got fifty pounds cash in the world, and now he's living like a millionaire at the Grand Babylon Hotel. Arthur, what are you going to do about it? Couldn't you go and see him tonight? Now listen to me, Mr. Prohack began in a new tone, taking her hands. Supposing I did go and see him tonight, what could I say to him? Well, you're his father. And you're his mother. What did you say to him? Oh, I didn't say anything. I only said I should have been very glad if he could have arranged to sleep at home, as usual. And he said he was sorry he couldn't, because he was so busy. You didn't tell him he was carrying on like an adventurer. Arthur, how could I? But you'd like me to tell him something of the sort. All that I can say, you could say. And that is, inquire in a friendly way what he has done, is doing, and hopes to do. But, yes, my innocent creature, you may well pause. He caressed her, and she tried to continue in her happiness, but could not. You pause, because there is nothing to say. You're his father at any rate, she burst out triumphantly. That's not his fault. You ought to have thought all this over twenty years ago, before Charlie was born, before you were married, before you met me. To become a parent is to accept terrible risks. I'm Charlie's father. Well, what then? Am I to give him orders as to what he must do and what he mustn't? This isn't China, and it isn't the eighteenth century. He owes nothing whatever to me, or to you. If he was starving, and he had plenty, he would probably consider it his duty to look after us. 
but that's the limit of what he owes us, whereas nothing can put an end to our responsibility towards him. You see, we brought him here. We thought it would be nice to have children, and so Charlie arrived. He didn't choose his time, and he didn't choose his character, nor his education, nor his chance. If he had his choice, you may depend he'd have chosen differently. Do you want me, on the top of all that, to tell him that he must immediately accept something else from us, our code of conduct? It would be mere cheek, and with all my shortcomings I am incapable of impudence, especially to the young. He was our slave for nearly twenty years. We did what we liked with him. And if Charlie fails now, it simply means that we've failed. Besides, how can you be sure that he's carrying on like an adventurer? He may be carrying on like a financial genius. Perhaps we have brought a giant to earth. We can't believe it, of course, because we haven't got enough faith in ourselves, but later on we may be compelled to believe it. Naturally, if Charlie crashes after a showy flight, then he won't be a financial genius. He'll only be an adventurer. And there may be some slight trouble in the law courts. <laughs> there usually is. That is where we shall have to come forward and pay for the nice feeling of having children. And remember, we shan't be in a position to upbraid Charlie. He could silence us for with one question to which we could find no answer. Why did you get married, you two? However, my pet, let us hope for the best. It's not yet a crime to live at great price at the Grand Babylon Hotel. Quite possibly your son has not yet committed any crime, whatever. If he succeeds in making a huge fortune and in keeping it, he will not commit any crime. Rich men never do. They can't. They never even commit murder. There's no reason why they should. Whatever they do, it is no worse than an idiosyncrasy. Now tell me what your son was talking about. Well, he didn't talk much. He... He wasn't expecting me. Did he ask after me? I told him about you. He asked about the car. He didn't ask after me, but he asked after the car. Nothing very original there, is there? Any son would behave like that. He must do better than that if he doesn't mean to end as an adventurer. I must go and see him and offer him, very respectfully, some advice. Arthur, I insist that he shall come here. It is not proper that you should go running after him. Pooh, my dear, I am rich enough myself to run after him without being accused of snobbishness or lawn hunting or anything of that kind. Oh, Arthur, sobbed Eve, don't you think you've been fighting quite long enough? She then openly wept. The singular Mr. Prahack was apparently not in the least moved by his wife's tears. He and she alone in the house were out of bed. There was no chance of their being disturbed. He did not worry about his adventurous son. He did not worry about the possibility of Oswald Morphy having a desire to convert his daughter into Mrs. Oswald Morphy. He did not worry about the fate of the speculation in which he had joined Sir Paul Spinner. Nor did he worry about the malady called traumatic neurasthenia. As for himself, he fancied that he had not for years felt better than he felt at that moment. He was aware of the most delicious sensation of sharing a perfect paternal solitude with his wife. He drew her towards him until her acquiescent head lay against his waistcoat. He held her body in his arms, and came deliberately to the conclusion that to be alive was excellent. Eve's body was as yielding as that of a young girl. To Mr. Prohack, who of course was the dupe of an illusion, it had an absolutely enchanting girlishness. She sobbed and she sobbed, and Mr. Prohack left her sob. He loosed the grip of his arms a little, so that her face free of his waistcoat, was turned upwards in the direction of the ceiling, and then he very caressingly wiped her eyes with his own handkerchief. He gave an elaborate care to the wiping of her eyes. For some minutes it was a Sisyphean labour, for what he did she immediately undid. But after a time the sobs grew less frequent, and at length they ceased. Only her lips trembled at intervals. Mr. Prohack said ingratiatingly, and whose fault is it if I'm funny? Answer you which. I don't know, Eve murmured tremblingly and not quite articulately. It's your fault. Do you know that you gave me the fright of my life tonight, going out without saying where you were going to? Do you know that you put me into such a state of, that I've been telephoning to police stations to find out whether there have been any street accidents happening to a woman of your description? 
I was so upset that I don't even go upstairs and call Sissy. You said you'd only been back five minutes when I came, Eve observed in a somewhat firmer voice. I did, said Mr. Prohack, but that was neither more nor less than a downright lie. You see, I was in such a state that I had to pretend to both you and myself that things aren't what they are. And then, without the slightest warning, you suddenly arrive without a scratch on you. You aren't hurt. You aren't even dead. It's a scandalous shame that a woman should be able, by merely arriving in a taxi, to put a sensible man into such a paroxysm of satisfaction as you put me into a whole while ago. It's not right. It's not fair. Then you try to depress me with bluggy stories of your son's horrible opulence. And when you discover you can't depress me, you burst into tears and accuse me of being funny. What did you expect me to be? Did you expect me to groan because you aren't lying dead in a mortuary? If I'm funny, you are at liberty to attract it to hysteria, the hysteria of joy. But I wish you to understand that these extreme revulsions of feeling which you impose on me are very dangerous for a plain man who is undergoing a rest cure. Eve raised her arms about Mr. Prohack's neck, lifted herself up by them, and silently kissed him. Then she sank back to her former position. "'I've been a great trial to you lately, haven't I?' she breathed. "'Not more so than usual,' he answered. "'You know you always abuse your power.' "'But I have been queer.' "'Well,' judiciously, "'perhaps you have. Perhaps five per cent or so above your average of queerness.' "'Didn't the doctor say what I got was traumatic neurasthenia?' "'That, or something equally absurd.' "'Well, I haven't got it any more. I'm cured. You'll see.' Just then the dining-room clock entered upon its lengthy business of chiming the hour of midnight, and as it faintly chimed, Mr. Prohack, supporting his wife, had a surpassing conviction of the beauty of existence, and in particular of his own good fortune, though the matter of his inheritance never once entered his mind. He gazed down at Eve's ingenuous features, and saw in them the fastidious fineness which had caused her to recoil so sensitively from her son's display of the Grand Babylon. Yes, women had a spiritual beauty to which men could not pretend. Arthur, said she, I never told you you'd forgotten to wind up that clock on Sunday night. It stopped this evening while you were out, and I had to wind it, and I only guessed what the time was. End of chapter 11《Chapter Twelve of Mr. Prohack by Arnold Bennett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Chapter Twelve: The Practice of Idleness. One. At ten minutes to eleven the next morning, Mr. Prohack rushed across the pavement and sprang head first into the original Eagle, now duly repaired, with the velocity and agility of a man long accustomed to the fact that seconds are more precious than sixpences a minute than banknotes. And Carthew slammed the door on him like a conjurer performing the final act of a trick before an audience of three thousand people. Mr. Prohack was late. He was late on this, the first full day of his career, as a consciously and scientifically idle man. Carthew knew that his employer was late, and certainly the people in his house knew that he was late. Mr. Prohack's breakfast in bed had been late, which meant that his suggestive and preposeful hour of newspaper reading was thrown forward. And then he had actually been kept out of his own bathroom through the joint fault of Sissy and her mother, who had apparently determined to celebrate Sissy's definite release from the dance studio, and Mrs. Prohack's astonishing recover from traumatic neurasthenia, by a thorough visitation and reorganization of the house and household. Those two, re-established in each other's affection, had been holding an inquisition in the bathroom, of all rooms, at the very moment when Mr. Prohack needed the same, with the consequence that he found the bath empty instead of full, and the geezer not even lighted. Yet they well knew that he had a highly important appointment at the tailor's at 10.45, followed by other just as highly important appointments. The worst of it was that he could not take their crime seriously, because he was on such intimate and conspiratorial terms with each of them separately. On the previous evening he had exchanged wonderful and rather dangerous confidences with his daughter, and further on, in the night, he and her mother 
had decided that the latter's fantastic excursion to the Grand Babylon Hotel should remain a secret. And Sissy, as much as her mother, had taken advantage of his helplessness in the usual unscrupulous feminine manner. They went so far as to smile quasi-maternally at his boyish busyness. Now, no sooner had Carthew slammed the door of the eagle and got into the driving seat, than a young woman, a perfect stranger to Mr. Prohack, appeared, and through the open window asked in a piteous childlike voice if Mr. Prohack was indeed Mr. Prohack, and having been informed that this was so, expressed the desire to speak with him. Mr. Prohack was beside himself with annoyance and thwarted energy. Was the entire universe uniting against the execution of his programme? "'I have a most important appointment,' said he, raising his hat and achieving politeness by an enormous effort. "'And if your business is urgent, you'd better get into the car. I'm going to Conduit Street.' She slipped into the car like a snake, and Carthew, beautifully unaware that he had two passengers, simultaneously drove off. If a snake, she was a very slim, blushing, and confused snake, short, too, for a python and she had a turned-up nose, and was quite young. Her scales were stylish, and although certainly abashed, apprehensive, and timorous, she yet had, about her delicate mouth, the signs of terrible determination, of ruthlessness, of an ambition that nothing could thwart. Mr. Prohack might have been alarmed, but fortunately he was getting used to driving in closed cars with young women, and so could keep his nerve. Moreover, he enjoyed these experiences, being a man of simple tastes, and not too analytical of good fortune when it came his way. "'It's very good of you to see me like this,' said the girl, in the voice of a rapid brook with a pebbly bed. "'My name is Winstock, and I've called about the car.' "'The car? What car?' "'The motor-car accident at Putney, you know.' "'Ah, yes. Just so, just so. You are the owner-driver of the other car.' "'Yes.' I think you ought to have seen my wife. It was really she who is the owner of this car. As you are aware, I wasn't in the accident myself, and I don't know anything about it. Besides, it's entirely in the hands of the insurance company and the solicitors. You are employing a solicitor, aren't you? Oh, yes. Then I suppose it's by his advice that you've come to see me. Well, I'm afraid it isn't. What? cried Mr. Prohack. If it isn't by his advice, you may well be afraid. Do you know you've done a most improper thing? most improper. I can't possibly listen to you. You may go behind your lawyer's back, but I can't. And also there's the insurance company. Mr. Prohack lifted the rug which had fallen away from her short skirts. I think solicitors and companies and things are so silly, said Miss Winstock, whose eyes had not moved from the floor mat. Thank you. The thank you was in respect to the rug. So they are, Mr. Prohack had agreed. That was why I thought it would be better to come straight to you. For the first time she glanced at him, a baffling glance, a glance that somehow had the effect of transferring some of the apprehension in her own breast to that of Mr. Prohack. Well, said he, in a departmental tone, recalling Whitehall, will you kindly say what you have to say? Can I speak confidentially? Mr. Prohack raised his hands and laughed in what he hoped was a sardonic manner. <laughs> I give you young women up, he murmured. Yes, I give you up. You're my enemy. Where is law? And you want to talk confidentially? How can I tell whether I can let you talk confidentially until I've heard what you're going to say? Oh, I was only going to say that I'm not really the owner-driver of the car. I'm personal secretary to Mr. Carroll Quire, and it's really his car. You see, he has three cars, but as there's been such a fuss about waste lately, and he's so prominent in the anti scondamania campaign— he prefers to keep only one car in his own name. You don't mean to sit there and tell me you're talking about the Secretary for Foreign Affairs? Yes, of course. Who else? You know he's on the continent at present. He wouldn't take me with him because he wanted to create an effect of austerity in Paris. That's what he said. And I must get this accident affair settled up before he comes back, or he may dismiss me. I don't think he will, because I'm a cousin of the late Lady Queenie Paul. That's how I got the place. But he may. And then where should I be? I was told you were so kind and nice, that's why I came. I am not kind, I am not nice, remarked Mr. Prohack in an acid tone, but laughing to himself, because the celebrated young statesman, Mr. Carroll Quire, bald at thirty-five, was precisely one of the ministers who, during the war, 
had defied and trampled upon the treasury. He now almost demoniacally contemplated the ruin of Mr. Carroll Quire. "'You've made a serious mistake in coming to me. Unfortunately, you cannot undo it. Be good enough to understand that you have not been talking confidentially.' Miss Winston ought to have been intimidated and paralysed by the menacing manner of the former terror of the departments. But she was not. "'Please, please, Mr. Prohack,' she said calmly, "'don't talk in that strain. I distinctly told you I was talking confidentially, and I'm sure I can rely on you, unless all that I've heard about you is untrue, which it can't be. I only want matters to be settled quietly, and when Mr. Quire returns he will pay anything that has to be paid, uh, if it isn't too much.' My chauffeur asserts that you have told a most unnaughty untruth about the accident. You say that he ran into you, whereas the fact is that he was nearly standing still while you were going too fast, and you skidded badly into him off the tram lines. And he's found witnesses to prove what he says. I may have been a little mistaken, Miss Winstock admitted with light sadness. I won't say I wasn't. You know how you are in an accident. I've never been in an accident in my life, Mr. Prohack objected. If you had, you'd sympathise with me. At this moment the eagle drew up at the desired destination in Conduit Street. Mr. Prohack looked at his watch. I'm sorry to seem inhospitable, he said, but my appointment is extremely important. I cannot wait. Can I wait? Mrs. Winstock suggested. I'm quite used to waiting for Mr. Carroll Quire. If I might wait in the car till you came out, you see, I wanted to come to an understanding. I don't know how long I shall be. That doesn't matter, truly. I haven't got anything else in the world to do, as Mr. Carroll Quire is away. Mr. Prohack left Miss Winstock in the car. The establishment into which Mr. Prohack disappeared was that of his son's tailors. He slipped into it with awe, not wholly because the tailors were his son's tailors, but in part because they were tailors to various august, or once august, personages throughout Europe. Till that day Mr. Perkak had brought his clothes from an insignificant though traditional tailor in Maddox Street, to whom he had been taken as a boy by his own father. And he had ordered his clothes hastily, negligently, anyhow, in intervals snatched from meal hours or on the way from one more important appointment to another more important appointment. Indeed, he thought no more of ordering a suit than of ordering a whisky and soda. Nay, he had on one occasion fallen incredibly low, and his memory held the horrid secret forever. On one occasion he had actually bought a ready-made suit. It had fitted him, for he was slimmish and of a good stock size, but he had told nobody, not even his wife, of this shocking defection from the code of true British gentlemanliness, and he had never repeated the crime. The secret would die with him. And now he was devoting the top of the morning to the commandment of a suit. The affair was his chief business, and he had come to it in a great car whose six cylinders were working harmoniously for nothing else, and with the aid of an intelligent and experienced and expert human being whose sole object in life that morning was to preside over Mr. Prohack's locomotion to and from the tailors. 2. Mr. Prohack perceived that he was only beginning to comprehend the wonder of existence. The adepts of the tailors, however, seemed to think nothing wonderful in the matter. They showed surprise that he had written to make an appointment with a particularly adept named Melchizedek, who had been casually mentioned weeks earlier by Charles as the one man in London who really comprehended waistcoats. They took it as a matter of course that Mr. Prohack had naught else to do with the top of the morning but order clothes, and that while he did so he should keep a mature man and a vast and elaborate machine waiting for him in the street outside and Mr. Melchizedek's manner alone convinced Mr. Prohack that what he had told his family, and that what he had told Miss Winstock in the car, was strictly true, and not the invention of his fancy. Namely, the appointment was genuinely of high importance. Mr. Melchizedek possessed the strange gift of condescending majestically to Mr. Prohack while licking his boots. He listened to Mr. Prohack as to an autocrat, while giving Mr. Prohack to understand that Mr. Prohack knew not the first elements of sartorial elegance. At intervals he gazed abstractedly at the gold-framed and crowned portraits that hung on the walls, and at the inscriptions similarly framed and crowned and hung. And it was home in upon Mr. Prohack 
that the inscriptions in actual practice referred to Mr. Melchizedek, and that this same Melchizedek, fawning and masterful, had seen monarchs in their shirt-sleeves, and spoken to princes with pins in his mouth, and made marks in white chalk between the shoulder-blades of grand dukes, and that revolutions and cataclysms were nothing to Mr. Melchizedek. When Mr. Melchizedek had decided by hypnotic suggestion and magic power what Mr. Prahak desired in the way of stuffs and patterns, he led Mr. Prahak mysteriously to a small chamber, and a scribe followed them carrying pencil and paper, and Mr. Prahak removed, with assistance, his shabby coat and his waistcoat, and Mr. Melchizedek measured him in an unexampled detail and precision, and the scribe, writing, intoned aloud all Mr. Prohack's dimensions. And all the time Mr. Prohack was asking in his heart, How much will these clothes cost? And he, once the terror of the departments, who would have held up the war to satisfy his official inquisitiveness on a question of price, he dared not ask how much the clothes would cost. He felt that in that unique establishment money was simply not mentioned. It could never be more than the subject of formal and stately correspondence. During the latter part of the operation, Mr. Prohack heard, outside in the shop, the sharp sounds of an imperial and decisive voice, and he was thereby well-nigh thunderstruck. And even Mr. Melchizedek seemed to be similarly affected by the voice, so much so that the intimate of sovereigns unaffectedly hastened the business of enduing Mr. Prohack into the shameful waistcoat and coat, and then with a gesture of apology, passed out of the cubicle, leaving Mr. Prohack with the attendant scribe. Mr. Prohack, pricked by a fearful curiosity, followed Mr. Melchizedek, and the voice was saying, Mr. Prohack had cautiously approached. The moment had awkwardness, but Mr. Prohack owed it to himself to behave with all presence of mind. Hello, Charlie, said he casually. Hello, Dad, how are you? And Charlie, wearing the very suit in which he had left home for Glasgow, shook hands boyishly. Looking into his firm, confident eyes, Mr. Prohack realised, perhaps for the first time, that the fruit of his loins was no common boy. The mere fact that an out-of-work ex-officer, precariously making a bit in motorcycle deals, he had dared to go to Melchizedek's firm for clothes, and that he was now daring to affront Melchizedek, this sole fact separated him from the ruck of sun. I warn you, Dad, that if you're ordering clothes here, you're ordering trouble. Mr. Melchizedek's interjected remarks fitted to the occasion. The group dissipated. The males of the Prohack family could say nothing interesting to each other in such a situation. They could only pretend that their relations were purely normal, which they did quite well. I say, Dad, I'm awfully busy this morning. I can't stop now. I've telephoned the mater, and she's coming to the Grand Babylon for lunch, one thirty. "'Sis, do, I think. Do come. You haven't got anything else to do.' The boy murmured all this. "'Oh, haven't I? I'm just as busy as you are, and more.' However, Mr. Prohack accepted the invitation. Charlie went off in haste. Mr. Prohack arrived on the pavement in time to see him departing in an open, semi-racing car, driven by a mature, handsome, and elegant woman, with a chauffeur sitting behind. Mr. Brahack's mind was one immense interrogation concerning his son. He'd seen him, spoken with him, and, owing to the peculiar circumstances, learnt nothing whatever. Indeed, the mystery of Charlie was deepened. Had Charles hurried away in order to hide the mature handsome lady from his father? Mr. Brahack might have moralised, but he suddenly remembered that he had a lady in his own car, and that the disparity between their ages was no less the disparity between the ages of the occupants of the car in which Charles had fled. 3. Turning to his own car, he observed with a momentary astonishment that Carthew, the chauffeur, leaning a little nonchalantly through the open off-window of the vehicle, was engaged in conversation with Miss Winstock. The astonishment passed when he reflected that as these two had been in the enforced intimacy of an accident together, they were necessarily on some kind of speaking terms. Before Carthew had noticed Mr. Prohack, Mr. Prohack noticed that Carthew's attitude to Miss Winstock showed a certain tolerant condescension, while Miss Winstock's girlish gestures were of a subtly appealing nature. Then, in an instant, Carthew, 
the easy male tolerator of inaccurate but charming young women, disappeared from the window, disappeared indeed entirely from the face of the earth, and a perfectly non-human, impassive automaton emerged from behind the back of the car and stood attentive at the door, holding the handle thereof. Mr. Brahack, with a gift of dissimulation equal to Carthew's own, gave him an address in Bond Street. "'I have another very urgent appointment,' said Mr. Brohack to Miss Winstock, as he sat down beside her, and he took his diary from his pocket and gazed at it intently, frowning, though there was nothing whatever on its page except the printed information that the previous Sunday was the twenty-fourth after Trinity, and a warning, "'If you have omitted to order your new diary, it would be well to do so now, to prevent disappointment.' "'It's awfully good of you to have me here,' said Miss Winstock. "'It is,' Mr. Perkirk admitted. "'And so far as I can see, you've done nothing to deserve it. "'You were very wrong to get chatting with my chauffeur, for example.' "'I felt that all the time, but he has such a powerful individuality.' "'He may have. "'What I pay him for is to drive my car, "'not to put his passengers into a semi-hypnotic state. "'Do you know why I am taking you about like this?' "'I hope it's because you are kind-hearted.' "'Not at all. Do you think I should do it if you were fifty, fat, and a fright? <laughs> of course I shouldn't. And no one knows that better than you. I'm doing it because you're young and charming and slim and attractive and smart. Though forty-six, I'm still a man. The chief difference between me and most other men is that I know and openly admit my motives. That's what makes me so dangerous. You should be aware of me. Take note that I haven't asked you what you've been saying to Carthew. Nor shall I ask him. Now what exactly do you want me to do? Only not to let the law case about the accident go any further. And are you in a position to pay the insurance company for the damage to my car? Oh, Mr. Carroll Quire will pay. Are you sure? Are you quite sure that Mr. Carroll Quire is not spending twice as much as his ministerial salary, that salary being the whole of his financial resources except loans from millionaires who will accept influence instead of interest? I won't inquire whether Mr. Carroll Quire pays your salary regularly. If he does, it furnishes the only instance of regularity in the whole of his gorgeous career. If our little affair becomes public, it might ruin Mr. Carroll Quire as a politician. At the least, it would set him back for ten years. And I am particularly anxious to ruin Mr. Carroll Quire. In doing so, I shall accomplish a patriotic act. Oh, Mr. Prohack! Yes, Mr. Carroquois may be, probably is, a delightful fellow, but he's too full of brains, and he constitutes the gravest danger that has threatened the British Empire for a hundred years. Hence it is my duty to ruin him if I get the chance, and I've got the chance. I don't see how he could survive the exposure of the simple fact that while preaching anti-waste he's keeping motor-cars in the names of young women. The car had stopped in front of a shop, over whose door, a pair of gilded animals like nothing in zoology were leaping amiably at each other. Miss Winstock began to search neurotically in a bag for a handkerchief. "'This is the scene of my next appointment,' Mr. Brohack continued. "'Would you prefer to leave me at once, or will you wait again?' Miss Winstock hesitated. "'You'd better wait,' Mr. Brohack decided. "'You'll be crying in fifteen seconds, and your handkerchief is sadly inadequate to the crisis. Try a little self-control and don't let Carthew hypnotise you. I shan't be surprised if you've gone when I've come back. A commissionaire was now holding open the door of the car. Uh, Carthew, said Mr. Prohack privily, after he got out, oblige me by imagining that during my absence the car is empty. Carthew quivered for a fraction of eternity, but was exceedingly quick to recover. Yes, sir. The shop was all waxed parquetry, silks, satins, pure linen and pure wool, diversified by a few walking-sticks and a cuff-link or so. Faced by a judge-like middle-aged authority in a frock-coat, Mr. Brohack suddenly lost the magisterial demeanour which he exhibited to a defenceless girl in the car. He comprehended in a flash that suits of clothes were a detail in the existence of an idle man, and that neckties and similar supremacies alone mattered. "'I want a necktie.' he began gently. "'Certainly, sir,' said the judge. But the judge's eyes, fixed on Mr. Prohack's neck, said, "'I should just think you did.' Life was enlarged to a bewildering, a maddening, 
maze of neckties. Mr. Bragg considered in his heart that one of the needs of the day was an encyclopaedia of neckties. As he bought neckties, he felt as foolish as a woman buying cigars. Any idiot could buy a suit, but neckties baffled the intelligence of the terror of the departments, though he had worn something in the nature of a necktie for forty years. The neckties which he bought inspired him with fear, the fear lest he might lack the courage to wear them. In a nightmare, he saw himself putting them on in his bedroom and proceeding downstairs to breakfast, and then, panic-stricken, rushing back to the bedroom to change into one of his old neckties. And, when he had bought neckties, he apprehended that neckties without shirts were like butter without bread, and he bought shirts. And then he surmised that shirts without collars would be indecent. And when he bought collars, a still small voice told him that the logical foundation of all things was socks and that really he had been trying to build a house from the fourth story downwards. Fortunately, he had less hesitation about the socks, for he could comfort himself with the thought that socks did not jump to the eye as neckties did, and that by constant care their violence might even be forever concealed from the gaze of his household. He sighed with relief at the end of the sock episode, but he had forgotten braces, as to which he surrendered unconditionally to the frock-coated judge. He broke the most astounding braces, for none but Eve would see them, and he could intimidate Eve. "'Shall we make you a quarter of a dozen pairs to measure, sir?' This extraordinary question miraculously restored all Mr. Brahak's vanished aplomb. That at the end of the greatest war in the history of the earth, amid decapitated empires and cities of starvation, braces should be made to measure. This was too much for Mr. Brohack who had not dreamed that braces ever had been made to measure. It shocked him back into sense. No, he said coldly, and soon afterwards left the shop. Miss Winstock, in the car, sat for the statue of wistful melancholy. Heavens, breathed Mr. Prohack to himself, the little thing is taking me seriously. With all her experience of the queer world and all her initiative and courage, she is taking me seriously. He was touched. His irony became sympathetic, and he thought, How young the young are! Her smile, as he rejoined her, had pathos in it. The totality of her was delicious. "'You cannot be all bad, Miss Winstock,' said he to her, after instructing the chauffeur, "'because nobody is. You are undisciplined. You do wild and rash things. You have already accomplished several this morning. But you have righteous instincts, though not often enough.' Of course, with one word to the insurance company, I could save you. The difficulty is that I could not save you without saving Mr. Carroll Quire also. And it would be very wrong of me to save Mr. Carroll Quire, for to save him would be to jeopardise the future of the British Empire. Because unless he is scotched, that man's frantic egotism and ruthless ambition will achieve political disaster for four hundred million human beings. I should like to save you. But can I weigh you in the balance against an empire? Can I, I say? No, answered Miss Winstock weakly, but sincerely. That's just where you're wrong, said Mr. Prohack. I can. And you are shamefully ignorant of history. Never yet when empire, any empire, has been weighed in the balance against a young and attractive woman, has the young woman failed to win. That is a dreadful fact, but men are thus constituted. Had you been a hag, I should not have hesitated to do my duty to my country. But as you are what you are, and sitting so agreeably in my car, I will save you, and let my country go. Oh, Mr. Prohack, you are very kind, but every one told me you were. No, I am a knave. Also, there, there is a condition. I will agree to anything. You must leave Mr. Carroll Quire's service. That man is dangerous not only to empires, the entire environment is the very worst decently possible for a girl like you. Get away from it. If you don't undertake to give him notice at once, and withdraw entirely from his set, then I will ruin both you and him. But I shall starve, cried Miss Winstock. I shall never find another place without influence, and I have no more influence. Have the Winstocks no money? Not a penny. And have the Pauls no money? None for me. "'You are the idle programme girl in the theatre,' said Mr. Prohack. 
You will never starve. Excuse me for a few minutes. I have another very important appointment, he added, as the car stopped in Piccadilly. After a quarter of an hour spent in learning that suits were naught, neckties were naught, shirts, collars, socks, and even braces were naught, but that hats alone made a man of fashion and idleness, Mr. Bragg returned to Miss Winstock and announced, "'I will engage you as my private secretary. I need one very badly, indeed. In fact, I cannot understand how, with all my engagements, I have been able to manage without one so long. Your chief duties will be to keep on good terms with my wife and daughter, and not to fall in love with my son. If you are not too deeply preoccupied with my chauffeur, you may have noticed a young man who came out of the tailors just before I did. That was my son.' "'Oh!' exclaimed Miss Winstock. "'The boy who drove off in Lady Masulam's car?' "'Was that Lady Masulam?' asked Mr. Prahag, before he had time to recover from the immense effect of hearing the startling, almost legendary name of Lady Masulam in connection with his son. "'Of course,' said Miss Winstock. "'Didn't you know?' Mr. Prahag ignored her pertness. "'Well,' he proceeded, having now successfully concealed his emotion, after having dealt, as I suggest, with my wife and children, you will deal with my affairs. You shall have the same salary as Mr. Carroll Quire paid, or, or forgot to pay. Do you agree or not? I should love it, replied Miss Winstock, with enthusiasm. What is your Christian name? Mimi. So it is, I remember now. Well, it won't do at all. Never mention it again, please. When he had accompanied Mimi to a neighbouring post-office, and sent off a suitable telegram of farewell to Mr. Carroll Quire in her name, Mr. Prohack abandoned her till the morrow, and drove off quickly to pick up his wife for the grand Babylon lunch. "'I am a perfect lunatic,' said he to himself. "'Must be the effect of riches. However, I don't care.' He meant that he didn't care about the conceivable consequences of engaging Mimi Winstock as secretary but what he did care about was the conjuncture of Lady Masulam and Charlie. End of chapter 12chapter 13 of Mr. Prohack by Arnold Bennett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Chapter 13 Further Idleness. 1. Strange, inconceivable as it may appear to people of the great world and readers of newspapers, Mr. Prohack, C.B., had never in his life before been inside the Grand Babylon Hotel. Such may be the narrow and mean existence forced by circumstances upon secretly powerful servants of the Crown. He arrived late, owing to the intricate preparations of his wife and daughter for Charlie's luncheon. These two were so unsuccessfully pretending not to be nervous, and their nervousness reacted upon Mr. Prohack, who perceived with disgust that his gay and mischievous mood of the morning was slipping away from him, despite his efforts to retain it. He knew now definitely that his health had taken the right turn, and yet he could not prod the youthful Sissy as he had prodded the youthful Mimi Winstock. Moreover, Mimi was a secret which would have to be divulged, and this secret not only weighed heavy within him, but seemed disturbingly to counterbalance the secrets that Charlie was withholding. On the present occasion he saw little of the Grand Babylon, for as soon as he mentioned his son's name to the nonchalant official behind the inquiry counter, the official changed like lightning into an obsequious courtier, and Charles's family was put in charge of a hovering attendant boy, who escorted it in a lift and along a mile of corridors, and Charlie's family was kept waiting at a door until the voice of Charlie permitted the boy to open the door. A rather large parlour set with a table for five, a magnificent view from the window of a huge white-bricked wall and scores of chimney-pots and electric wires, and a moving grey sky above. Charlie, too, was unsuccessfully pretending not to be nervous. "'Hello, kid!' he greeted his sister. "'Hello yourself!' responded Sissy. They shook hands. They very rarely kissed. However, Charlie kissed his mother. Even he would not have dared to kiss her. Mater, said he, let me introduce you to Lady Masulam. Lady Masulam had been standing in the window. She came forward with a pleasant, restrained smile, and made the acquaintance of Charlie's family. But she was not talkative. Her presence, coming as a terrific surprise to the ladies of the Prohack family, 
and as a fairly powerful surprise to Mr. Prohack, completed the general constraint. Mrs. Prohack, indeed, was somewhat intimidated by it. Mrs. Prohack's knowledge of Lady Massillon was derived exclusively from the daily picture, where her portrait was constantly appearing on all sorts of pretexts, and where she was described as a leader of London society. Mr. Prohack knew of her as a woman credited with great feats of war-work, and also with a certain real talent for organisation. Further, he had heard that she had a gift for high finance, and exercised it not without profit. As she happened to be French by birth, no steady English person was seriously upset by the fact that her matrimonial career was obscure, and as she happened to be very rich, everybody raised sceptical eyebrows at the assertion that her husband, a knight, was dead. For the daily picture implanted daily in the minds of millions of readers the grand truth that to the very rich nothing can happen simply. The whole daily picture world was aware that of late she had lived at the Grand Babylon Hotel in permanence. That world would not have recognised her from her published portraits, which were more historical than actual. Although conspicuously anti-Victorian, she had a Victorian beauty of the impressive kind. She had it still. Her hair was of a dark, lustrous brown, and showed no grey. In figure she was tall, and rather more than plump, and rather less than fat. Her perfect, and perfectly worn, clothes proved that she knew just how to deal with herself, she would look forty in a theatre, fifty in a garden, and sixty to her maid at dawn. This important person spoke, when she did speak, with a scarcely perceptible French accent, in a fine, clear voice. But she spoke little, and said practically nothing. Which was a shock to Marianne Prohack, who had imagined that in the circles graced by Lady Massillon, conversation varied from badinage to profundity, and never halted. It was not that Lady Massillon was tongue-tied, nor that she was impolite. It was merely that, she, with excellent calmness, she did not talk. If anybody handed her a subject, she just dropped it. The floor around her was strewn with subjects. The lunch was dreadful, socially. It might have been better if Charlie's family had not been tormented by the tremendous question. What had Charlie to do with Lady Massillon? Already Charlie's situation was sufficient of a mystery, without this arch-mystery being spread all over it. An inexperienced Charlie was a poor host. As a host he was positively pathetic, rivalling Lady Massillon in taciturnity. Sissy took to chafing her brother, and after a time Charlie said suddenly, with curtness, "'Have you dropped that silly dance scheme of yours, kid?' Sissy was obliged to admit that she had. "'Then I tell you what you must do. You might come and live here with me for a bit. And what a hostess, you know.' "'I will,' said Sissy straight no consultation of parents. This brief episode overset Mrs. Prohack. The lunch worsened, to such a point that Mr. Prohack began to grow light-hearted, and chafed Charlie in his turn. He found material for chafe in the large number of newly-bought books that were lying about the room. There was even the Encyclopedia of Religion and Ethics in eleven volumes. Queer possessions for a youth who at home had never read aught the periodical literature of automobilism, could this be the influence of Lady Massillon? Then the telephone bell rang, and it was like a signal of salvation. Charlie sprang at the instrument. "'For you,' he said, indicating Lady Massillon, who rose. "'Oh,' said she, "'it's Ozzy.' "'Who's Ozzy?' Charlie demanded, without thought. "'No doubt Oswald Murphy,' said Mr. Brohack, scoring over his son. "'He wants to see me. May I ask you to come up for coffee?' "'Oh, do!' said Sissy, also without thought. She then blushed. Mr. Brohack thought suspiciously and apprehensively, "'I better think he's found out that my daughter is here.' Ozzy transformed the final act of the luncheon. An adept conversationalist, he created conversationalists on every side. Mrs. Prohack liked him at once. Sissy could not keep her eyes off him. Charlie was impressed by him. Lady Massillon treated him with the familiarity of an intimate. Mr. Prohack alone was sinister in attitude. Ozzy brought the great world into the room with him. In his simpering voice he was ready to discuss all the phenomena of the universe. But after ten minutes Mr. Prohack noticed that the fellow had one sole subject on his mind, namely a theatrical first night, fixed for that very evening, a first night of the highest eminence, 
one of Mr. Asprey Chown's first night, boomed by the marvellous showmanship of Mr. Asprey Chown into a mighty event. The competition for seats was prodigious, but of course Lady Massillon had obtained her usual stall. "'What a pity we can't go,' said Sissy simply. "'Will you all come in my box?' astonishingly replied Mr. Oswald Morphy, embracing in his weak glance the entire Prohack family. "'The fellow came here on purpose to fix this,' said Mr. Prohack to himself, as the matter was being effusively clinched. "'I must go,' said he aloud, looking at his watch. "'I have a very important appointment.' "'But I wanted to have a word with you, Dad,' said Charlie, in quite a new tone across the table. "'Possibly,' answered the superior, ironic father in Mr. Prohack, who, besides being sick of the luncheon party, was determined that nothing should interfere with his median and Persian programme. "'Possibly, but that will be for another time.' "'Well, to tonight, then,' said Charlie, dashed somewhat. "'Perhaps,' said Mr. Prohack. Yet he was burning to hear his son's word. 2. However, Mr. Prohack did not succeed in loosing himself from the embraces of the Grand Babylon Hotel for another thirty minutes. He offered to abandon the car, to abandon everything to his wife and daughter, and to reach his next important appointment by the common methods of conveyance employed by common people. But the ladies would permit no such thing. They announced their firm intention of personally escorting him to his destination. The party seemed to be unable to break up. There was a considerable confabulation between Eve and Lady Massingham at the entrance to the lift. Mr. Brohack noticed anew that Eve's attitude to Lady Massingham was still a flattering one. Indeed, Eve showed that in her opinion the meeting with so great a personage as Lady Massingham was not quite an ordinary episode in her simple existence. The Lady Massingham was now talking with a free flow to Eve. As soon as the colloquy had closed, and Eve had at length joined her simpering husband in the lift, Charlie must have a private chat with Lady Massillon, apart, mysterious, concerning their affairs, whatever their affairs might be. In spite of himself, Mr. Prohack was impressed by the demeanour of the young man, and the mature blossom of womanhood to each other. They exhibited a mutual trust. They understood each other. They liked each other. She was more than old enough to be his mamma, and yet, as she talked to him, she somehow became a dignified girl. Mr. Brohack was disturbed in a manner which he would never have admitted. How absurd to fancy that Lady Massillon had in her impressive head a notion of marrying the boy! Still, such unions had occurred. But he was pleasantly touched, too. Then Oswald Morphy and Sissy made another couple, very different, more animated, and equally touchy. Ozzy seemed to grow more likeable and less despicable under the honest and frankly ardent gaze of Miss Prohack, and Mr. Prohack was again visited by a doubt whether the fellow was, after all, the perfectly silly ass which he was reputed to be. In the lift, Lady Massillon having offered her final adieu, Ozzy opened up to Mrs. Prohack the subject of an organisation called the United League of All the Arts. Mr. Prohack would not listen to this. He hated leagues, and especially leagues of arts. He knew in the marrow of his spine that they were preposterous. But Mrs. Prohack and Sissy listened with unfeigned eagerness to the wonderful tale of the future of the United League of All the Arts. And when, emerging from the lift, Mr. Prohack strolled impatiently on ahead, the three stood calmly moveless to converse, until Mr. Prohack had to stroll impatiently back again. As for Charlie, he stood by himself. There was leisure for the desired word with his father, but Mr. Prohack had bluntly postponed that, and thus the leisure was wasted. Without consulting Mr. Prohack's wishes, Ozzy drew the ladies towards the great lounge, and Mrs. Prohack at a distance, unwillingly, after them. In the lounge so abundantly enlarged and enriched since the days of the celebrated Felix Babylon, the founder of the hotel, post-lunch coffee was merging into afternoon tea. The number of idle persons in the world, and the number of busy persons who ministered to them, and the number of artistic persons who played voluptuous music to their idleness, struck Mr. Prohack as merely prodigious. He had not dreamed that idleness on so grandiose a scale flourished in the city, which to him had always been a city of hard work and limited meal hours. He saw that he had a great deal to learn before he could hope to be as skilled in idleness 
as the lowest of these experts in the lounge. He tapped his foot warningly. No effect on his women. He tapped more loudly, as the hatred of being in a hurry took possession of him. Eve looked round with a delightful placatory smile, which conjured an answering smile into the face of her husband. He tried to be irritated after smiling, and advancing, said in a would-be fierce tone, "'If this lunch lasts much longer, I shall barely have time to dress for dinner.' The effect was a failure, so complete that Sissy laughed at him. He had expected that in the car his women would relate to him the sayings and doings of Ozzie Morphy in relation to the United League of All the Arts. But they said not a syllable on the matter. He knew they were hiding something formidable from him. He might have put a question, but he was too proud to do so. Further, he despised them because they essayed to discuss Milady Masulum impartially, as though she was just a plain body, or nobody at all. A nauseating pretense on their part. Crossing a street, the car was held up by a procession of unemployed, with guardian policemen, a band consisting chiefly of drums, and a number of collarless, powerful young men who shook white boxes of coppers menacingly in the faces of passers-by. "'Instead of encouraging them, the police ought to forbid these processions of unemployed,' said Eve gravely. "'They're becoming a perfect nuisance.' "'Why?' said Mr. Brohack. "'This car of yours is a procession of unemployed.' This sardonic pleasantry pleased Mr. Prohack as much as it displeased Mrs. Prohack. It seemed to alleviate his various worries, and the process of alleviation went further, when he remembered that, though he would be late for his important appointment, he had really lost no time, because Dr. Vega had forbidden him to keep this particular appointment earlier than two full hours after a meal. "'Don't take cold, darling,' Eve urged with loving solicitude, as he left the car to enter the place of rendezvous. Sissy grinned at him mockingly. They both knew that he had never kept such an appointment before. 3. Solemnity and hush and antique menials stiff with tradition surrounded him. As soon as he had paid the entrance fee and deposited all his valuables in a drawer, of which the key was formally delivered to him, he was motioned through a turnstile and requested to permit his boots to be removed. He consented. White linens were then handed to him. "'See here,' he said with singular courage to the attendant, "'I have never been into one of these resorts before. Where do I go?' The attendant, who was a barefooted, mild child dressed in the Moorish mode, reassuringly charged himself with Mr. Prohack's well-being, and led the aspirant into a vast mosque with a roof of domes and little glowing windows of coloured glass. In the middle of the mosque was a pale green pool. White figures reclined in alcoves round the walls. A fountain played, the only orchestra. It was an eastern sound of hands clapped, and another attendant glided across the carpeted warm floor. Mr. Brohack understood that, in this immense seclusion, when you desired no matter what, you clapped your hands and were served. A beautiful peace descended upon him and enveloped him, and he thought, this is the most wonderful place in the world. I've been waiting for this place for twenty years. He yielded without reserve to its unique invitation. But some time elapsed before he could recover from the unquestionable fact that he was still within a quarter of a mile of Piccadilly Circus. From the explanations of the attendant, and from the precise orders which he had received from Dr. Vega regarding the right method of conduct in a Turkish bath, Mr. Prohack, being a man of quick mind, soon devised the order of the ceremonial suited to his case, and began to put it into execution. At first he found the ceremonial exacting. To part from all his clothes, and to parade through the mosque, in attire of which the principal items were a towel and the key of his valuables adorning his wrist, was ever so slightly an ordeal to one of his temperament and upbringing. To sit unsheltered in blinding steam was not amusing, though it was exciting. But the steam chapel, as it might be called, of the mosque, was a delight compared to the second next chapel further on, where the woodwork of the chairs was too hot to touch, and where a gigantic thermometer informed Mr. Brohack that with only another fifty degrees of heat he would have achieved boiling point. He remembered that it was in this chamber he must drink iced tonic water in quantity. 
he clapped his streaming hands clamorly, and a tall, thin old man, whose whole life must have been lived near boiling point, immediately brought the draught. Short of the melting of the key of his valuables, everything possible happened in this extraordinary chamber. For Mr. Brahack was determined to shrink from naught in the pursuit of idleness. And at length, after he had sat in a less ardent chapel, and in, and in still another chapel, been laid out on a marble slab as for an autopsy, and defenceless attacked for a quarter of an hour by a prize-fighter, and had jumped desperately into the ice-cold lake, and been dragged out and smothered in thick folds of linen, and finally reposed horizontally in his original alcove, then he was conscious of an inward and profound conviction that true, perfect, complete, and supreme idleness had been attained. He had no care in the world. He was cut off from the world. He had no family. He existed beatifically and individually in a sublime and satisfied egotism. But, such is the insecurity of human organisms and institutions, in less than two minutes he grew aware of a strange sensation within him, which sensation he ultimately diagnosed as hunger. To clap his hands was the work of an instant. The oncoming attendant recited a catalogue of the foods at his disposal, and the phrase Welsh rabbit caught his attention. He must have a Welsh rabbit. He had not had a Welsh rabbit since he was at school. It magically arrived on an oriental tray set on a low Moorish table. Eating the most wonderful food of his life and drinking tea, he looked about and saw that two of the unoccupied sofas in his alcove were strewn with garments. The owners of the garments had doubtlessly arrived during his absence in the chapels, and were now in the chapels themselves. He lay back. Earthly phenomena lost their harsh reality. When he woke up, the mosque was a pit of darkness glimmering with sharp points of electric light. He heard voices, the voices of two men who occupied the neighbouring sofas. They were discoursing to each other upon the difficulties of getting good whisky in Afghanistan and in Rio de Janeiro, respectively. From whisky they passed on to even more interesting matters. Mr. Prahak, for the first time, began to learn how the other half lives, to such an extent that he thought he had better turn on the lamp over his head. Whereupon the conversation on the neighbouring sofas curved off to the English weather in late autumn. Then Mr. Brahack noticed a deep snore. He perceived that the snore originated in a considerable figure, that, wrapped in white and showing to the mosque only a venerable head, was seated in one of the huge armchairs which were placed near the entrance to every alcove. It seemed to him that he recognised the snore, and he was not mistaken, for he had twice before heard it on Sunday afternoons at his chief club. The head was the head of Sir Paul Spinner. Mr. Brahack recalled that old Paul was a devotee of the Turkish bath. Now Mr. Brahack was exceedingly anxious to have speech with old Paul, for he had heard very interesting rumours of Paul's activities. He arose softly and approached the easy chair, and surveyed Sir Paul who in his then state looked less like a high financier, and more like something chipped off the roof of a cathedral than anything that Mr. Prohack had ever seen. But Paul did not waken. A bather plunged into the pool with a tremendous splash, but Paul did not waken, and Mr. Prohack felt that it would be contrary to the spirit of the ritual of the mosque to waken him, but he decided that if he waited all night he would wait until old Paul regained consciousness. At that moment an attendant asked Mr. Prohack if he desired the attentions of the barber, the chiropodist, or the manicurist. New vistas opened out before Mr. Prohack. He said yes. After the barber, he padded down the stairs from the barber's chapel, which was in the upper story of the mosque, to observe if there was any change in old Paul's condition. Paul still slept. Mr. Prohack did similarly after the chiropodist. Paul still slept. Then again after the manicurist. Paul still slept. Then a boyish attendant hurried forward, and in a very daring manner shook the monumental Paul by the shoulder. "'You told me to wake you at six, Sir Paul?' And Paul woke. "'How simple,' reflected Mr. Prohack, "'are the problems of existence when they are tackled with decision. Here have I been ineffectively trying to waken the fellow for the past hour. But I forgot that he who wishes the end must wish the means, and my regard for the ritual of the mosque was absurd.' He retired into the alcove to dress, 
keeping a watchful eye upon old Paul. He felt himself to be in the highest state of physical efficiency. From head to foot he was beyond criticism. When Mr. Brahack got as far as his waistcoat, Sir Paul uprose ponderously from the easy chair. "'Hi, Paul!' The encounter between the two friends was one of those affectionate and ecstatic affairs that can only happen in a Turkish bath. "'I've been trying to get you on the phone half the day,' grunted Paul Spinner, subsiding onto Mr. Prohack's sofa. "'I've been out all day, horribly busy,' said Mr. Prohack. "'What's wrong? Anything wrong?' "'Oh, no, only I thought I'd, you'd like to know I've finished that deal.' "'Why, well, I did hear some tall stories, but not a word from you, old thing.' Mr. Prohack tried to assume a tranquillity which he certainly did not feel. "'Well, I never sing out until I'm out of the wood, but this time I'm out sooner than I expected.' "'Any luck?' "'Yes, but I dictated a letter to you before I came here.' "'I suppose you can't remember what there was in it.' "'I shall get the securities next week.' "'What securities?' "'Well, you'll receive—' Here Paul dropped his voice. Three thousand short of a quarter of a million in return for what you put in, my boy. Then I'm worth over two hundred and fifty thousand pounds, murmured Mr. Prohack feebly. And he added still more feebly, Something will have to be done about this soon. His heart was beating against his waistcoat like an engine. End of chapter thirteen. Chapter fourteen of Mr. Prohack by Arnold Bennett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Mr. Prohack, Chapter fourteen. End of an idle day. One. It is remarkable that even in the most fashionable shopping thoroughfares, certain shops remain brilliantly open, exposing plush cushioned wares under a glare of electricity in the otherwise darkened street, for an hour or so after neighbouring establishments have drawn down their blinds and put up their shutters. An interesting point of psychology is involved in this phenomenon. On his way home from the paradise of the mosque, Mr. Prohack, afoot and high-spirited, and energised by a long-forgotten sensation of physical well-being, called in at such a shop, and, with the minimum of parley, bought an article enclosed in a rich case. A swift and happy impulse on his part, The object was destined for his wife, and his intention in giving it was to help him to introduce more easily to her notice the fact that he was now, or would shortly be, worth over a quarter of a million of money. For he was a strange, silly fellow, and just as he had been conscious of a certain false shame at inheriting a hundred thousand pounds, so now he was conscious of a certain false shame at having increased his possessions to two hundred and fifty thousand pounds. The eagle was waiting in front of Mr. Prohack's door. He wondered what might be the latest evening project of his women, for he had not ordered the car so early. Perhaps the first night had been postponed. However, he was too discreet, or too dignified, to make any inquiry from the chauffeur, too indifferent to the projects of his beloved women. He would be quite content to sit at home by himself, reflecting upon the marvels of existence and searching among them for his soul. Within the house, servants were rushing about in an atmosphere of excitement and bell-ringing. He divined that his wife and daughter were dressing simultaneously for an important occasion, either the first night or something else. In that feverish environment he forgot the form of words which he had carefully prepared for the breaking to his wife of the great financial news. Fortunately, she gave him no chance to blunder. "'Oh, Arthur, Arthur!' she cried, sweetly reproachful as with an assumed jauntiness he entered the bedroom. "'How late you are! I expected you back an hour ago at least. Your things are laid out in the boudoir. You haven't got a moment to spare. We're late as it is.' She was by no means dressed, and the bedroom looked as if it had been put to the sack. Nearly every jaw was ajar, and the two beds resembled a second-hand shop. Mr. Prohack's self-protective instinct at once converted him into a porcupine. An attempt was being made to force him into a hurry and he loathed hurry. "'I'm not late,' said he, "'because I didn't say when I would return. It won't take me more than a quarter of an hour to eat, and we've got heaps of time for the theatre.' "'I'm giving a little dinner in the Grand Babylon restaurant,' said Eve, "'and of course we must be there first. Sissy's arranged it for me on the phone. 
it'll be much more amusing than dining here, and it saves the servants. Yet the woman had recently begun to assert that the servants had not enough to do. Ah, said Mr. Prohack, startled. And who are the guests? Oh, nobody. Only us uh, and Charlie, of course, and Oswald Morphy, and perhaps Lady Masculam. I've told Charlie to do the ordering. I should have thought that one meal per diem at the Grand Babylon would have been sufficient. But this is in the restaurant, don't I tell you? Oh, dear, that's three times I've tried to do my hair. It's always the same when I want it nice. Now do get along, Arthur. Strange, said he with a sardonic blitheness. Strange how it's always my fault when your hair goes wrong. And to himself he said, All right, all right, I just shan't inform you about that quarter of a million. You've no leisure for details tonight, my girl. And he went into the boudoir. His blissful serenity was too well established to be overthrown by anything short of a catastrophe. Nevertheless, it did quiver slightly under the shock of Eve's new tactics in life. This was the woman who, on only the previous night, had been inveighing against the ostentation of her son's career at the Grand Babylon. Now she seemed determined to rival him in showiness, to be the partner of his alleged vulgarity. That the immature sissy should suddenly drop the ideals of the new poor, the ideals of the new rich, was excusable, but Eve! But that modest embodiment of shy and quiet common sense, she who once had scorned the world of the daily picture, was more and more disclosing a desire for that world. And where now were her doubts about the righteousness of Charlie's glittering deeds, and where was the ancient sagacity which surely should have prevented her from being deceived by the superficialities of an Oswald Morphy? Was she blindly helping to prepare a disaster for her blind daughter? Was the explanation that she had tasted of the fruit? The horrid thought crossed Mr. Prohack's mind. All women are alike. He flung it out of his loyal mind, trying to substitute, All women, except Eve, are alike. But it came back in its original form. Not that he cared, really. If Eve had transformed herself into a Cleopatra, his ridiculous passion for her would have suffered no modification. Lying around the boudoir were various rectangular parcels, addressed in flowing calligraphy to himself, the first harvest loads of his busy morning. The sight of them struck his conscience. Was not he, too, following his wife on the path of the new ridge? No. As ever, he was blameless. He was merely executing the prescription of his doctor, who had expounded the necessity of scientific idleness and the curative effect of fine clothes on health. True, he knew himself to be cured, but if nature had chosen to cure him too quickly, that was not his fault. He heard his wife talking to Machin in the bedroom, and Machin talking to his wife, and the servant's voice was as joyous and as worried as if she herself, and not Eve, were about to give a little dinner at the Grand Babylon. Queer, queer! The phrase, a quarter of a million, glinted and flashed in the circumambient air but it was almost a meaningless phrase. He was like a sort of super-savage, and could not count beyond a hundred thousand. And quite unphilosophical, he forgot that the ecstasy produced by a hundred thousand had passed in a few days, and took for granted that the ecstasy produced by two hundred and fifty thousand would endure for ever. "'Take that thing off, please,' he commanded his wife, when he returned to the bedroom in full array. She was by no means complete, but she had achieved some progress and was trying the effect of her garnet necklace. "'But it's the best I've got,' said she. "'No, it isn't,' he flatly contradicted her, and opened the case so newly purchased. "'Arthur!' she gasped, spellbound, entranced, enchanted. "'That's my name?' "'Pearls! But this must have cost thousands!' "'And what if it did?' he inquired placidly, clasping the thing with much delicacy round her neck. His own pleasure was intense, and yet he severely blamed himself. Indeed, he called himself a criminal. Scarcely could he meet her gaze when she put her hands on his shoulders after a long gazing into the mirror. And when she kissed him and said with frenzy that he was a dear and a madman, he privately agreed with her. She ran to the door. "'Where are you going? I must show Sissy.' "'Wait a minute, child. Do you know why I've bought that necklace?' "'because the affair with Spinner has come off.' "'He then gave her the figures. "'She observed, not unduly moved. "'But I knew that would be all right.' "'How did you know?' 
because you're so clever, you always get the best of everybody. He realised afresh that she was a highly disturbing woman. She uttered highly disturbing verdicts without thought and without warning. You never knew what she would say. I think, he remarked, calmly pretending that she had said something quite obvious, that it would be as well for us not to breathe one word to anybody at all about this new windfall. She eagerly agreed. But we must really begin to spend. I mean, spend regularly? Yes, of course, he admitted. Otherwise it would be absurd, wouldn't it? Yes, of course. Arthur? Yes. How much would it be in income? Well, I'm not going in for any more flutters. No, I've done absolutely with all speculating idiocies. Providence has watched over us. I take the hint. Therefore my investments will all have to be entirely safe and sound. No fancy rates of interest. I should say that by the time old Paul's fixed up my investments we shall have a bit over four hundred pounds a week coming in, if that's any guide to you. Arthur, isn't it wicked? She examined afresh the necklace. By the time they were all three in the car, Mr. Prayer had become aware of the fact that in Sissy's view he ought to have bought two necklaces while he was about it. Sissy's trunks were on the roof of the car. She decided to take up residence at the Grand Babylon that very night. The rapidity and the uncontrollability of events made Mr. Prohack feel dizzy. "'I hope you brought some money, darling,' said his wife. Two. "'Lend me some money, will you?' murmured Mr. Prohack lightly to his splendid son, after he had glanced at the bill for Eve's theatre dinner at the Grand Babylon. Mr. Prohack had indeed brought some money with him, but not enough. "'Haven't got any,' said Charlie, with equal lightness. "'Better give me the bill. I'll see to it.' whereupon Charlie signed the bill and handed the bowing waiter five ten-shilling notes. "'That's not enough,' said Mr. Prohack. Uh, "'Not enough for the tip. Well, it'll have to be. A, I never give more than ten per cent.' Mr. Prohack strove to conceal his own painful lack of worldliness. He had imagined that he had in his pockets heaps of money to pay for a meal for a handful of people. He was mistaken. That was all, and the incident had no importance for a few pounds, more or less, could not matter in the least to a gentleman of his income. Yet he felt guilty of being a waster. He could not accustom himself to the scale of expenditure. Barely in the old days could he have earned in a week the price of the repast, consumed now in an hour. The vast apartment was packed with people living at just that rate of expenditure and seeming to think naught of it. But do two wrongs make a right? he privately demanded of his soul. Then his soul came to the rescue with its robust common sense, and replied, well, Perhaps two wrongs don't make a right, but five hundred wrongs positively must make a right. And he felt better. And suddenly he understood the true function of the magnificent orchestra that dominated the scene. It was the function of a brass band at a quack dentist's booth in a fair, to drown the cries of the victims of the art of extraction. Yes, he reflected, full of health and carelessness. This is a truly great life. The party went off in two automobiles, his own and Lady Masulam's. Cars were fighting for room in front of the blazing façade of the Metropolitan Theatre, across which rose in fire the title of the entertainment, Smack Your Face, together with the names of Asprey Chown and Eliza Fiddle. Car after car poured out a contingent of glorious girls and men and was hustled off with ferocity by a row of gigantic and implacable commissionaires. Mr. Oswald Morphy walked straight into the building at the head of his guests. Highly expensive persons were humbling themselves at the little window of the box office, but Ozzie held his course, and officials performed obeisances which stopped short only at falling flat on their faces at the sight of him. Tickets were not for him. "'This is a beautiful box,' said Eve to him, amused at the grandeur of the receptacle into which they had been ushered. "'It's Mr. Chown's own box.' "'Then isn't Mr. Chown to be here to-night?' "'No, he went to Paris this morning for a rest. The acting manager will telephone to him after each act. That's how he always does, you know.' "'When the cat's away, the mice will play,' thought Mr. Prohack uncomfortably, with the naughty sensations of a mouse. The huge auditorium was a marvellous scene of excited brilliance. As the stalls filled up, a burst of clapping came at intervals from the unseen pit. "'What are they clapping for?' 
said the simple Eve, who, like Mr. Prayer, had never been to a first night before, to say nothing of such a super first night as this. Oh, replied Ozzie negligently, some one they know by sight just come into the stalls. The chic thing in the pit is to recognise and to share by applause that you have recognised. The one that applauds the oftenest wins the game in the pit. At those words and their tone, Mr. Pro had looked at Ozzie with a new eye, as who should be thinking, Is Sissy right about this fellow, after all? Sissy sat down modestly and calmly next to her mother. Nobody could guess from her apparently ingenuous countenance that she knew that she, and not the terror of the departments and his wife, was the originating cause of Mr. Morphy's grandiose hospitality. "'I suppose the stalls are full of celebrities,' said Eve. "'They are full of people who have paid twice the ordinary price for their seats,' answered Ozzy. "'Who's that extraordinary old red-haired woman in the box opposite?' Eve demanded. "'Oh, that's Enid.' "'Enid? Yes, you know the Enid stove, don't you? All ladies know the Enid stove. It's been a household word for forty years. That's the original Enid. Her father invented the stove and named it after her when she was a girl. She never misses the first night. How extraordinary! Is she what you call a celebrity? Or rather. Now, said Mr. Pry, now at last I understand the real meaning of fame. But that's Charlie down there, exclaimed Eve suddenly, pointing to the stalls and then looking behind her to see if there was not another Charlie in the box. Yes, Ozzy agreed. Lady Masculum has an extra stall, and as five's a bit of a crowd in this spot, I, I thought he'd told you. He'd not, said Eve. The curtain went up, and this simple gesture on the part of the curtain evoked enormous applause. The audience could not control the expression of its delight. A young lady under a sunshade appeared. The mere fact of her existence threw the audience into a new ecstasy. An old man with a red nose appeared. Similar demonstrations from the audience. When these two had talked to each other and sung to each other, the applause was triple. And when the scene changed from Piccadilly Circus at 4 a.m. to the interior of a Spanish palace inhabited by illustrious French actors and actresses who proceeded to play an act of a tragedy by Corneille, the applause was quintupled. At the end of the tragedy, the applause was decupled. Then the Spanish palace dissolved into an Abyssinian harem, and Eliza Fiddle in Abyssinian costume was discovered lying upon two thousand cushions of two thousand colours, and the audience rose at Eliza, and Eliza rose at the audience, and the resulting frenzy was the sublimest frenzy that ever shook a theatre. The piece was stopped dead for three minutes, while the audience and Eliza protested a mutual and unique passion. From this point onwards, Mr. Prowack lost his head. He ran to and fro in the bewildering, glittering maze of the piece, seeking for an explanation, for a signpost, for a clue, for the slightest hint, and found nothing. They went by strangely narrow corridors and through iron doors across the stage, whose white-sleeved, ragged population seemed to be behaving as though the last trump had sounded. And so upstairs and along a broad passage, full of doors ajar, from which issued whispers and exclamations and transient visions of young women. From the stars' dressing-room at the end, a crowd of all sorts and conditions of persons was, was being pushed. Mr. Brahack trembled with an awful apprehension, and asked himself vainly what in the name of common sense he was doing there, and prayed that Ozzy might be refused admission. The next moment he was being introduced to a middle-aged woman in a middle-aged dressing-gown. Her face was thickly caked with paint and powder, her eyes surrounded with rings of deepest black, her fingernails red. Mr. Prohack, not without difficulty, recognised Eliza. A dresser stood on either side of her. Blinding showers of electric light poured down upon her defenceless but hardy form. She shook hands, but Mr. Prohack deemed that she ought to bear a notice. Danger. Visitors are requested not to touch. "'So good of you to come round,' she said, in her rich and powerful voice, smiling with all her superb teeth. Mr. Prohack, entranced, gazed, not as at a woman, but as at a public monument. Nevertheless, she thought that she was not a bad kind, and well suited for the rough work of the world. "'I hope you're all coming to my ball tonight," 
said she. Mr. Bragg had never heard of any ball. In an instant she told him that she had remarked two most charming ladies with him in the box. Inordinate faculty of observation, mused Mr. Prohack. And another instant she was selling him three two-guinea tickets for a grand ball and rout in aid of the West End Chorus Girls' Aid Association. Could he refuse, perceiving so clearly as he did, that within the public monument was hiding a wistful creature, human like himself, human like his wife and daughter? He could not. "'Now you'll come?' said she. Mr. Perhack swore that he would come, his heart sinking as he realised the consequence of his own foolish weakness. There was a knock at the door. "'Did you want me, Liza?' said a voice, and a fat gentleman, clothed through his resplendent correctness, stepped into the room. It was the stage manager, a god in his way. Eliza Fiddle became a cyclone. "'I should think I did want you,' she said passionately. "'That's why I sent for you, and next time I'll ask you to come quicker. I'm not going to have that squint-eyed girl on the stage any more to-night. You know, the one at the end of the row. Twice she spoiled my exit by getting in the way, and you've got to throw her out and take it from me. She does it on purpose.' I, I can't throw her out without Mr. Jowns' orders, and Mr. Jowns in Paris. Then you refuse? A pause. Uh, yes. Then I'm not going on again tonight, not if I know it. I'm not going to be insulted in my own theatre. It's not the girl's fault. You, you know you haven't got room to move. I don't know anything about that, and I don't care. All I know is that I've finished with that squint-eyed woman, and you can choose right now between her and me. And so that's that. Miss Fiddle's fragile complexion had approached to within six inches of the stage manager's broad and shiny features, and it had little resemblance to any of the various faces which audiences associated with the figure of Eliza Fiddle. It was a face voluptuously distorted by the violence of emotion. As Miss Fiddle appeared in to be under the impression that she was alone with the stage manager, Mr. Prague rendered justice to that impression by softly departing. Ozzy followed. The stage manager also followed. "'Where are you going?' they heard Eliza's voice behind them addressing the stage manager. I "'I'm going to tell your understudy to get ready quick.' An enormous altercation uprose, and faces peeped from every door in the corridor. But Mr. Prohack stayed not. Ozzy led him to Mr. Asprey Chown's private room. The terror of the departments was shaking. Ozzy laughed gently as he shut the door. "'What will happen?' asked Mr. Prahak, affecting a gaiety he did not feel. "'What do you think will happen?' simpered Ozzy blandly. "'Having due regard to the fact that Miss Fiddle had to choose between three hundred and fifty pounds a week and a lawsuit with Chown involving heavy damages? <laughs> I must say there's nobody like Blags for keeping these three hundred and fifty pound a week individuals in order. Chown would sooner lose forty of them than lose Blags. And Eliza knows it. By the way, what do you think of the show? Uh, uh, will it succeed? Ah, uh, you should see the advance booking. There's a thousand pounds in the house tonight. Clown will be clearing fifteen hundred a week when he's paid off his production. Well, it's marvellous. You don't mean the show? Uh, no, the profit. I agree, said Pot Ozzy. I'm beginning to like this sizzling idiot, thought Mr. Brohack, as it were, regretfully. They left the imperial riches of Mr. Chown's private room, like brothers. 4. When Mr. Rohack touched the handle of the door of the box, he felt as though he were returning to civilization. He felt less desolated by the immediate past and by the prospect of the immediate future. He was yearning for the society of mere women after his commerce with a star at £350 a week. True, he badly wanted to, to examine his soul and inquire into his philosophy of life, but he was prepared to postpone that inquest until the society of mere women had had a beneficial effect on him. Charlie, who had been paying a state visit to his mother and sister, was just leaving the box, and the curtain was just going up. "'Hello, Dad,' said the youth. "'You are the very man I was looking for.' And he drew his father out into the corridor. "'You've got two of the finest ballroom dancers I ever saw.' he added to Ozzy. "'Haven't we?' Ozzy concurred with faint enthusiasm. "'But the rest of the show,' Charlie went on Rufus, "'well, if chance shows were only equal to his showmanship, <laughs> only they aren't.' Ozzy raised his eyebrows. 
a skilful gesture that at once defended his employer and agreed with Charles. "'By the way, Dad, I've got a house for you. I've told the motor about it, and she's going to see it tomorrow morning.' "'A house?' Mr. Bragg exclaimed weakly, foreseeing new vistas of worry. "'I've got one. I, I can't live in two. "'But this one's a house. You know about it, don't you, Morphy?' Ozzie gave a nod and a vague smile. "'See here, Dad, come out here a minute.' Ozzie discreetly entered the box and closed the door. "'What is it?' asked Mr. Bragg. "'It's this,' Charlie replied, handing his parent a cheque. "'I've deducted what I paid for you to-night from what you lent me not long since. I've calculated interest on the loan at ten per cent. You can get ten practically anywhere in these days, worse luck.' "'But I don't want this, my boy,' Mr. Prohack protested, holding the cheque as he might have held a lady's handkerchief retrieved from the ground. "'Well, I'm quite sure I don't,' said Charlie, a little stiffly. There was a pause. "'As you please,' said Mr. Prack, putting the cheque, interest and all, into his pocket. "'Thanks,' said Charlie. "'Much obliged. You're a noble father, and I shouldn't be a bit surprised if you've laid the plantation of my fortunes. But, of course, you never know in my business.' "'What is your business?' Mr. Prohack asked timidly, almost apologetically. He made up his mind on the previous evening that he would talk to Charlie, as a father ought to talk to a son, that is to say, like a cross-examining barrister and a moralist combined. He decided that it was more than his right, it was his duty to do so. But now the right, if not the duty, seemed less plain, and he remembered what he had said to Eve concerning the right attitude of parents to, to children and chiefly he remembered that Charlie was not in his debt. "'I'm a buyer and seller. I, I buy for less than I sell for. That's how I live.' "'It appears to be profitable.' "'Yes, I made over ten thousand in Glasgow, buying an option on an engineering business, with your money, from people who wanted to get rid of it, and then selling what I hadn't paid for to people in London who wanted to get hold of an engineering business up there. <laughs> Seems simple enough, and the only reason everybody isn't doing it is that it isn't as simple as it seems. At least it's simple, but there's a knack in it. I found out I've got the knack through my little deals in motorbikes and things. As a matter of fact, I, I didn't find out. Someone told me, and I began to think. But don't be alarmed if I go bust. I'm on to a much bigger option now, in the city. Oh, very much bigger. If it comes off, you'll see. Lady Matulum is keen on it, and She's something of a judge. Any remarks? Mr. Brohack looked cautiously at the young man, his own creation, to whom, only the other day, as it seemed, he'd be in the habit of giving one pound per school term for pocket money. And he was affrighted, not by what he had created, but by the astounding possibilities of fatherhood, which suddenly presented itself to him as a most dangerous pursuit. No remarks said he briefly. What remarks indeed could he offer? Wildly guessing at the truth about his son in that conversation with Eve on the previous evening, he had happened to guess right. And his sermon to Eve prevented now the issue of remarks. "'Oh, of course!' Charlie burst out. "'You can't tell me anything I don't know already. I'm a pirate. I'm not producing. All the money I make is to be earned by somebody else before I get hold of it. I'm not doing any good to my beautiful country. But I did try to find a useful job, didn't I? My beautiful country wouldn't have me. It only wanted me in the trenches. Well, it's got to have me. Oh, John, I will make it pay now. I'll squeeze every penny out of it. I'll teach it a lesson. Why not? I shall only be shoving its own ideas down its throat. Supposing I hadn't got this knack, and I hadn't had you— I might have been wearing all my ribbons and playing a barrel organ in Oxford Street today, instead of living at the Grand Babylon. <laughs> You're becoming quite eloquent in your old age, said Mr. Prohack, tremulously jocular, while looking with alarm into his paternal heart. Was not he himself a pirate? Had not the hundred and fifty thousand that was coming to him had to be earned by somebody else? Money did not make itself. Well, retorted Charlie with a grim smile, that's one thing to be said for me. When I do talk, I talk. And so at last you've begun to read? I'm not going to be the ordinary millionaire, no fear. Make your mind easy on that point. 
besides, Weedy isn't so bad after all. And what about that house you were speaking of? You aren't going to plant any of your options on me. Oh, we'll discuss that tomorrow. I must get back to my seat, said Charlie firmly, moving away. So long. I say, Mr. Brohack summoned him to return, I'm rather curious about the methods of you millionaires. Just when did you sign that cheque for me? You only lent me the money as we were leaving the hotel. Oh, I made it out while I was talking to the mater and sis in your box, of course. How simple are the acts of genius after they're accomplished, observed Mr. Brohack. Naturally you signed it in the box. As he rejoined his family, he yawned, surprising himself. He began to feel a mysterious fatigue, the effect of the Turkish bath, without doubt. The remainder of the evening stretched out in front of him, interminably tedious. The title of the play was misleading. He could not smack his face. He wished to heaven he could. And then after the play, the ball. Eliza might turn him to dance with her. She would be quite capable of such a deed. And by universal convention her suggestions were the equivalent of demands. Nobody ever could or would refuse to dance with Eliza. There she was, all her four limbs superbly displayed, sweetly smiling with her enormous mouth, just as if the relations between Blags and herself were those of Paul and Virginia. The excited old audience, in the professional phrase, was eating her. 5. Mr. Bragg really was a most absurd person. Smack your face, when it came to an end, towards midnight, had established itself as an authentic, enormous success. And because Mr. Prohack did not care for it, because it bored him, because he found it vulgar and tedious and expensive, because it tasted in his mouth like a dust-and-ashes sandwich, the fellow actually felt sad. He felt even bitter. He hated to see the fashionable and splendid audience unwilling to leave the theatre, cheering one super-favourite, five arch-favourites and fifteen favourites, and cheering them again and again, and sending the curtain up and down and up and down, time after time. He could not bear that what he detested should be deliriously admired. He went so far as to form views about the decadence of the theatre as an institution. Most of all, he was disgusted, because his beloved Eve was not disgusted. Eve said placidly that she did not think much of the affair, but that she had thoroughly enjoyed it and wouldn't mind coming on the next night to see it afresh. He said gloomily, and I bring you up for nearly twenty-five years. As for Sissy, she was quietly and sternly enthusiastic about a lot of the dancing. She announced her judgment as an expert, and Charlie agreed with her, and there was no appeal, and Mr. Brohack had the air of an ignorant outsider whose opinions were negligible. Further, he was absurd in that, though he assuredly had no desire whatever to go to the dance, he fretted at the delay in getting there. Even when they had all got out to the porch of the theatre, he exhibited a controlled but intense impatience, because Charlie did not produce the car instantly from amid the confused hordes of cars that waited in the surrounding streets. Moreover, as regards the ball, he had foolishly put himself in a false position, for he was compelled to pretend that he had purchased the tickets because he personally wanted to go to the ball. Had he not been learning to dance? Now the fact was, that he looked forward to the ball with terror. He had never performed publicly. He proceeded from one pretense to another. When Charlie stated curtly that he, Charlie, was going to no ball, he feigned disappointment, saying that Charlie ought to go for his sister's sake. Yet he was greatly relieved at Charlie's departure, even in Lady Massillon's car. He could not stomach the notion of Charlie cynically watching his infant steps on the polished, treacherous floor. In the matter of Charlie, Oswald Morphy also feigned disappointment, but for a different reason. Ozzy wanted to have Sissy as much as possible to himself. Mr. Brohack yawned in the car. "'You're overtired, Arthur. It's the Turkish bath,' said Eve, with commiseration. This was a bad enough mistake on her part, but she worsened it by adding, "'Perhaps the wisest thing would be for us all to go home.' Mr. Brohack was extremely exhausted, and would have given his head to go home. But so odd, so contrary, so deceitful, and so silly was his nature, that he replied, 
Darling, where on earth did you get these ideas from? There's nothing like a Turkish bath for stimulating you, and I'm not at all tired. Never felt better in my life. But the atmosphere of that theatre would make anybody yawn. The ball was held in a picture gallery where an exhibition of the International Portrait Society was in progress. The crush of cars at the portals was as keen as that at the portals of the Metropolitan. And all the persons who got out of the cars seemed as fresh as if they had just got out of bed. Mr. Brahack was astonished at the vast number of people who didn't care what time they went to bed because they didn't care what time they arose. He was in danger of being morbidly obsessed by the extraordinary prevalence of idleness. The rooms were full of brilliant idlers in all colours. Everybody, except chorus girls, had thought fit to appear at this ball in aid of that admirable charity, Chorus Girls Aid Association. And, as everybody was also on the walls, the dancers had to compete with their portraits, a competition in which many of them were well beaten. After they had visited the supper-room, where both Sissy and her mother did wonderful seats of degustation, and Mr. Brohack drank all that was good for him, Sissy ordered her father to dance with her. He refused. She went off with Ozzy, while her parents sat side by side on gold chairs, like ancestors. Sissy repeated her command, and Mr. Brohack was about to disobey, when Eliza Fiddle dawned upon the assemblage. The supernatural creature had been rehearsing until 3 a.m. She had been trying on clothes from 9 a.m. until 5 p.m. She had borne the chief weight of Smack Your Face on her unique shoulders for nearly three hours and a half. She had changed into an unforgettable black ball dress, cut to demonstrate in the clearest fashion that her shoulders had suffered no harm. And here she was, as fresh as Aphrodite from the foam. She immediately set herself to bear the chief weight of the ball on those same defenceless shoulders, for she was, in theory at any rate, the leading organiser of the affair, and, according to the entire press, it was her ball. As soon as he saw her, Mr. Prohack had a most ridiculous fear lest she should pick him out for a dance, and to protect himself he said, All right, to his daughter. A foxtrot announced itself. In his own drawing-room, with the door locked, Mr. Prohack could and did treat a foxtrot as child's play. But now he realised that he had utterly forgotten every movement of the infernal thing. Agony, as he stood up and took his daughter's hand. An awful conviction that everybody, who was anybody, was staring to witness the terror of the departments trying to jazz in public for the first time. A sick, sinking fear lest some of his old colleagues from the Treasury might be lurking in corners to guy him agony, as he collected himself and swayed his body slightly to catch the rhythm of the tune. Where in heaven's name was the first beat in the bar? Walk first, said Sissy professionally. He was in motion. Now, said Sissy, one, two, one, two. Miraculously, he was dancing. It was as though the whole room was shouting, they're off. Sissy steered him. Don't look at your feet, said she sharply and like a schoolboy he chucked his chin obediently up. Then he was steering her. Although her feet were the reverse of enormous, he somehow could not keep off them. But that girl was made of hardy stuff and never winced. He was doing better. Pride was puffing him. Yet he desired the music to stop. The music did stop. Thanks, he breathed. Oh, no, said she, that's not all. The dancers clapped and the orchestra resumed. He started again. Couples surged round him, and sometimes he avoided them, and sometimes he did not. Then he saw a head bobbing not far away, as if it were one cork and he another on a choppy sea. It resembled Eve's head. It was Eve's head. She was dancing with Oswald Morphy. He never supposed that Eve could dance these new dances. Let's stop, said he. Certainly not, Sissy forbade. We must finish it. He finished it, rather breathless and dizzy. He had lived through it. "'You're perfectly wonderful, Arthur,' said Eve, when they met. "'Oh, no, I'm no good.' "'I was frightfully nervous about you at first, said Sissy. He said briefly, "'Oh, you needn't have been. I wasn't.' A little later Eve said to him, "'Aren't you going to ask me to dance, Arthur?' Dancing with Eve was not quite like dancing with Sissy, but they safely survived deadly perils. And Mr. Prohack, perspired in a very healthy fashion. 
"'You dance really beautifully, dear,' said Eve, benevolently smiling. After that he cut himself free and roamed about. He wanted to ask Eliza Fiddle to dance, and also he didn't want to ask her to dance. However, he'd apparently ceased to do exist for her. Ozzie had introduced him to several radiant young creatures. He wanted to ask them to dance, but he dared not. And he was furious with himself. To dance with one's daughter and wife was well enough in its way, but it was not the real thing. It was without salt. One or two of the radiances glanced at him with inviting eyes, but no, he dared not face it. He grew gloomy, gloomier. He thought angrily, "'All this is not for me. I'm a middle-aged fool, and I've known it all along.' Life lost its savour and became repugnant. Fatigue punished him, and simultaneously reduced two hundred and fifty thousand pounds to the value of about fourpence. It was Eve who got him away. Home, he called to Carthew, after Eve and Sissy had said goodbyes to Ozzie and stowed themselves into the car. Excuse me, said Sissy, you have to deliver me at the Grand Babylon first. He had forgotten. This detour was the acutest torture of the night. He could no longer bear not to be in bed. And when, after endless nocturnal miles, he did finally get home and into bed, he sighed as one taken off the rack. Ah, the delicious contact with the pillow! Six. But there are certain persons who, although their minds are logical enough, have illogical bodies. Mr. Prohack was one of these. His ridiculous physical organism, as he once informed Dr. Viga, was least capable of going to sleep when it was most fatigued. If Mr. Prohack's body had retired to bed four hours earlier than in fact it did, Mr. Prohack would have slept instantly and with ease. Now, despite delicious contact with the pillow, he could not get off. And his mind, influenced by his body, grew restless, then excited, then distressingly realistic. His mind began to ask fundamental questions, questions not a bit original, but nonetheless very awkward. "'You've had your first idle day, Mr. Prohack,' said his mind challengingly, instead of composing itself to slumber. "'It was organised on scientific lines. It was carried out with conscientiousness. And look at you, and look at me. You've had a few good moments, as, for example, at the Turkish bath, but do you want a succession of such days? Could you survive a succession of such days? Would you even care to acquire a hundred and fifty thousand pounds every day? You've eaten too much, drunk too much, and run too hard after pleasure, and been too much bored, and met too many antipathetic people, and squandered too much money, and set a thoroughly bad example to your family. You've been happy only in spasms. Your health is good, you're cured of your malady. Does that render you any more contented? It does not. You've complicated your existence in the hope of improving it. But have you improved it? No. You ought to simplify your existence. But will you? You will not. All your strength of purpose will be needed to prevent still further complications being woven into your existence. To inherit a hundred thousand pounds was your misfortune, but deliberately to increase the sum to a quarter of a million was your fault. You were happier at the Treasury. You left the Treasury on account of illness. You are not ill any more. Will you go back to the Treasury? No, you will never go back, because your powerful common sense tells you that to return to the Treasury with an income of twenty thousand a year would be grotesque. And, rather than be grotesque, you would suffer. Again, rightly, nothing is worse than to be grotesque. Further, said his mind, you have started your son on a sinister career of adventure that may end in calamity. You have ministered to your daughter's latent frivolity. You have put temptations in the way of your wife which she cannot withstand. You have developed yourself into a waster. What is the remedy? Obviously, to dispose of your money. But your ladies would not permit you to do so and they are entitled to be heard on the point. Moreover, how could you dispose of it? Not in charity, because you are convinced of the grave social mischief in this of charity, and not in helping any great social movement, because you are not silly enough to know that the lavishing of wealth never really aids, but most viciously hinders, the proper evolution of a society. 
and you cannot save your income and let it accumulate, because if you did, you would once again be tumbling into the grotesque. And you would, further, be leaving to your successors a legacy of evil, which no man is justified in leaving to his successors. No, your case is in practice irremediable. Like the murderer on the scaffold, you are the victim of circumstances, and not one human being in a billion will pity you. You are a living tragedy which only death can end. During this disconcerting session, Eve had been mysteriously engaged in the boudoir. She now came into the dark bedroom. What? she softly murmured, hearing Mr. Prohack's restlessness. Not asleep, darling. She bent over him and kissed him, and her kiss was even softer, more soporific than her voice. Now do go to sleep. And Mr. Prohack went to sleep. And his last waking thought was, with the feel of the kiss on his nose, the poor woman had aimed badly in the dark. Anyway, this tragedy has one compensation, of which a hundred quarter of a millions can't deprive me. End of chapter 14《Chapter 15 of Mr. Prohack by Arnold Bennett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Mr. Prohack, Chapter 15 The Heavy Father. 1. Within a few moments of his final waking up the next morning, Mr. Prohack beheld Eve bending over him, the image of solicitude. She was dressed for outdoor business. How do you feel? she asked in a tender tone that demanded to know the worst at once. "'Why?' asked Mr. Prohack, thus with one word and a smile to match, criticising her tone. "'You looked so dreadfully tired last night. I did feel sorry for you, darling. Don't you think you'd better stay in bed to-day?' "'Can you seriously suggest such a thing?' he cried. "'What about my daily programme if I stay in bed? I have undertaken to be idle, and nobody can be scientifically idle in bed. I'm late already.' Where's my breakfast? Where are my newspapers? I must begin the day without the loss of another moment. Please give me my dressing-gown. I very much wonder how your blood pressure is, Eve complained. And you, I suppose, are perfectly well? Oh, yes, I am. I'm absolutely cured. Dr. Vega is really very marvellous. But I always told you he was. Well, said Mr. Prohack, what's sauce for the goose has to be sauce for the gander. If you're perfectly well, so am I. You can't have the monopoly of health in this marriage. What's that pamphlet you've got in your hand, my dove? Oh, it's nothing. It's only about the League of All the Arts. Mr. Morphy gave it to me. I suppose it was that pamphlet you were reading last night in the boudoir, instead of coming to bed. Eve, you're hiding something from me. Where are you going to in such a hurry? I'm not hiding anything, you silly boy. I thought I'd just run along and have a look at that house. You see, if it isn't at all the kind of thing to suit us, me going first will save you the trouble of going. What house? exclaimed Mr. Prohack with terrible emphasis. But Charlie told me he told you all about it, Eve protested innocently. Charlie told you no such thing, Mr. Prohack contradicted her. If he told you anything at all, he merely told you that he'd mentioned a house to me in the most casual manner. Eve proceeded blandly. It's in Manchester Square, very handy for the Wallace Gallery and you know how fond you are of pictures. It's on sale, furniture and all, but it can be rented for a year to see how it suits us. Of course, it may not suit us a bit. I understand it has some lovely rooms. Charlie says it would be exactly the thing for big receptions. Big receptions? I shall have nothing to do with it. Now we've lost our children, even this house is too big for us. And I know what the houses in Manchester Square are. You've said all your life you hate receptions. So I do. There's so much trouble, but one never knows what may happen, and with plenty of servants. You understand me? I shall have nothing to do with it. Nothing. Darling, please, please don't excite yourself. The decision will rest entirely with you. You know I shouldn't dream of influencing you, as if I could. However, I've promised to meet Charlie there this morning, so I suppose I'd better go. Carthy was late with the car. She tapped her foot. Yet I specially told him to be here prompt. Well, considering the hour he brought us home, he scarcely had time to get into bed yet. He ought to have had the morning off. Why? 
A chauffeur's a chauffeur, after all. They know what they have to do. Besides, Carthy would do anything for me. Yes, that's you all over. You deliberately bewitch him, and then you shamelessly exploit him. I shall compare notes with Carthew. I can give him a useful tip or two about you. Oh, here he is, said Eve, who had been watching out of the window. Au revoir, my pet. Here's Machin with your breakfast and newspapers. I dare say I shall be back before you're up, but don't count on me. As he raised himself against pillows for the meal, after both she and Machin had gone, Mr. Brahack remembered what his mind had said to him a few hours earlier about fighting against further complications of his existence, and he set his teeth and determined to fight hard. Scarcely had he begun his breakfast when Eve returned in a state of excitement. "'There's a young woman downstairs waiting for you in the dining-room. She wouldn't give her name to Machin, it seems, but she says she's your new secretary. Apparently she recognised my car on the way from the garage and stopped it, got into it, and then she found out she'd forgotten something and the car had to go back with her to where she lives, wherever that is, and that's why Carthy was late for me.' Eve delivered these sentences with a tremendous air of ordinariness, as though they related quite usual events and disturbances, and as though no wife could possibly see in them any matter for astonishment or reproach. Such was one of her methods of making an effect. Mr. Brahack collected himself. On several occasions during the previous afternoon and evening he had meditated somewhat uneasily upon the domestic difficulties which might inhere in this impulsive engagement of Miss Winstock as a private secretary. But since waking up, the affair had not presented itself to his mind. He had, indeed, completely forgotten it. "'Who told you all this?' he asked warily. "'Well, she told Machin, and Machin told me.' "'Let me see now,' said Mr. Prairagat. "'Yes, it's quite true. After ordering a pair of braces yesterday of morning, I did order a secretary. She was recommended to me.' "'You didn't say anything about it yesterday.' "'Mind I've had I a chance to do so? Had we a single moment together?' And you know how I was when we reached home, don't you? You see, I always had a secretary at the Treasury, and I feel sort of lost without one, so I— But, darling, of course. I always believe in letting you do exactly as you like. It's the only way. Au revoir, my pet. Charlie will be frightfully angry with me. And then at the door. If she hasn't got anything to do, she can always see to the flowers for me. Perhaps when I come back you'll introduce us. As soon as he had heard the bang of the front door, Mr. Prahack rang his bell. Uh, Machin, I understand that my secretary is waiting in the dining-room. Yes, sir. Ask her to take her things off, and then bring her up here. Up here, sir. That's right. In seven movements of unimaginable stealthy swiftness, Machin tidied the worst disorders of the room, and departed. Mr. Bragg continued his breakfast. Miss Winstock appeared with a small portable typewriter in her arms, and a notebook lodged on the typewriter. She was wearing a smart black skirt and a smart white blouse with a high collar. In her unsullied freshness of attire she somewhat resembled a stage secretary on a first night. She might have been mistaken for a brilliant imitation of a real secretary. 2. "'Good morning. Say you're come,' Mr. Crowhack greeted her firmly. "'Oh, good morning. Yes, Mr. Crowhack. "'Well, put that thing down on a chair somewhere.' Machin also had entered the room. She handed a paper to Mr. Crowhack. "'Mistress asked me to give you that, sir.' It was a lengthy description, typewritten, of a house in Manchester Square. Uh, "'Pass me those matches, please,' said Mr. Prohack to Mimi when they were alone. "'By the way, why wouldn't you give your name when you arrived?' "'Because I didn't know what it was.' "'Didn't know what it was?' Oh, "'When I told you my Christian name yesterday, you said it wouldn't do at all, and I was never to mention it again.' In the absence of definite instructions about my surname, I thought I had better pursue a cautious policy of waiting. I have told the chauffeur that he'll know my name in due course, and that until I tell him what it is, he mustn't know it. I was not sure whether you would wish the members of your household to know that I am the person who had a collision with your car. Mrs. Prohack and I were both in a state of collapse after the accident, and I was removed before she could see me. Therefore she did not recognise me this morning. But on the other hand, she has no doubt heard my name often enough since the accident, and would recognise that. Mr. Brahack lit the first cigarette of the day. "'Why did you bring that typewriter?' he asked gravely. "'It's mine. I thought that if you didn't happen to have one here, it might be useful. It was the typewriter that the car had to go back for. I'd forgotten it. I can take it away again. But if you like, you can either buy it or 
or hire it from me.' The girl could not have guessed it from his countenance, but Mr. Prohack was thunderstruck. She was bringing forward considerations which positively had not presented themselves to him. That she had much initiative was clear from her conduct of the previous day. She now disclosed a startling capacity for intrigue. Mr. Prohack, however, was not intimidated. The experience of an official life had taught him the value of taciturnity, and, moreover, a comfortable feeling of satisfaction stole over him, as he realised that once again he had a secretary under his thumb. He seemed to be delightfully resuming the habits which ill-health had so ruthlessly broken. "'Mary Warburton,' said he at length. "'Certainly,' said she. "'I'll tell your chauffeur.' "'The initials will correspond, in case—' "'Yes,' she said. "'I noticed that. "'We will see what your typewriting machine is capable of, and then I'll decide about it.' "'Certainly. "'Please take down some letters.' "'Mr. Carroquoir also told me what he wanted said, and I wrote the letters myself.' "'That is very interesting,' said Mr. Prohack. "'Perhaps you can manage to sit at the dressing-table. Uh, "'Mind that necklace there. It's supposed to be rather valuable. "'Put it in the case, and put the case in the middle drawer.' "'Don't you keep it in a safe?' said Miss Warburton, obeying. "'All questions about necklaces should be addressed directly to Mrs. Prohack.' "'I prefer to take down on my knee,' said Miss Warburton, opening her notebook, "'if I am to take down.' "'You are. Now, uh, dear madam, I am requested by my Lord of the Treasury to forward to you the enclosed cheque for one hundred pounds for your privy purse.' "'New line. I am also to state that no account of expenditure will be required.' New line. Be good enough to acknowledge receipt, your obedient servant, to Miss Prohack, Grand Babylon Hotel. Got it? Dear sir, with reference to the action instituted by your company against Miss Mimi Winstock, and to my claim against your company under my accident policy, I have seen the defendant. She has evidently behaved in an extremely foolish, not to say criminal way, but as the result of a personal appeal from her, I have decided to settle the matter privately. Please, therefore, accept this letter as a release from all your liabilities to me, and also as my personal undertaking to pay all the costs of the action on both sides. Yours faithfully. Secretary, World's Car Insurance Corporation. Wipe your eyes, wipe your eyes, Miss Warburton. You're wetting the notebook. I was only crying because you're so kind. I know I did behave in a criminal way. Uh, just so, Miss Warburton but it will be more convenient for me, and for you too, if you can arrange to cry in your own time, and not in mine. And he continued to address her in his own mind. Don't think I haven't noticed your aspiring nose, and your ruthless little lips, and your gift for conspiracy, and your wonderful weakness for tears. And don't confuse me with Mr. Carroll Quire, because we're two quite different people. You've got to be useful to me. And in a more remote part of his mind he continued still further, you're quite a decent sort of child, only you've been spoilt. I'll unspoil you. You've taken your first medicine rather well. I like you, or I shall like you, before I've done with you. Miss Warburton wiped her eyes. You understand, Mr. Prohack proceeded aloud, that you're engaged as my confidential secretary, and when I say confidential, I mean confidential in the fullest sense. Oh, quite, Miss Warburton concurred almost passionately. And you aren't anybody else's secretary but mine. You may pretend to be everybody else's secretary. You may pretend as much as you please. It may even be advisable to do so. But the fact must almost remain that you are mine alone. You have to protect my interests. And let me warn you that my interests are sometimes very strange, not to say peculiar. Get well into your head that there are not ten commandments in my service. There is only one. To watch over my interests, to protect them from everybody else in the whole world. In return for a living wage, you give me the most absolute loyalty, a loyalty which sticks at nothing, nothing, nothing. Oh, Mr. Prohack, replied Mary Warburton, smiling simply, you needn't tell me all that. I entirely understand. It's the usual thing for confidential secretaries, isn't it? And now, Mr. Prohack went on, ignoring her, this being made perfectly clear, go into the boudoir, oh, that's the room there, and bring me here all the parcels lying about. Our next task is to check the accuracy of several of the leading tradesmen in the West End. "'I think there are one or two more parcels that have been delivered this morning in the hall,' said Miss Warburton. 
Perhaps I'd better fetch them. Perhaps you had. In a few minutes, Miss Warburton, by dint of opening parcels, had transformed the bedroom into a composite of the principal men's shops in Piccadilly and Bond Street. Mr. Prahack recoiled before the chromatic show, and also before the prospect of Eve's view on the show. "'Take everything into the boudoir,' said he, "'and arrange them under the sofa. It's important that we should not lose our heads in this crisis. When you go out to lunch you will buy some foolscap paper, and this afternoon you will make a schedule of the goods, divided according to the portions of the human frame which they are intended to conceal or adorn. "'What are you laughing at, Miss Warburton?' "'You are so amusing, Mr. Prohack. "'I may be amusing, but I am not susceptible to the flattery of giggling. "'Endeavour not to treat serious subjects lightly.' "'I don't see any boots.' "'Neither do I. "'You will telephone to the bootmakers and to my tailors. "'Also to Sir Paul Spinner and Messrs. Smathe and Smathe. Uh, "'But before that I will just dictate a few more letters.' "'Certainly.' "'When he had finished dictating, Mr. Prohack said, "'I shall now get up.' "'Go downstairs and ask Machin, uh, that's the parlour-maid, to show you the breakfast-room. "'The breakfast-room is behind the dining-room, and is so called because it is never employed for breakfast. "'It exists in all truly London houses, and is perfectly useless in all of them, "'except those occupied by dentists, who use it for their beneficent labours in taking things from, "'or adding things to, the bodies of their patients. "'The breakfast-room in this house will be the secretary's room. "'Your room, if you continue to give me satisfaction.' Remove that typewriting machine from here, and arrange your room according to your desire. And I say, Miss Warburton— Yes, Mr. Prohack, eagerly responded the secretary, pausing at the door. Yesterday I gave you a brief outline of your duties, but I omitted one exceedingly important item, almost as important as not falling in love with my son. You will have to keep on good terms with Machin. Machin is indispensable and irreplaceable. I could get forty absolutely loyal secretaries while my wife was unsuccessfully searching for another machin. "'I have an infallible way with parlour-maids,' said Miss Warburton. "'What is that?' "'I listen to their grievances and to their love affairs.' Mr. Prohack, though fatigued, felt himself to be inordinately well, and he divined that this felicity was due to the exercise of dancing on the previous night following upon the Turkish bath. He had not felt so well for many years. He laughed to himself at intervals as he performed his toilet, and knew not quite why. His secretary was just like a new toy to him, offering many of the advantages of official life and routine without any of the drawbacks. At half-past eleven he descended, wearing one or two of the more discreet of his new possessions, and with the sensation of having already transacted a good day's work, into the breakfast-room and found Miss Warburton and Machin in converse. Machin feverishly poked the freshly lit fire, and then, pretending to have urgent business elsewhere, left the room. Uh, "'Here are some particulars of a house in Manchester Square,' said Mr. Prohack. "'Please read them.' Miss Warburton complied. "'It seems really very nice,' said she. "'Very nice indeed.' "'Does it? Now listen to me. That house is apparently the most practical and the most beautiful house in London.' Judging from the description, it deserves to be put under a glass case in a museum and labelled the ideal house. There is no fault to be found with that house, and I shall probably take it at once. But for one point. I don't want it. I do not want it. Do I make myself clear? I have no use for it, whatever. Then you've inspected it? I have not, but I don't want it. Now a determined effort will shortly be made to induce me to take that house. I will not go into details or personalities. I see merely that a determined effort will shortly be made to force me to act against my will and my wishes. This effort must be circumvented. In a word, the present is a moment when I may need the unscrupulous services of an utterly devoted confidential secretary. What am I to do? I haven't the slightest idea. All I know is that my existence must not on any account be complicated and that the possession of that house would be seriously complicated. "'Will you leave the matter to me, Mr. Prohack?' "'What shall you do?' "'Wouldn't it be better for you not to know what I should do?' Miss Warburton glanced at him oddly. Her glance was agreeable, and yet disconcerting. 
the attractiveness of the young woman seemed to be accentuated. The institution of the confidential secretary was magnified, in the eyes of Mr. Prohack, into one of the greatest achievements of human society. "'Oh, not at all,' said he in reply. "'You are underrating my capabilities, for I can know and not know simultaneously.' "'Well,' said Miss Warburton, "'you can't take an old house without having the drains examined, obviously. Supposing the report on the drains was unfavourable?' "'Do you propose to tamper with the drains?' "'Oh, certainly not. I shouldn't dream of doing anything so disgraceful. "'But I must tamper with the surveyor who made the report on the drains.' "'Say no more,' Mr. Prohack adjured her. "'I'm going out.' And he went out, though he had by no means finished instructing Miss Warburton in the art of being his secretary. She did not even know where to find the essential tools of her calling, nor yet the names of tradesmen to whom she had to telephone. He ought to have stayed in if only to present his secretary to his wife. But he went out, to reflect in private upon her initiative, her ready resourcefulness, her great gift for conspiracy. He had to get away from her. The thought of her induced in him qualms of trepidation. Could he, after all, manage her? What a loss would she be to Mr. Carroll Quire! Nevertheless, she was capable of being foolish. It was her foolishness that had transferred her from Mr. Carroll Quire to himself. 3. Mr. Prohack went out because he was drawn out by the force of an attraction which he could scarcely avow even to himself, a mysterious and horrible attraction which, if he had been a logical human being like the rest of us, ought to have been a repulsion for him. And as he was walking abroad in the pleasant foggy sunshine of the West End streets, a plutocratic idler with nothing to do but yield to strange impulses, he saw on the motor-bus the placard of a financial daily paper bearing the line, THE LATEST OIL COUP. He immediately wanted to buy that paper. As a London citizen, he held the opinion that whenever he wanted a thing, he ought to be able to buy it at the next corner. Yet now he looked in every direction, but could see no symptom of a newspaper shop anywhere. The time was morning. For the West End it was early morning, and there were newsboys on the pavements, but by a curious anomaly they were selling evening and not morning newspapers. Daringly he asked one of these infants for the financial daily. The infant sniggered and did no more. Another directed him to a shop at an alley off the Edgware Road. The shopman doubted the existence of any such financial daily as Mr. Prohack indicated, apparently attaching no importance to the fact that it was advertised on every motor-bus travelling along the Edgware Road. But he suggested that if it did exist, it might just conceivably be purchased at the main bookstore at Paddington Station. Determined to obtain the paper at all costs, Mr. Prahack stopped a taxicab and drove to Paddington, squandering eighteen pence on the journey, and reflecting as he rolled forward upon the primitiveness of a so-called civilization, in which you could not buy a morning paper in the morning without spending the whole morning over the transaction and reflecting also upon the disturbing fact that after one full day of its practice, his scheme of scientific idleness had gone all to bits. He got the paper, and read therein a very exciting account of Sir Paul Spinner's deal in oil lands. The amount of Paul's profit was not specified, but readers were given to understand that it was enormous, and that Paul had successfully bled the greatest oil combine in the world. The article, though discreet and vague in phraseology, was well worth a line on any placard. It had cost Mr. Prack the price of a complete Shakespeare, but he did not call it dear. He threw the paper away with a free, optimistic gesture of delight. Yes, he had wisely put his trust in old Paul, and he was veritably a rich man, one who could look down on mediocre fortunes of a hundred thousand pounds or so. Civilization was not so bad, after all. Then the original attraction which had drawn him out of the house resumed its pull. Why did his subconscious feet take him in the direction of Manchester Square? True, the Wallace collection of pictures is to be found at Hartford House, Manchester Square, and Mr. Brokack had always been interested in pictures. Well, if he did happen to find himself in Manchester Square, he might perhaps glance at the exterior of the dwelling which his son desired to plant upon him, and his wife desired him to be planted with. It was there right enough. It had not been spirited away in the night hours. He recognised the number. 
an enormous house, the largest in the square after Hartford House. Over its monumental portico was an enormous sign, truthfully describing it as this noble mansion. As no automobile stood at the front door, Mr. Brower concluded that his wife's visit of inspection was over. Doubtless she was seeking him at home at that moment to the end of persuading him by her soft, unscrupulous arts to take the noble mansion. The front door was ajar. Astounding carelessness on the part of the caretaker. Mr. Brohack's subconscious legs carried him into the house. The interior was amazing. Mr. Brohack had always been interested not only in pictures, but in furniture. Pictures and furniture might have been called the weakness to which his circumstances had hitherto compelled him to be too strong to yield. He knew a good picture, and he knew a good piece of furniture when he saw them. The noble mansion was full of good pictures and good furniture. Evidently it had been the home of somebody who had both fine tastes and the means to gratify them. And the place was complete. Nothing had been removed, and nothing had been protected against the grimy dust of London. The occupiers might have walked out of it a few hours earlier. The effect of dark richness in the half-shuttered rooms almost overwhelmed Mr. Prohack. Nobody preventing, he climbed the beautiful Georgian staircase, which was carpeted with a series of wondrous Persian carpets laid end to end. A woman in a black apron appeared in the hall from the basement, gazed at Mr. Prohack's mounting legs, and said naught. On the first floor was the drawing-room, a magnificent apartment exquisitely furnished in Louis Quinze. Mr. Prohack blenched. He had expected nothing half so marvellous. Was it possible that he could afford to take this noble mansion and live in it? It was more than possible. It was sure. Mr. Brohack had a foreboding of a wild, tranting impulse to take it. The impulse died ere it was born. No further complications of his existence were to be permitted. He would fight against them to the last drop of his blood and the complications incident to residence in such an abode would be enormous. Still, he thought he might as well see the whole house, and he proceeded upstairs, wondering how many people there were in London who possessed the taste to make, and the money to maintain, such a home. Even the stairs from the first to the second floor were beautiful, having a lovely carpet, lovely engravings on the walls, and a delightful balustrade. On the second-floor landing were two tables covered with objects of art, any of which Mr. Prohack might have pocketed, and nobody the wiser. The carelessness that left the place unguarded was merely prodigious. Mr. Prohack heard a sound. It might have been the creak of a floorboard or the displacement of a piece of furniture. Startled, he looked through a half-open door into a small room. He could see an old gilt mirror over a fireplace, and in the mirror the images of the upper portions of a young man and a young woman. The young woman was beyond question, Sissy Prohack. The young man, he decided after a moment's hesitation, for he could distinguish only a male overcoated back in the glass, was Oswald Morphy. The images were very close together. They did not move. Then Mr. Prohack overheard a whisper, but did not catch its purple. Then the image of the girl's face began to blush. It went redder and redder, and the crimson seemed to flow downwards until the exposed neck blushed also. A marvellous and a disconcerting spectacle. Mr. Prohack felt that he himself was blushing. Then the two images blended, and the girl's head and hat seemed to be agitated as by a high wind, and then both images moved out of the field of the mirror. The final expression on the girl's face as it vanished was one of the most exquisite things that Mr. Prohack had ever witnessed. It brought the tears to his eyes. Nevertheless, he was shocked. His mind ran, That fellow has kissed my daughter, and he has kissed her for the first time. It is monstrous that any girl, and especially my daughter, should be kissed for the first time. I have not been consulted, and I have not the slightest idea that matters have gone so far. Her mother has probably been here with Charlie, and gone off leaving these doves together. Culpable carelessness on their part. Talk about mothers. 
No father would have been guilty of such negligence. The affair must be stopped. It amounts to an outrage. A peculiar person, Mr. Prohack. No normal father could have had such thoughts. Mr. Prohack could, of course, have burst in upon the pair and smashed an idol to fragments. But instead of doing so, he turned away from the idol and descended the stairs as stealthily as he could. Nobody challenged his exit. In the street he breathed with relief, as if he had escaped from a house of great peril. But he did not feel safe until he had lost himself in the populousness of Oxford Street. For social and family purposes, he reflected, I have not seen that kiss. I cannot possibly tell them, or tell anybody, that I spied upon their embrace. To put myself right, I ought to have called out a greeting the very instant I spotted them. But I did not call out a greeting. By failing to do so, I put myself in a false position. How shall I get official news of that kiss? Shall I ever get news of it? He had important business to transact with tradesmen. He could not do it. On leaving home, he had not decided whether he would lunch domestically or at the Grand Babylon. He now perceived that he could do neither. He would lunch at one of his clubs. No, he could not bring himself to lunch at either club. He could face nobody. He resembled a man who has secretly carried a considerable parcel of high explosive. He wandered until he could wander no more, and then he entered a tea-shop that was nearly full of young girls. It was a new world to him. He saw mutton pie, eightpence, on the menu, and ordered it haphazard. He discovered to his astonishment that he was hungry. Having eaten the mutton pie, he ordered a second one, and ate it. The second mutton pie seemed to endow the eater with the faculty of vision, a result which perhaps no other mutton pie had ever before in the whole annals of eating achieved. He felt much better. He was illuminated by a large, refreshing wisdom, which thus expressed itself in his exciting brain. After all, I suppose it's not the first or the only instance of a girl being kissed by a man. Similar incidents must occur quite often in the history of the human race. Four. When he returned home, his house seemed to be pitifully small, cramped, and lacking in rich ornament. It seemed to be no sort of a house for a man with twenty thousand a year. But he was determined to love his house at all costs, and never to leave it. The philosopher within himself told him that happiness does not spring from large houses built with hands. And his own house was bright that afternoon. He felt as soon as he entered it that it was more bright than usual. The reason was immediately disclosed. Sissy was inside it. She had come for some belongings and to pay a visit to her mother. "'My word!' she greeted her father in the drawing-room, where she was strumming, while Eve leaned lovingly on the piano. "'My word! We are fine with our new private secretary!' Not a sign on that girl's face, nor in her demeanour, that she'd had an amorous secret, that something absolutely unprecedented had happened to her only a few hours earlier. The duplicity of women astonished even the philosopher in Mr. Prohack. "'Will she mention it, or won't she?' Mr. Prohack asked himself, and then began to equal Sissy in duplicity by demanding of his women, in a tone of raillery, what they thought of the new private secretary. He reflected that he might as well know the worst at once. "'She'll do,' said Sissy gaily, and Eve said, "'She seems very willing to oblige.' "'Ah!' Mr. Prohack grew alert. She's been obliging you already, has she? Well, said Eve, it was about the new house. What new house? But you know, darling, Charlie mentioned it to you last night, and I told you that I was going to look at it this morning. Oh, that! Mr. Prohack ejaculated disdainfully. I've seen it, I've been all over it, and it's simply lovely. I never saw anything equal to it. Of course. And so cheap. Of course. "'But it's ripping, Dad, seriously.' "'Seriously ripping, is it? "'Well, so far as I am concerned, I shall let it rip.' "'I rushed back here as soon as I'd seen it,' Eve proceeded, quietly ignoring the last remark. "'But you'd gone without, without saying where. "'Nobody knew where you'd gone. "'It was very awkward, because if we want this house we've got to decide at once, "'at latest in three days,' Charlie says. "'Miss uh, Warburton, that's her name, isn't it?' Miss Warburton had a very bright idea. She seems to know quite a lot about property. She thought of the drains. 
She said the first thing would be to have the drains inspected, and that if there was any hurry the surveyors ought to be instructed instantly. She knew some surveyor people, and so she's gone out to see the agents and get permission from them for the surveyors to inspect, and she'll see the surveyors at the same time. She says we ought to have the report by tomorrow afternoon. She's very enterprising. The enterprisingness of Miss Warburton frightened Mr. Prohack. She had acted exactly as he would have wished, only better. Evidently she was working out his plot against the house in the most efficient manner. Yet he was frightened, so much so that he could find nothing to say except, Indeed. You never told me she used to be with Mr. Carroll Quire and is related to the Paul family, observed Eve, mingling a mild reproach with joyous vivacity as if saying, "'Why did you keep this tit-bit from me?' "'I must now have a little repose,' said Mr. Prohack. "'We'll leave you,' Eve said, eager to be agreeable. "'You must be tired, you poor dear. "'I'm just going out to shop with Sissy. "'I'm not sure if I shall be in for tea, "'but I will be, if you think you'll be lonely.' "'Did you do much entertaining at lunch, young woman?' Mr. Prohack asked. Charlie had several people, men, but I really don't know who they were, and Ozzie Morphy came, and permit me to inform you that Charlie was simply knocked flat by my qualities as a hostess. Do you know what he said to me as afterwards? He said, That lunch was a bit of all right, kid. Enormous from Charlie, wasn't it? Mother and daughter went out arm in arm like two young girls. Beyond question they were highly pleased with themselves and the world. Eve returned after a moment. "'Are you comfortable, dear? I've told Machin you mustn't on any account be disturbed. Charlie's borrowed the car. We shall get a taxi in the Bayswater Road.' She bent down and seemed to bury her soft lips in his cheek. She was beginning to have other interests than himself. And since she had nothing now to worry about, in a maternal sense, she had become a child. She was fat, well, at any rate nobody could describe her as less than plump, and over forty but a child, an exquisite child. He magnificently let her kiss him. However, he knew that she knew that she was his sole passion. She whispered most intimately and persuasively into his ear, "'Shall we have a look at that house to-morrow morning, just you and I? You'll love the furniture.' "'Perhaps,' he replied. What else could he reply? He very much desired to have a talk with her about Sissy and the young fellow Morphy, but he could not broach the subject because he could not tell her in cold blood that he had seen Sissy in Morphy's arms. To do so would have had an effect like setting fire to the home. Unless, of course, Sissy had already confided in her mother. Was it conceivable that Eve had a secret from him? It was certainly conceivable that he had a secret from Eve. Not only was he hiding from her his knowledge of the startling development of the relations between Sissy and Morphy, he had not even told her that he had seen the house in Manchester Square. He was leading a double life, consequence of riches. Was she? As soon as she had softly closed the door, he composed himself, for he was in fact considerably exhausted. Remembering a conversation at the club with a celebrated psychoanalyst about the possibilities of auto-suggestion, he strove to empty his mind, and then to repeat to himself very rapidly in a low murmur, "'He will sleep, he will sleep, he will sleep, he will sleep,' innumerable times. But the incantation would not work, probably because he could not keep his mind empty. The mysterious receptacle filled faster than he could empty it. It filled till it flowed over with a flooding realisation of the awful complexity of existence. He longed to maintain its simplicity well aware that his happiness would result from simplicity alone. But existence flatly refused to be simple. He desired love in a cottage with Eve. He could have bought a hundred cottages, all in ideal surroundings. The mere fact, however, that he was in a position to buy a hundred cottages somehow made it impossible for him to devote himself exclusively to loving Eve in one cottage. His imagination leaped over intervening events, and he pictured the wedding of Sissy as a nightmare of complications, no matter whom she married. He loathed weddings. Of course, a girl of Sissy's sense and modernity ought to insist on being married in a registry office. But would she? She would not. 
For a month previous to marriage, all girls cast off modernity and became Victorian. Yes, she would demand real orange blossom and everything that went with it. He got as far as wishing that Sissy might grow into an old maid, solely that he might be spared the wearing complications incident to the ceremony of marriage as practised by intelligent persons in the twentieth century. His character was deteriorating, and he could not stop it from deteriorating. Then Sissy herself came very silently into the room. "'Sit down, my dear, I want to talk to you,' he said in his most ingratiating and sympathetic tones. And in quite another tone he addressed her silently. "'It's time I taught you a thing or two, my wench.' "'Yes, father,' she responded charmingly to his wily ingratiatingness, and sat down. "'If you were the ordinary girl,' he began, "'I shouldn't say a word. It would be no use. But you aren't. And I flatter myself I'm not the ordinary father. You are in love. Or you think you are. Which, which is the same thing for the present. It's a, it's a fine thing to be in love. I'm quite serious. I like you tremendously just for being in love. Yes, I do. Now, I know something about being in love. You've got enough imagination to realise that, and I want you to realise it. I want you to realise that I know a bit more about love than you do. That <laughs> stands to reason, doesn't it? Yes, father, said Sissy, placidly respectful. Love has got one drawback. It very gravely impairs the critical faculty. You think you could judge our friend Oswald with perfect impartiality. You think you see him as he is. But if you will exercise your imagination, you will admit that you can't. You perceive that, don't you? "'Quite, Dad,' the adorable child concurred. "'Well, do you know anything about him, really?' "'Not much, Father.' "'Neither do I. I have nothing whatever against him, but I shouldn't be playing straight with you if I didn't tell you at the, at the club he's not greatly admired. And a club is a very good judge of a man, the best judge of a man. And then as regards his business, supposing you were not in love with him, should you like his business? You wouldn't, naturally.' There are other things, but I won't discuss them now. All I suggest to you is that you should go a bit slow, exercise caution, control yourself, test him a little. If you and I weren't the greatest pals, I shouldn't be such an ass as to talk in this strain to you. But I know you won't misunderstand me. I know you know there's absolutely no conventional nonsense about me, just as I know there's absolutely no conventional nonsense about you. I am perfectly aware that the old can't teach the young— and that oftener than not the young are right and the old wrong. But it's not a question of old and young between you and me. It's a question of two friends. That's all. Dad, said she, you're the most wonderful dad that ever was. Oh, <laughs> if everybody could talk like that. Well, not at all, not at all, he deprecated, delighting with himself and her. I'm simply telling you what you know already. Oh, I needn't say any more. You'll do exactly as you think best, and whatever you do will please me. I don't want you to be happy in my way. I want you to be happy in your own way. Possibly you'll decide to tell Mr. Morphy to wait for three months. I most decidedly shall, Dad, Sissy interrupted him, and I am most frightfully obliged to you. He had always held that she was a marvellous girl, and here was the proof. He had spoken with the perfection of tact and sympathy and wisdom, but his success astonished him. At this point he perceived that Sissy was not really sitting in the chair at all, and that the chair was empty, so that the exhibition of sagacity had been entirely wasted. "'Anyhow, I've had a sleep,' said the philosopher in him. The door opened. Matron appeared, defying her mistress's orders. "'I'm sorry to disturb you, sir, but uh, Mr. Morphy's on the telephone and asks whether it would be convenient for you to see him to-night. He says it's urgent.' Mr. Prohack braced himself, but where his stomach had been there was a void. 5. "'Had an accident to your eyeglass?' asked Mr. Prohack, shaking hands with Oswald Morphy when the latter entered, by appointment, Mr. Prohack's breakfast-room after dinner. Miss Warburton having gone home, Mr. Prohack had determined to employ her official room for formal interviews. With her woman's touch, she had given it an air of business which pleasantly reminded him of the treasury. Ozzy was not wearing an eyeglass, and the absence of the broad black ribbon that usually ran like a cable connection between his eye 
and his supra-umbilical region, produced the disturbing illusion that he had forgotten an essential article of attire. Uh, uh, yes, Ozzy replied, opening his eyes with that mien of surprise that was his response to all questions, even the simplest. Uh, uh, Miss Sissy has cracked it. I'm very sorry my daughter should be so clumsy. It, it was not exactly clumsiness. I'm the, I, I offered her the eyeglass to do what she pleased with, and that she pleased to break it. Surely an impertinence. Oh, no, 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 a, a favour. Uh, Miss Sissy did not care for my eyeglass. You must be considerably incommoded. No, 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 the purpose of my eyeglass was decorative and not optical. Ozzy smiled agreeably, though nervously. Mr. Brohack was conscious of a certain surprising sympathy for this chubby, simpering young man with the peculiar vocation, whom but lately he had scorned, and on one occasion he had described as a perfect ass. Well, shall we sit down? suggested the elder, whom the younger's nervousness had put into an excellent state of easy confidence. The, the, the fact is, said Ossie, obeying, the, the fact is, I, I've come to see you about Sissy. I'm, I'm very anxious to marry her, Mr. Prohack. Indeed. Then you must excuse this old velvet coat. If I'd had notice of the solemnity of your visit, my dear Morphia, I'd, I'd have met you in a dinner jacket. May I just put one question? Have you kissed Sissy already? I, I, I have. By force or by mutual agreement? Neither. She made no protest? No. The reverse, rather? Yes. Then why do you come here to me? Oh, to, to, to get your consent. I suppose you arranged with Sissy that you should come here? Oh, yes, I did. We thought it would be best if I came alone. Well, all I can say is that you're a very old-fashioned pair. I'm afraid that you must have forgotten to alter your date calendar when the twentieth century started. Let me assure you that this is not by any means the nineteenth. I admit that I only altered my own date calendar this afternoon, and even then only as the result of a, an unusual dream. Uh, yes, said Ozzy politely, and he said nothing else, but it seemed to Mr. Brohack that Ozzy was thinking, This queer old stick is taking advantage of his position to make a fool of himself in his queer old way. Let us examine the circumstances, Mr. Prohack proceeded. You want to marry Sissy, therefore you respect her. Therefore you would not have invited her to marry unless you had been reasonably sure that you possessed the brains and the material means to provide for her physical and moral comfort, not merely during the next year, but till the end of her life. It would be useless, not to say impolite, for me to question you as to your situation and your abilities, because you are convinced about both. And if you failed to convince me about both, you would leave here perfectly sure that the fault was mine and not yours, and you would pursue your plans just the same. Moreover, you are a man of the world, far more a man of the world than I am myself, and you are unquestionably the best judge of your powers to do your duty towards a wife. Of course, some might argue that I, being appreciably older than you, and appreciably wiser than you, and that my opinion on vital matters is worth more than yours. But you know, perhaps I know too, that in growing old a man does not really become wiser. He simply acquires a different sort of wisdom. Whether it is a better or a worse sort, nobody can decide. All we know is that the extremely young and the extremely old are in practice generally foolish. Which leads you nowhere at all. But looking at history we perceive that the ideas of the moderately young have always triumphed against the ideas of the moderately old and happily so, for otherwise there could be no progress. Hence the balance of probability is that, assuming you and I were to differ, you would be more right than I should be. But, 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 I, but I hope that we do not differ, sir, said Ozzy. Mr. Brack found satisfaction in the naturalness, the freedom from pose, of Ozzy's diffident and disconcerted demeanour. His sympathy for the young man was increased by the young man's increasing consternation. Again, resumed Mr. Prohack, ignoring Ozzy's hope, take the care of Sissy herself. Sissy's education was designed and superintended by myself. The supreme aim of education should be to give sound judgment of the great affairs of life, and moral stamina to meet the crises which arrive when sound judgment is falsified by events. If I were to tell you that in my opinion Sissy's judgment of you as a future husband was unsound, 
it would be equivalent to admitting that my education of Sissy had been unsound, and I could not possibly admit such a thing. Moreover, just as you are a man of the world, so Sissy is a woman of the world. By heredity and by natural character, she is sagacious, and she has acquainted herself with all manner of things as to which I am entirely ignorant. Nor can I remember any instance of her yielding from genuine conviction to my judgment when it was opposed to hers. From all which it follows, my dear Morphy, that your mission to me here this evening is a somewhat illogical, futile, and unnecessary mission, and that the missioner must be either singularly old-fashioned and conventional, or laughing in his sleeve at me. No, Mr. Brohack, with a nineteenth-century wave of the hand, deprecated Ozzy's interrupting protest. No, no, there is a third alternative, and I accept it. You desired to show me a courtesy. I thank you. But uh, have you no questions to ask me? demanded Ozzy. Yes, said Mr. Prague. How did you first make the acquaintance of my daughter? D do you mean to say you don't know? Hasn't Sissy ever told you? Never. What is more, she has never mentioned your name in any conversation until somebody else has mentioned it. Such is the result of my educational system and the influence of the time spirit. Well, I'm dashed, exclaimed Ozzy sincerely. I hope not, Morphy. I hope not, if by dashed you mean damned. But it was the most wonderful meeting, Mr. Prohack, Ozzy burst out, and he was in such an enthusiasm that he almost forgot to lisp. You knew I was in M.I. in the war after my trench fever? M.I., that is to say, Secret Service? Y yes, Secret Service, if you like. Well, well, sir, I, I was doing some work in the East End in a certain foreign community, and I had to get away quickly, and so I jumped into a motor van that happened to be passing. That van was driven by Sissy. An example of fact imitating fiction, remarked Mr. Prohack, seeking, not with complete success, to keep out of his voice the emotion engendered in him by Ozzy's too brief recital. Now that's one question, and you've answered it brilliantly. My second and last question is this. Are you in love with Sissy? Please, Mr. Prohack, Ozzy half rose out of his chair. Or do you love her? The two things are very different. I beg your pardons, I, I, I had quite grasped, said Ozzy, apologetically subsiding. I, I, I quite say what you mean. I, I'm both. You're a wonder, Mr. Prohack murmured. Anyway, sir, I, I'm glad you don't object to our engagement. My dear Oswald, said Prohack in a new tone, do you imagine that after my daughter had expressed her view of you by kissing you, I could fail to share that view? You have a great opinion of Sissy, but I doubt whether your opinion of her is greater than mine. We shall now have a little whisky together. Ozzy's chubby face shone, as in his agreeable agitation he searched for the eyeglass ribbon when it was not there. Well, sir, said he, beaming, this interview had uh, not been at all like what I expected. Nor like what I expected either, said Mr. Prohack. But who can foresee the future? And he added to himself, Could I foresee when I called this youth a perfect ass that in a very short time I should be receiving him, not unpleasantly, as a prospective son-in-law? Life is marvellous. At the same moment Mrs. Prohack entered the room. Oh, cried she, affecting to be surprised at the presence of Ozzy. Wife, said Mr. Prohack, Mr. Oswald Morphy has done you the honour to solicit the hand of your daughter in marriage. You are staggered. How ridiculous you are, Arthur, said Mrs. Prohack, and impulsively kissed Ozzy. 6. The wedding festivities really began the next evening with a family dinner to celebrate Sissy's betrothal. The girl arrived magnificent from the Grand Babylon, escorted by her lover, and found Mrs. Prohack equally magnificent, indeed more magnificent by reason of the pearl necklace. It seemed to Mr. Prohack that Eve had soon become quite used to that marvellous necklace. He had already had to chide her for leaving it about. Ozzy also was magnificent. Even lacking his eyeglass and ribbon, he was magnificent. Mr. Prohack, esteeming that a quiet domestic meal at home demanded no ceremony, had put on his old velvet, but Eve had sharply corrected his sense of values, so surely indeed that nobody would have taken her for the recent recipient of our marvellous necklace at his hands. 
and he had yielded to the extent of a dinner-jacket. Charlie had not yet come. Since the previous afternoon he had been out of town on mighty enterprises, but Sissy had seen him return to the hotel before she left it, and he was momently expected. Mr. Prohack perceived that Eve was treating Ozzy in advance as her son, and Ozzy was responding heartily, a phenomenon which Mr. Prohack, in spite of himself, found agreeable. Sissy showed more reserve than her mother towards Ozzy, but then Sissy was a proud thing which Eve never was. Mr. Prohack admitted privately that he was happy. Yes, he was happy in the betrothal, and he had most solemnly announced and declared that he would have naught to do with the wedding beyond giving a marriage gift to his daughter, and giving his daughter to Ozzy. And when Sissy said that as neither she nor Ozzy had much use for the state of being merely engaged, the wedding would occur very soon, Mr. Prohack rejoiced at the prospect of the upset being so quickly over. After the emotions and complications of the wedding, he would settle down to simplicity, luxurious possibly, but still simplicity, the plain but perfect. And let his fortune persist in accumulating, well it must accumulate, and be hanged to it. "'But uh, what about getting a house?' he asked his daughter. "'Oh, we should live in Ozzy's flat,' said Sissy. "'Won't it be rather small?' "'The smaller the better,' said Sissy. "'It will match our income.' "'Oh, my dear girl,' Eve protested, with a glance at Mr. Prohack to indicate that for the asking Sissy could have all the income she wanted. "'And I'll give you an idea,' Eve brightly added. "'You can have this house rent-free.' Sissy shook her head. "'Don't make so sure that they can have this house,' said Mr. Prohack. "'But, Arthur, you've agreed to go and look at Manchester Square, and it's all ready, excepting the servants. I've told that if you don't want less than seven servants, including one or two men servants, there's no difficulty about servants at all.' I shall be very disappointed if we don't have the wedding from Manchester Square. Mr. Brohack writhed, though he knew himself safe. Seven servants? Two man-servants? No. And again, no. No complications. I shall only agree to Manchester Square, said he with firmness and solemnity, subject to the drains being all right. Somebody in the place must show a little elementary sagacity and restraint. "'But the drains are bound to be all right.' "'I hope so,' said the deceitful father, "'and I believe they will be, but until we're sure, nothing can be done.' And he laughed satanically to himself. "'Haven't you had the report yet?' Sissy complained. "'Miss Warburton was to try to get hold of it to-night.' A moment later, Machin, in a condition of high excitement due to the betrothal, brought in a large envelope, saying that Miss Warburton had just left it. The envelope contained the report of Mrs. Doy and Doy on the drains of the noble mansion. Mr. Brohack read it, frowned, and pursed his judicial lips. Uh, "'Read it, my dear,' he said to Eve. Eve read that Messrs. Doy and Doy found themselves unable, after a preliminary inspection, which, owing to their instructions to be speedy, had not been absolutely exhaustive, to satisfy the drains of the noble mansion. They feared the worst, but there was, of course, always a slight hope of the best, or rather the second best. They phrased it differently, but they meant that. In the meantime, they would await further instructions. Mr. Prohack reflected calmly. My new secretary is an adept of the first conspiratorial order. Eve was shocked into silence. Doy and Doy used very thick and convincing notepaper. The entrance of Charlie loosed her tongue. "'Charlie!' she cried. "'The drains are all wrong. Look at this! And didn't you say the option expired to-morrow?' Charlie read the report. "'Infernal rascals!' he muttered. "'Who's doing is this? Who's been worrying about drains?' He looked round accusingly. "'I have,' said Mr. Prohack bravely, but he could not squarely meet the boy's stern glance. "'Well, Dad, what do you take me for? Did you suppose I should buy an option on a house without being sure of the drains? My first act was to have the drains surveyed by Flockers, the first firm in London, and I've got their certificate. As for Doy and Doy, they're notorious. They want to start everybody else but themselves getting a commission on that house, and this—' He slapped the report. "'This is how they're setting about it.' Eve adored her son. "'You see,' she said victoriously to Mr. Prohack, who secretly trembled, I shall bring an action against Doy and Doy, 
Charlie continued. I'll show the old rascally thing up. I hope you'll do no such thing, my boy, said Mr. Prohack, foolishly attempting the grandiose. I most positively shall, Dad. Mr. Prohack realised desperately that all was lost except honour, and he was by no means sure about even honour. End of chapter 15「Chapter sixteen Transfer of Mimi One Mr Prohack passed a very bad night, the worst for months, one of the outstanding bad nights of his whole existence. Why didn't I have it out with Charlie before he left? he asked himself some scores of times while listening to the tranquil, regular breathing of Eve, who, of course, was now sure of her house, and probably had quite forgotten the meaning of care. I'm bound to have it out with him sooner or later. If I'd done it at once, I should at any rate have slept. They're all sleeping but me. He simply could not comprehend life. The confounded thing called life baffled him by its mysterious illogicalness. He was adored by his spouse, beloved by his children, respected by the world. He had heaps of money, together with the full control of it. His word, if he chose, was law. He had only to say, I will not take the house in Manchester Square, and nobody could fault him. He powerfully desired not to take it. There was no sensible reason why he should take it. And yet he would take it, under the inexplicable compulsion of circumstances. In those sombre hours he had a fellow feeling for Oriental tyrants, who were absolute autocrats but also slaves as exactly the same sinister force that had gripped himself. He perceived that in practice there is no such thing as an autocrat. Not that his defeat in regard to the house really disturbed him. He could reconcile himself to the house, despite the hateful complications which it would engender. What disturbed him horribly was the drains business, the doy and doy business, the mimi business, he could see no way out of that except through the valley of humiliation. He remembered with terrible forebodings the remark of his daughter after she heard of the heritage. You'll never be as happy again. When the household day began and the familiar, comfortable, distant noises of domestic activity announced that the solar system was behaving much as usual in infinite and inconceivable space, he decided that he was too tired to be scientifically idle that day even though he had a trying-on appointment with Mr. Melchizedek. He decided, too, that he would not get up, would in fact take everything lying down, would refuse to descend a single step of the stairs to meet trouble, and he had a great wish to be irritated and angry. But the place seemed to be full of angels who turned to the other cheek, and the other cheek was marvellously soft and bewitching. Eve, Sissy, who had called, and Machin, they were all in a state of felicity, for the double reason that Sissy was engaged to be married, and that the household was to be moved into a noble mansion. Machin saw herself at the head of a troop of sub parlourmaids and housemaids and tweenies, and foretold that she would stand no nonsense from butlers. They all treated Mr. Prohack as a formidable and worshipped tyrant, whose smile was the sun, and whose frown death, and who was the fount of wisdom and authority. They knew that he wanted to be irritated, and they gave him no chance to be irritated. Their insight into his psychology was uncanny. They knew that he was beaten on the main point, and with their detestable feminine realism they exquisitely yielded on all the minor points. Eve, fresh as a rose, bent over him and bedewed him, and said that she was going out and that Sissy had gone again. When he was alone he rang the bell for Machin, as though the bell had done him an injury. "'What time is it?' Eleven o'clock, sir. Eleven o'clock? Good God! Why hasn't Miss Warburton come?' As if Machin was responsible for Miss Warburton. "'No, Mr. Prohack was not behaving nicely, and it cannot be hidden that he lacked the grandeur of mind which distinguishes most of us.' "'Miss Warburton was here before ten o'clock, sir.' "'Then why hasn't she come up?' "'She was waiting for orders, sir.' "'Send her up immediately.' "'Certainly, sir.' Miss Warburton was the fourth angel, 
an angel with another spick and span blouse, and the light of devotion in her eyes, and the sound of it in her purling voice. "'Good morning,' the gruff brute started. "'Did I hear the telephone bell just now?' "'Oh, yes, sir. Doy and Doy have telephoned to, to say that Mr. Charles Prohag has just been in to see them, and they've referred him to you, and—and—' uh, and, "'And what, and what, and what?' the machine gun. "'They said he was extremely unpleasant.' Instinctively Mr. Prohag threw away shame. Minnie was his minion. He treated her as an oriental tyrant might treat the mute guardian of the seraglio, and told her everything. That Charlie had forestalled them in the matter of the drains of the noble mansion, that Charlie had determined to destroy Doy and Doy, that he, Mr. Prohack, was caught in a trap, that there was the devil to pay, and that the finest lies that ingenuity could invent would have to be uttered. He abandoned all pretense of honesty and uprightness. Mimi showed no surprise whatever, nor was she apparently in the least shocked. She seemed to regard the affair as a quite ordinary part of the day's routine. Her insensitive calm frightened Mr. Prohack. "'Now we must think of something,' said the iniquitous monster. "'I don't see that there need be any real difficulty,' Mimi replied. "'You didn't know anything about my plot with Doy and Doy. "'I got the notion, quite wrongly, that you preferred not to have the house, "'and I acted as I did through an excess of zeal. "'I must confess the plot. I alone am to blame, "'and I admit that what I did was quite inexcusable.' "'What a girl! What a girl!' thought Mr. Prohack. But there were limits to his iniquity, and he said aloud, benevolently, grandiosely, "'But I did know about it. You are as good as told me exactly what you meant to do, and I let you do it. I proved that I am responsible. Nothing would induce me to let you take the responsibility. Let that be clearly understood, please.' He looked squarely at the girl, and watched with apprehension her aspiring nose rise still further, her delicate ruthless mouth become still more ruthless. "'Excuse me,' she said. "'My plan is the best. It's the obvious plan. Mr. Carroll Quire often adopted it. I'm afraid you're hesitating to, to trust me, as I expect to be trusted. Please don't forget that you sacrificed an empire for me. I shall always remember that. And what's more, you said you expected from me absolute loyalty to your interests. I can say anything but not being trusted fully.' Mr. Prohack sank deeper into the bed, and laughed loudly, immoderately, titanically. His ill-humour vanished as a fog will vanish. Nevertheless, he was appalled by the revelation of the possibilities of the girl's character. The strange scene was interrupted by the arrival of Charlie, who, thanks to his hypnotic influence over Machin, came masterfully straight upstairs, entered the bedroom without asking permission to do so, and, in perfect indifference to the alleged frailty of his father's health, proceeded to business. 2. Dad, said he, after Mimi had gone through her self-ordained martyrdom and left the room, I wonder whether you quite realise what a top-hole creature that Warburton girl is. She's perfectly astounding. She is, Mr. Prohack admitted. But she's got ideas. She has. And she isn't afraid of carrying them out. She is not. She's much too good for you, Dad. She is. I mean, you can't really make full use of her, can you? She, she's got no scope here. She makes her own scope, said Mr. Prohack. Now I honestly do need a good secretary. Charlie at last unmasked his attack. I've got a temporary idiot, and I want a first-rater, preferably a woman. I wish you'd be decent to turn Miss Warburton over to me. She'd be invaluable to me, and with me she really would have scope for her talents. <laughs> Charlie laughed. "'What are you laughing at?' "'I was only thinking of her having the notion of queering the drains like that because she wanted to please you. It was simply great. The best thing I ever heard.' <laughs> he laughed again. "'Now, Dad, will you turn her over to me?' "'You appear to think she's a slave to be bought and sold, and this room the slave market,' said Mr. Prohack. "'It hasn't occurred to you that she might object to the transfer.' "'Oh, I can soon persuade her,' said Charlie lightly. "'But you couldn't easily persuade me, and I may as well inform you at once, my poor ingenuous boy, that I won't agree. I will never agree. Miss Warburton is necessary to my existence.' "'All in two or three days, is she?' Charlie observed sarcastically. "'Yes.' "'Well, father, as we're talking straight, let's talk straight. I'm going to take her from you. 
It's a very little help I'm asking you for, and that you should refuse is a bit thick. I shall speak to the mater. And what shall you say? I shall tell her all about the plot against the new house. It was really a plot against her, because she wants the house. The house is nothing to me. I may believe that you knew nothing about the plot yourself, but I'll lay you any odds the mater won't. Speaking as man to man, my boy, I lay you any odds that you can't put your mother against me. Oh, cried Charlie, she won't say she believes you're guilty, but she'll believe it all the same. And it's what people think that matters, not what they say they think. That's wisdom, Mr. Prohack agreed. I see that I brought you up not so badly after all. But doesn't it strike you that you're trying to blackmail your father? I hope I taught you sagacity, but I never encouraged you in blackmail, unless my memory fails me. Oh, you can call it any name you please, said Charlie. Very well, then, I will. I'll call it blackmail. Give me a cigarette. He lit the offered cigarette. Anything else this morning? Father and son smiled warily at one another. Both were amused, and even affectionate, but serious in the battle. "'Come along, Dad, be a sport. Anyhow, let's ask the girl.' "'Do you know what my answer to blackmail is?' Mr. Prohack blandly inquired. "'No.' "'My answer is the door. Drop the subject entirely, or sling your adventurous book.' Mr. Prohack was somewhat startled to see Charlie walk straight out of the bedroom. A disturbing suspicion that there might be something incalculable in his son— was rudely confirmed. He said to himself, But this is absurd. 3. That morning the Brohack bedroom seemed to be transformed into a sort of public square. No sooner had Charlie so startlingly left that Bachin entered again. A uh, Dr. Vega, sir. And Dr. Vega came in. The friendship between Mr. Brohack and his picturesque quack had progressed so much so that Eve herself had begun to, to twit her husband with having lost his head about the doctor. Nevertheless, Eve was privately very pleased with the situation, because it proved that she had been right, and Mr. Prohack wrong, concerning the qualities of the fat, untidy, ironic Portuguese. Mr. Prohack was delighted to see him, for an interview with Dr. Vega always meant an unusual indulgence in the sweets of candour and realism. "'This is my wife's doing, no doubt,' said Mr. Prohack, limply shaking hands. She called to see me ostensibly about herself, but of course, in fact, about you. Ah, oh, I thought she needed a tonic, and I'll write out the prescription while I'm here. Now, what's the matter with you? No, Mr. Prohack burst out. I'm hanged if I'll tell you. I'm not going to do your work for you. Find out. Dr. V examined it physically and orally, and then said, So there's nothing at all the matter with you, my friend. That's just where you're mistaken. Mr. Prohack retorted. There's something rather serious the matter with me. I'm suffering from grave complications. And you can't help me. My trouble is spiritual. Neither pills nor tonics can touch it. But that doesn't make it any better. Try me, said Dr. Vega. I'm admirable on the common physical ailments, and by this time I should have been universally recognized as a great man if common ailments were uncommon. Because, you know, in my profession you never get any honor unless you make a study of diseases so rare that nobody has them. Discover a new disease and save the life of some solitary nigger who brought it to Liverpool, and you'll be a baronet in a fortnight, and a member of all the European academies in a month. But study colds, indigestions, and insomnia, and change a thousand lives a year from despair to facility, and no authority will take the slightest notion of you. As with physical, so with mental diseases, or spiritual, if you like to call them so. You don't suspect that in the common mental diseases I am a regular benefactor of mankind, but I am. I don't blame you for not knowing it, because you are about the last person I should have thought susceptible to any mental disease, and so you have had no chance of finding out. Now what is it? Don't I tell you I am suffering from horrible complications? cried Mr. Prohack. What kind of complications? Every kind. My aim has always been to keep my life simple, and I succeeded very well, perhaps too well, until I inherited money. I don't mind money, but I do mind complications. I, I don't want a large house, because it means complications. I desire Sissy's happiness, but I hate weddings. I desire to be looked after, but I hate strange servants. 
I can find pleasure in a motor-car, but I hate even the risk of accidents. I have no objection to an income, but I hate investments, and so on. All I ask is to live simply and sensibly, but instead of that my existence is transformed into a quadratic equation, and I can't stop it. My happiness is not increasing, it's decreasing. I spend more and more time in wondering whither I am going, what I am after, and where precisely is the point of being alive at all. That's a fact, and now you know it. Dr. Vigo rose from his chair and deliberately sat on the side of his patient's bed. The gesture in itself was sufficiently unprofessional, but he capped it with another of which probably no doctor had ever been guilty in a British sick-room before. He pulled out a pocket-knife and became his own manicure, surveying his somewhat neglected hands with a benevolently critical gaze, smiling at them as if to say, "'What funny hands you are!' And Mr. Prohack felt that the doctor was saying, "'What a funny Prohack you are!' "'My friend,' said Dr. Vega at length, with his voice, "'my friend, I will not conceal from you that your alarm was justified. You are suffering from one of the commonest and one of the gravest mental derangements. I am surprised, but there it is. You haven't yet discovered that it's the earth you're living on. You fancy it may be serious. Uranus, Aldebaran, or Jupiter. Let us say Jupiter. Perhaps in one of these worlds matters are ordered differently, and their truth is not our truth. But let me assure you that the name of your planet is the Earth, and that on the Earth one great unalterable truth prevails. Namely, you can't do this. Here Dr. Vega held up a pad and finished figure, and waggled it to and fro with solemnity. If you can't do this without moving your finger. You are aware of this great truth? Then why are you upset because you can't wag your finger without moving it? Perhaps I've been too subtle for you. Let me put the affair in another way. You've lost sight of the supreme earthly facts that everything has not merely a consequence, but innumerable consequences. You know when you married that you were creating endless consequences, and now you want to limit the consequences. You knew, when you accepted a fortune, that you were creating endless consequences, and now you want to limit them, too. You want to alter the rules after the game has started. You set in motion circumstances which were bound to influence the development of the members of your family, and when the inevitable new developments begin, you object, simply because you hadn't foreseen them. You knew that money doesn't effectively exist until it's spent, and that you can't spend money without causing consequences. And when your family causes consequences by bringing the money to life, you complain that you're a martyr to the consequences, and that you hadn't bargained for complications. My poor friend, you have made one crucial mistake in your career. The mistake of being born. Happily, the mistake is curable. I can give you several prescriptions. The first is prussic acid. If you don't care for that, you can donate the whole of your fortune to the sinking fund for extinguishing the national debt, and you can return to the treasury. If you don't care for that, you can leave your family mysteriously and go and live in Timbuktu by yourself. If you don't care for that, you can buy a whiff and forbid your wife and daughter to grow older or change in any way on pain of a hundred lashes. And if you don't like that, you can acquaint yourself with the axioms that neither you nor anybody else are the centre of the universe, and that what you call complications are simply a, another name for life itself. Worry is life, and life is worry, and the absence of worry is death. I won't say to you that you're rich and beloved and therefore you've nothing to worry about. I'll say to you, you've got a lot to worry about, because you're rich and beloved. I'll leave the other hand for tomorrow. Dr. Vega snapped down the blade of the pocket knife. Platitude, ejaculated Mr. Prohack. Certainly, agreed the quack. But I've told you before that it's by telling everybody what everybody knows that I earn my living. I'll get up, said Mr. Prohack. And not too soon, said the quack. Get up by all means and deal with your worries. All worries can be dealt with. Doesn't make life any better said Mr. Prohack. Nothing makes life any better except death. 
and says a disgusting rumour that there is no death. Where well, shall I find a pencil, my dear fellow? I've forgotten mine, and I want to prescribe Mrs. Prohack's tonic. In the boudoir there, said Mr. Prohack. What the deuce are you smiling at? I'm smiling because I'm so glad to find you aren't so wise as you look. Dr. Vega disappeared blithely into the boudoir. Almost at the same moment, Mimi knocked and entered. She entered, stared harshly at Mr. Prohack, and then the corners of her ruthless mouth twitched and loosened, and she began to cry. Doctor, called Mr. Prohack, come here at once. The doctor came. You say all worries can be dealt with? How should you deal with this one? The doctor dropped a slip of paper onto the bed and walked silently out of the room, precisely as Charlie had done. In regard to the effect of the sermon of Dr. Viga on Mr. Prohack, it was as if Mr. Prohack had been a desk with many drawers and one drawer open, and the sermon had been dropped into the drawer, and the drawer slammed to and nonchalantly locked. The drawer being locked, Mr. Prohack turned to the weeping figure in front of him, which suddenly ceased to weep and became quite collected and normal. "'Now, my child,' said Mr. Prohack, "'I've just been informed that everything has a consequence.' I've seen the consequence. What is the thing? He was rather annoyed by Mimi's tears, but in his dangerous characteristic desire to please, he could not keep kindness out of his tone, and Mimi, reassured and comforted, began feebly to smile, and also Mr. Prohack remarked that her mouth was acquiring firmness again. I ought to tell you in the explanation of anything of a personal nature that I may have said to him in your presence that the gentleman just gone is my medical adviser and I have no secrets from him. In that respect he stands equal with you, and above everybody else in the world, without exception. So you must excuse my freedom in directing his attention to you. It's I who ought to apologise, said Miss Warburton positively, but the fact is I haven't the slightest idea that you weren't alone. I was just a little bit upset, because I understand that you wanted to get rid of me. Ah, murmured Mr. Prohack, who put that notion into your absurd head? He knew he was exercising his charm, but he couldn't help it. Mr. Charles, he's just been down to my room and told me. I hope you remember what I said to you about your duty so far as he is concerned. Of course, Mr. Prohack. She smiled anew, and her smile, so clever, so self-reliant, so enigmatic, a little disturbed Mr. Prohack. What did my son say to you? He said that he was urgently in need of a thoroughly competent secretary at once confidential, and that he was sure I was the very woman to suit him, and that he would give me double the salary I was getting. Did you tell him how much you are getting? No. Well, neither did I. And then? Then he told me all about his business, how big it was, and growing quickly, too, and how he was after a young woman who had tact and resource, and could talk to anyone from a bank director to a mechanic or a clergyman, and that tens of thousands of pounds might often depend on my tact and that you wouldn't mind my being transferred from you to him. And I suppose he asked you to go off with him immediately? No, at the beginning of next week. And what did you say? demanded Mr. Prohack, amazed and frightened at the manoeuvres of his unscrupulous son. Naturally, I said that I couldn't possibly leave you, unless you told me to go, and that I owed everything to you. Then he asked me what I did for you, and I said I was particularly busy at present, making a schedule of all your new purchases, and checking the outfitters' accounts, and so on. That reminds me, I haven't been able to get the neckties right yet. Good heavens! exclaimed Mr. Prohack. Not been able to get the neckties right? But this is very serious. The neckties are most important, most important. Oh, said Mimi, if necessary, I shall run round to Bond Street in my lunch hour. At this point the drawer in the desk started to unlock itself and open of its own accord. Mr. Prohack's eyes caught a glimpse of a page of the sermon. Mimi continued, "'We mustn't forget there be hundreds of things to see to about the new house.' "'Will there?' "'Well, Mrs. Prohack told Machin, and Machin had just told me, that it's all settled about taking the house. And I know what taking a house is. Mr. Carroquois was always taking new houses.' But perhaps you could keep an eye on the house, even if you went over to Mr. Charles. Then it's true, said Mimi, you do want me to go. But she showed no sign of weeping afresh. 
"'You must understand,' Mr. Prohart said with much benevolence, "'that my son is my son. "'Of course my clothes are also my clothes, "'but Charles is in a difficult position. "'He's at the beginning of his career, "'whereas I'm at the end of mine. "'He needs all the help he can get, "'and he can afford to pay more than I can. "'And even at the cost of having to check my own neckties, "'I shouldn't like to stand in his way. "'That's how I look at it. "'Mind you, I have certainly not told Charlie "'that I'll set you free.' "'I quite see,' said Mimi, "'and naturally, if you put it like that, "'you'll still be in the family. "'I should be very sorry to leave you, Mr. Prohack. "'Doubtless, but you'll be even gladder to go over to Charles, "'though with him you'll be more like a kettle tied to the tail of a mad dog "'than a confidential secretary.' "'Mimi raised the tip of her nose. "'Excuse me, Mr. Prohack, I shall not be gladder to go over to Mr. Charles.' "'Any girl will tell you that she prefers to work for a man of your age than for a boy. "'Boys are not interesting.' "'Yes,' murmured Mr. Prohack. "'A comfortable enough theory. "'And I've already heard it more than once from girls. "'But I've never seen any confirmation of it in practice, and I don't believe it. "'I'll tell you something about yourself you don't know. "'You're delighted to go over to my son. "'And if I had refused to let you go, I should have had a martyr instead of a secretary.' You want adventure. You want a field for your remarkable talent for conspiracy and chicane. You know by experience there's little scope for it here. But under my son your days will be breathless. No, no, I don't wish to hear anything. Run away and get on with your work, and you can telephone my decision to Charles. I'm now going to get up and wear all my new neckties at once. Miss Warburton departed in a state of emotion. As with all leisureliness, Mr. Prohack made himself beautiful to behold. He reflected, "'I'm very impulsive. I've simply thrown that girl into the arms of that boy. Eve will have something to say about it. Still, there's one complication off my chest.' Eve returned home as he was descending the stairs, and she blew him outstairs again, and shut the door of the bedroom, and pushed him into the privacy of the boudoir. "'It's all settled,' said she. "'I've signed the tenancy agreement for a year.' "'Charlie said I could, and it would save you trouble. "'It doesn't matter the cheque for the first half-year's rent being signed by you, "'only of the course the house will be in my name. "'How handsome you are, darling!' "'And she kissed him, and retied one of the new cravats. "'But that's not what I wanted to tell you, darling.' "'Her face grew grave. "'Do you know, I'm rather troubled about Charlie and your friend Lady Masulam. "'They're off again this morning.' "'My friend?' "'Well, you know she adores you. "'It would be perfectly awful if—if, if, well, you, you understand what I mean. "'I hear she really is a widow, so that—well, you understand what I mean. "'I'm convinced that she's at least thirty years older than Charlie. "'But you see, she's French, and French women are so clever. "'You can never be sure with them.' "'Fluttering heart,' said Mr. Prohack, suddenly inspired. "'Don't get excited.' I've thought of all that already, and I've taken measures to guard against it. I'm going to give Charlie my secretary. She'll see that Lady Massulum doesn't make any more headway. Trust her. Arthur, how clever you are! Nobody but you would have thought of that. But isn't it a bit dangerous, too? You see, don't you? Mr. Prohack shook his head. I gather you've been reading the love story in the daily picture, said he. In the daily picture the typist always marries the millionaire but outside the daily picture I doubt whether these romantic things really happen. There are sixty-five thousand girls' typists in the city alone, besides about a million in Whitehall. The opportunities of espousing millionaires and ministers of state are countless. But no girl typist has been married at St. George's Hanover Square since typewriters were invented. End of chapter 16